Chapter 6 Befooled, Bewitched, and Bedeviled Speculation in the Gilded Age Speculation, at first a sentiment, or if you please, a taste, passes next into a habit, then it grows into a passion, a master passion, which like Aaron's serpent swallows up and strengthens itself with other passions. It becomes at last more fierce than anger, more gnawing than jealousy, more greedy than avarice, more absorbing than love. The stock market may be likened to a withered old harridan, enamelled, painted, and decked in the latest mode, which leers on the speculator and points to golden prizes that, like the desert mirage, fades away and leaves him to his ruin. William Fowler, Ten Years on Wall Street, 1870 The colonial movement was in the nature of a speculation. Columbus himself was a speculator, and North America the greatest speculative prize of all. The first American colonies were established as joint stock ventures. When Sir Walter Raleigh's Virginia Company was reorganized in the early 17th century, it promised investors a return of 20% and incorporated a subsidiary company for transporting 100 maids to Virginia to be made wives. A few years later, the settlement of New Amsterdam, later New York, was undertaken by the Dutch East India Company, whose shares at the time were the main object of speculation on the Amsterdam Bourse. In the middle of the 17th century, the Wall of Wall Street was constructed on the orders of Governor Stuyvesant of the Dutch West India Company. Towards the end of the century, shares in the New Jersey and Pennsylvania companies were traded in Exchange Alley, alongside the diving bell and fire engine ventures. Among other things, John Law's Mississippi Company comprised a speculation in half the territory of the modern United States. The speculative character of the American people derives in great measure from the colonial venture. The American dream is posited on the vision of a beneficent, ever-improving future. The difference between an American and any other person is that the American lives in anticipation of the future because he knows what a great place it will be, said Ronald Reagan with his characteristic mixture of folksy sentimentality and insight. The American settlers had forsaken their historic lands for a nation whose boundaries were limited only by their dreams. As the 19th century financial writer William Fowler observed, Imagination in this country lives in the future rather than the past. Only in America could a man declare that history was bunk. America is a democratic nation where social status is up for grabs, and wealth, not birth, provides the ultimate measure of distinction. During his American travels in the early 1830s, the French aristocrat Alexis de Tocqueville observed a vibrant spirit of materialism. I never met in America, he wrote, any citizen so poor as not to cast a glance of hope and envy on the enjoyments of the rich, or whose imagination did not possess itself by anticipation of those good things which fate still obstinately withheld from him. The love of well-being has now become the predominant taste of the nation. The great current of human passions runs in that channel and sweeps everything along its course. The American is equipped with more than just a hopeful vision of the future and a drive for self-improvement. He is prepared to take enormous risks to attain his ends. To emigrate to America was in itself a great risk. Settlement of the frontier involved even greater risks, such as fending off Indians and wild animals. Many of the great 19th century speculators came from the frontier regions. This appetite for risk so great that one might say it was imprinted in American genes, has not diminished with time, but remains a continuing source of the nation's vitality. Even rich Americans found themselves dissatisfied with their lot, and were prepared to gamble to improve it. After a stock market panic in the late 19th century, the London Spectator commented bemusedly, The millionaires of America make corners as if they had nothing to lose, let some amuse themselves financing as if it were only an expensive game. The English, however speculative, fear poverty. The Frenchman shoots himself to avoid it. 
The American, with a million, speculates to win ten, and if he loses, takes a clerkship with equanimity. This freedom from sordidness is commendable, but it makes a nation of the most degenerate gamesters in the world. Risk is, of course, the essence of speculation. The textbook economic function of speculation is the assumption of risk, and no one is prepared to assume more risk than the American speculator. At times, the transfer of risk in the stock market goes beyond the inevitable risks of business and becomes an end in itself. Under such circumstances, speculation becomes purely ludic, a national sport played with the ferocity of war, and offering the rewards of a lottery. It may appear paradoxical that Americans love equality, having enshrined it as a founding principle in the Declaration of Independence, and yet they strive ceaselessly to create material inequality amongst themselves. They have swept away the privileges of their fellow creatures, wrote Tocqueville, which stood in their way. But they have opened the door to universal competition. The barrier has changed its shape rather than position. In a democratic society such as the United States, where wealth is the ultimate determinant of status, there lingers a constant fear of being left behind materially. We may say that the guiding principle of American society is not to grow richer in absolute terms, but to avoid becoming poorer in relative terms. And nothing makes a man feel poorer than being a passive bystander during a bull market. Therefore, the fiercest struggle for the preservation and restitution of economic equality in the United States takes place in the stock market, where everyone is seeking to discover what others are doing and anticipate what they intend to do. As Keynes observed, with all the cultured disdain of the old world for the new, even outside the field of finance. Americans are apt to be unduly interested in discovering what average opinion believes average opinion to be, and this national weakness finds its nemesis in the stock market. The early history of speculation in America. America's vast wilderness invited speculation. Many of the country's founding fathers were land speculators. George Washington started his own Mississippi company to purchase lands in the West. Benjamin Franklin was involved in an Illinois land speculation of sixty-three million acres. Patrick Henry, the fiery revolutionary, was among the investors in the Yazoo Company, which attempted to purchase ten million acres in Georgia. Even Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton were occasional land jobbers. For a century after independence. The country was in a constant ferment of land speculation. In the late 18th century, millions of acres in large blocks were exchanged in Maine, Georgia, and New York State. The developing towns and cities were also the objects of speculation. Fittingly, the capital city, Washington D.C., was founded by land speculators. Forty years later, Chicago was the new boom town. Later still, the railroads opened up the western part of the country to the national pastime. The railroads themselves, established with federal land grants that exceeded 170 million acres, were primarily vehicles for land speculation. Were I to characterize the United States, wrote the English traveller William Priest in the late 18th century, it would be by the appellation of the land of speculations. The stock market did not appear in New York until after American independence. In the 1790s, a speculative mania in government loans and bank stocks developed, not unlike that found in Exchange Alley a century earlier. There was, however, a significant difference. From its very inception, the American market was dominated by stock operators whose activities were on a scale unsurpassed in the old world. In late 1791, William Dewar, an Eton-educated former colonel in Washington's army, organized a pool with the intention of driving up the share price of the Bank of the United States. He financed this speculation with personal notes of credit for a reported thirty million dollars. Dewar's subsequent failure brought the first U.S. stock market crash, and led to his eventual death in prison. Although corners were as old as the stock markets themselves, it was only in America in the nineteenth century that they became a hallmark of speculation. 
The aim of the corner was to acquire a sufficient number of shares to force up the price, and catch out the bears who had sold stock short in anticipation of buying it back cheaper at a later date. When a stock was effectively cornered, the operator could demand any price he wished from the short sellers, who were legally obliged to cover their positions. As the great stock operator Daniel Drew mused, "He who sells what isn't hisn must buy it back or go to prison." Corners were normally undertaken by informal speculative partnerships, known as pools, and accompanied by devious market manipulation. It was a tense game and often failed. The stock market operator who arranged corners and manipulated the market became a familiar figure. The typical operator was described by a mid-century commentator as an individual of Bonapartean capacity who has risen with the velocity of a comet. For a while, carries everything before him, and raises and depresses any particular stock or stocks at his sovereign will and pleasure. The favoured stocks of operators became known as footballs because they were so frequently kicked around between the bulls and the bears. They were also called fancies. Often broken-down companies of little intrinsic value, they served the function of gambling chips, like certain penny stocks in the over-the-counter market in America today. Around the middle of the nineteenth century, the call loan system emerged. Although loans against the collateral of stock, known to Americans as call or margin loans, had been available in Amsterdam since the early seventeenth century. They came to dominate the New York stock market to an unprecedented degree. Stock loans were supplied by New York banks to brokers who lodged their customers' securities as collateral. The credit was termed call because the banks could demand or call it back at any moment. They were also called margin loans since there was a margin of safety between the size of the loan and the securities' market value. This margin varied from a relatively conservative twenty percent to five percent or less. Thus, a share trading at one hundred dollars was good for a loan of between eighty and ninety-five dollars. If the market was particularly volatile, or if the shares used as collateral were speculative footballs, then a higher margin was normally demanded. When the shares held on margin declined in value. The broker demanded more cash from his customer, known as a margin call, and if this was not forthcoming, he would sell the stocks in the market. The regular supply of margin loans to the stock market was a great boon to brokers, as it enabled small-time speculators to make bigger purchases than they could otherwise afford, and stimulated market turnover. The word margins, wrote William Fowler in Ten Years on Wall Street, contains the essence of stock speculation. Although stock market loans had been available since the 1830s, for the next decade options and futures, known as time transactions, remained more common. In the 1850s, however, people started to complain that the growth of call loans was squeezing out legitimate commercial borrowers. After the crash of 1857, known as the Western Blizzard, time transactions began to fade away. At around this time. A stock market commentator described speculators using call loans to pyramid their investments, selling existing holdings after a rise and doubling up. The abundant supply of short-term credit to speculators made the stock market more than usually sensitive to monetary conditions. Bankers' balances in New York, from which call loans were supplied, varied with the agricultural cycle. When wheat was due to be shipped east, money would flow to the interior of the country, leading to a tightness in the New York money market and the calling of loans from the stock market. This tendency was strongest in October, traditionally a black letter month for American speculators. Money flowed back to New York at the beginning of the year, making it a good season for speculation. Call loans increased the volatility of a stock market already subject to constant manipulation and corners. During a stock market crisis, call rates rose sharply and loans were withdrawn. But because liquidity in the stock market dried up and borrowers were unable to sell securities, banks often experienced difficulty in retrieving their loans. The effect of the call loan system was therefore to make American banks especially vulnerable to panics. When customers would protect themselves by withdrawing bank deposits and hoarding money, 
Brokers made matters worse by selling their customers' margin stocks during a panic in order to protect themselves. A margin, wrote William Fowler, may be called a device contrived to create crisis and panics and to keep the market in a ferment so that brokers may make and their customers lose money. War and Speculation The outbreak of the American Civil War in 1861 ushered in a new era of speculation. Initially, the stock market was apprehensive about war, and leading stocks declined sharply after the attack on Fort Sumter. Conditions changed in early 1862 after Congress passed the Legal Tender Act, authorizing the issue of $150 million worth of a new paper currency, the greenback. Gradually, speculators realized that industry and agriculture would be stimulated by the need to equip, clothe and feed the Union forces, and that the greenbacks would bring inflation into the system. A few months after the passing of the Act, the stock market began to rise as the greenbacks worked their effect on the economy, like the kiss of the prince on the cheek of a sleep-enchanted lady in the fairy tale. The uncertainty of war produced an ideal climate for speculation. As the stock operator Daniel Drew said, Along with ordinary happenings, we fellows in Wall Street had the fortunes of war to speculate about, and that makes great doings on a stock exchange. It's good fishing in troubled waters. The price of gold became the barometer of military fortunes. It crashed whenever the Union was victorious, for fear that the supply of greenbacks would dry up, and climbed on news of defeat as the market anticipated further note issues. The gold bulls whistled Dixie, and the bears sang John Brown's body. With bold forward movements and subtle feints, grand strategy and clever tactics, and endless skirmishing between bulls and bears, events on Wall Street mimicked the war itself. Despite a great disparity in their moral ends, war and speculation have much in common. Clausewitz's description of war as the province of uncertainty, subject to unforeseen accidents or friction, applies just as well to stock market speculation. What George Soros has called reflexivity, the influence of subjective factors on outcomes, has its place on the battlefield as well as in the stock market. Morale could determine the outcome of both military and speculative battles, where daring and brilliance might snatch an unexpected victory, and panic and disorder bring defeat. The Lees, Grants and Shermans had their counterparts in the great stock operators, who bribed soldiers, sutlers, politicians and telegraph operators in order to get the latest information from the front. The mercenary core of Wall Street were fickle alliances, and the speculative history of the period is marked by constant betrayals and double dealings. Yet occasionally, for brief periods, the forces of speculation marshalled by the stock operators displayed the cohesion and discipline of a professional army. Like the generals of the Civil War, the leading operators attracted public adulation. As Matthew Josephson wrote in The Robber Barons, if the doctrine of the nation favoured an ideal of free and equal opportunity for all, so its current folklore glorified the freebooting citizen who, by his own efforts, by whatever method feasible, had wrested for himself a power that flung its shadow upon the liberties and privileges of others. James Fisk, Jay Gould and Cornelius Vanderbilt were the heroes of the Gilded Age. Their operations brought them national fame, and their fortunes were the object of envious admiration. In times of panic, however, these men were vilified for their lack of scruple, and the walls of the long room, where the share dealings of the open board took place, were covered with graffiti cursing their names. The most renowned and feared stock operator in the early 1860s was Daniel Drew, known variously as the Great Bear, the Old Bear, and Ursa Major, due to his preference for selling stocks short, the Sphinx of Wall Street for his inscrutability, the old man of the street for his age, and more familiarly as Uncle Daniel. He was born the son of a poor farmer from Putnam County, New York, in 1797. After deserting from the army to join the circus, he worked as cattle drover before eventually settling in Wall Street. 
Although Drew was a devout Baptist who endowed churches and even a ladies' seminary, he had no difficulty in reconciling his religion with the amorality of the stock market, where his own treachery was notorious. Charles Francis Adams described him as shrewd, unscrupulous, and very illiterate, a strange combination of superstition and faithlessness, of daring and timidity, often good-natured and sometimes generous. In the early 1850s, Drew had joined the board of the Erie Railroad. He became notorious for his operations in Erie stock, which earned him the sobriquet of the speculative director, and the railroad that of the Scarlet Woman of Wall Street. He manipulated the Erie share price with such facility that it became a saying on Wall Street that, when Daniel says up, Erie goes up. Daniel says down, Erie goes down. Daniel says wiggle-waggle, it bobs both ways. He liked nothing better than to mislead his boys, as he called the younger speculators, about his intentions, and reveled in taking a slice out of them. As a young drover, Drew had fed his cattle with salt before bringing them to market so that they would drink and put on weight. In later years, he introduced to Wall Street the practice of watering stock, this involved using his position as a director to issue vast unauthorised quantities of new stock in order to depress the share price and thwart attempted corners. A disgruntled speculator accused Drew of treating his stocks just as he used to treat cattle. He pens them, drives them up and down the market, corners them. In fact, Daniel Drew calls stocks his critters and abuses them accordingly. He waters them and plasters them all over with dirt till they are not worth shucks. The other leading operator of the day, Cornelius Vanderbilt, struck a sharp contrast to his rival Drew. The old drover was unkempt, wizened and sinewy, whereas Commodore Vanderbilt was tall, handsome and finely dressed, with a face like a Roman senator. Drew had a hen-like cackle, Vanderbilt a booming laugh. Drew cared nothing for the management of railroads, and concentrated exclusively on his stock market speculations. Vanderbilt succeeded in building a great network of railroads. It was said that Vander built and Dan drew. Drew was sly, and gave out false tips. Vanderbilt was mostly open in his dealings, and never informed anyone of his intentions. In a crisis, Drew became flustered and lost his nerve, Vanderbilt's will was unbreakable, and his purpose always firm. But for all their differences, the two men had much in common. They were both illiterate, ruthless, grasping men. Vanderbilt was said to raise men up in the street only to break them, to have fleeced his son-in-law, Horace Clark, of hundreds of thousands of dollars, and even to have misled his son William into selling a stock which he was buying. On one occasion, Vanderbilt sent a brief note to associates who had betrayed him. Gentlemen, you have undertaken to cheat me. I will not sue you, for the law takes too long. I will ruin you. He kept his promise. Beneath the titanic figures of Drew and Vanderbilt stood a host of lesser operators, who experienced fleeting moments of success before they disappeared into obscurity. In 1863, Addison Jerome enjoyed a brief reign as the Napoleon of the public board when he organised several successful corners. After only a few months, however, he was bankrupted by a failed corner in the Michigan and Southern Railroad. A year later, he died from a heart attack induced by the pressures of work. His brother, Leonard Jerome, first rose to prominence in the 1850s, when he made a fortune anticipating the stock market crisis of 1857. His operations were characterised by great boldness and animal spirits, and even when disaster threatened, he always maintained his good humour. Unlike his brother, Leonard did not overstay his welcome on Wall Street, but departed for Europe with his fortune intact. His beautiful daughter Jenny married Lord Randolph Churchill, a descendant of that shrewd South Sea speculator Sarah, Duchess of Marlborough. Their son, Winston, exhibited the same indomitable spirit and sang-froid that had marked his grandfather's operations in the stock market. Henry Keep, born in a poorhouse and a former bootblack, was another leading operator of the early 1860s. 
It was Keep who broke Addison Jerome's attempted corner in Old Southern by issuing new shares. Known as Henry the Silent, Keep had a reputation for discretion and probity rare among his fellow operators. He set up the first blind pool, in which a number of speculators combined their resources without being informed by Keep of what he intended to do with their money. They were kept blind to prevent news of the pool's operations from leaking into the market. The most dashing operator of the Civil War era was Anthony Morse, known as the English Jew for his hooked nose and financial acumen. He was also nicknamed the Lightning Calculator. Morse came to prominence with a blind pool organised in Rock Island in late 1863. Early the following year, he became the leader of the Bull faction bidding openly for stocks in blocks of five or ten million shares. At the height of his fame, crowds surrounded Morse's brokerage office, and he was mobbed by strangers who thrust their wallets into his hands and begged for tips. His failure in the spring of 1864 caused a panic on the exchange. Ostracised, Morse haunted Broadway for a year and died penniless in a seedy boarding house, where his landlady refused to release the corpse until his bills were paid. A contemporary considered Morse a brilliant mathematician and a shrewd financier, but like most great speculators, he got at last to believe in his star. Then he attempted impossibilities. The Gilded Age, as Mark Twain and his co-author Charles Dudley Warner observed in the novel which gave its name to the period, was a time when everybody nursed a speculation and people pursued the acquisition of wealth by fair means or foul. The rags-to-riches tales of Horatio Alger that appeared after the Civil War, with titles such as Fame and Fortune and Strive and Succeed, presented an idealised version of the same fierce material ambition. Gustavus Myers, in his History of the Great American Fortunes, described the era as the period of periods when there was a kind of adoration of the capitalist taught in the press, college, and pulpit. Egregious displays of wealth characterized the age, inspiring Torstein Veblen's ideas on conspicuous consumption, expounded in his Theory of the Leisure Class. At society parties, cigarettes were rolled in hundred-dollar bills, black pearls were stuffed into the guests' oysters, and dogs were adorned with diamond-studded collars. Gold, the source of many speculative fortunes, was also the most desirable thing to have, according to Elizabeth Lair, in King Lair and the Gilded Age, because it cost money, and money was the outward and visible sign of success. Throughout the 1860s, fortunes were gained and expended with equal rapidity. It was alleged that the speculator's vicious extravagance was motivated by a desire to take revenge on the money that had cost them so much anxiety to gain. No speculator was more extravagant and high-living than Leonard Jerome, who drove through Central Park with a team of dazzling thoroughbreds, purchased a magnificent steam yacht, built a racecourse and a private theatre, and distributed diamond bracelets as gifts to the ladies at his sumptuous dinner parties. Some contemporary commentators were disgusted by such vulgar displays of wealth. The journalist E. L. Godkin, founder of The Nation, described America in 1866 as a gaudy stream of bespangled, belaced, and beruffled barbarians. When Georges Clemenceau, the future French Prime Minister, visited the United States after the Civil War, he concluded that the country had passed from a state of barbarism to one of decadence without an intermediate period of civilization. The Civil War in America, with its enormous issue of depreciating currency and its reckless waste of money and credit by the government, created a speculative mania such as the United States, with all its experience in this respect, had never before known, wrote Henry Adams. Not only in Broad Street, the centre of New York speculation, but far and wide throughout the northern states, almost every man who had money at all employed a part of his capital in the purchase of stocks, or of gold, of copper, of petroleum, or of domestic produce, in the hope of a raise in prices, or staked money on the expectation of a fall. 
The expansion of the railway system and the advent of the telegraph fostered speculation by bringing far-flung places into daily contact with the financial centre. In 1867, the ticker was introduced, flashing the latest stock prices around the country and linking provincial brokerage offices to Wall Street. By the end of the century, it was estimated that nearly half of all messages transmitted by telegraph involved speculative transactions. The ticker also gave birth to the bucket shop, which was a cross between a betting shop and a brokerage, where people could gamble on share price movements without actually buying the stocks, in other words, the same effect as buying futures. Bucket shops were shady places, whose owners were often engaged in manipulating stocks, and had a reputation for disappearing into the night when faced with a large payout. Nevertheless, they provided many with their first taste of speculation, and remained popular until the 1930s, when they were outlawed by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Although the total number of speculators during the Civil War is uncertain, contemporaries believed the figure to be far larger than the 200,000 holders of stocks and bonds in the previous decade. They came from all classes and backgrounds. On the sidewalks of the financial district, young dandy speculators from Broadway jostled with farmers, store owners, lawyers, doctors, clergymen, mechanics and penniless gutter snipes. Clerks formed small clubs in order to pool their limited resources, and shady brokers offered to finance them with the slimmest of margin cover, ensuring that the slightest setback would see them wiped out. Outside brokerage offices, lady speculators waited in their carriages for news of the latest stock prices. In Saratoga, upstate New York, three young ladies set up a pool in Harlem stock and bought 2,000 shares. Vanderbilt's former mistress, Mrs. Tennessee Claflin, and her sister, Mrs. Victoria Woodhull, established their own brokerage in Broad Street in 1870, and became known as the Bewitching Brokers. Hetty Green, the Quaker heiress, dressed from head to foot in black crepe, with black-gloved hands resembling talons, was a familiar figure on Wall Street. She bought shrewdly during panics, succeeded in cornering the noted operator Addison Camack, once threatened the railroad baron Collis Huntington with a revolver, and even brought about a minor stock market panic when the withdrawal of her account caused her brokers to fail. Vindictive, garrulous, and neurotically fearful of poverty, when staying in hotels she was said to save money by washing her own underwear, Hetty Green was a cautious operator who believed in getting in at the bottom and selling out at the top. All you have to do is buy cheap and sell dear, act with thrift and shrewdness, and be persistent, was her advice to other speculators. Wall Street is not the place for a lady to find either fortune or character, claimed the stockbroker Henry Clues. Yet Hetty Green became the richest woman in America, and died with a fortune estimated at over one hundred million dollars. As for her character, the witch of Wall Street was as feared and disliked as any of her male counterparts. Male or female, rich or poor, healthy or infirm, the vast majority of speculators were necessarily outsiders, mere fodder for the great operators. It was a saying of the drover Drew that anybody who plays the stock market not as an insider is like a man buying cows in the moonlight. So efficient were the operators at fleecing outsiders that Henry Adams feared speculation would eventually consume itself, as the largest combination of capital was destined to swallow every weaker combination which ventured to show itself in the market. Even if the speculator evaded the operator's snares, he was likely to fall prey to his own weaknesses. Fowler depicted the amateur speculator as the opium-eater of finance, a man torn by conflicting passions, beset by uncertainty and fears, prone to buying high and selling low, befooled, bewitched and bedeviled by what he hears in the market. James Medbury claimed that outsiders were prey to suspicion, overconfidence, timidity and vacillation when they entered the stock market. You will find confidence, he wrote, where the registry shows there should have been distrust, Hesitation, which ought to have been daring, doubts where faith would have been wealth. 
This weakness of humanity is the life of speculation. Not all outsiders, however, were unsuccessful. Some speculators, known as panic birds, came to the market only once prices had crashed and money was scarce. They bought carefully, locked up their investments, and kept away from Wall Street until the next calamity struck. But they were a rare breed, and most who ventured into the financial district in the turbulent years of the 1860s became entranced by the carnival atmosphere and remained there until the last penny had been picked from their pockets. New Exchanges, Old Bubbles A number of new exchanges were established to accommodate the growing fever. The most important of them, the Open Board, founded in 1862 to compete with the older exchange, operated initially from a subterranean coal hole in William Street. When the new exchange prospered, the tiny basements around William Street were turned into offices for fly-by-night operators, offering brokerage services at reduced commission rates. At its peak, the open board was said to transact ten times as much business as the regular board. The two markets merged in 1869 to form the New York Stock Exchange. In February 1864, an evening exchange was set up in the basement of the Fifth Avenue Hotel. Speculators paid 50 cents to enter, and trading lasted until nine o'clock at night, after which business continued in the hotel's bar. Curbstone brokers also traded in William Street, between Exchange Place and Beaver Street, where gutter snipes enticed bystanders by brandishing their arms and vociferating loudly. These new markets had none of the exclusivity and pretension to rectitude of the old exchange. Outsiders were encouraged to mingle in the crowd, and brokers provided credit on small margins to finance their speculations. With the price of gold floating after the advent of greenbacks, the gold room became the venue for some of the most daring and celebrated speculative feats of the period. Situated at Gilpin's Reading Room, on the corner of William Street and Exchange Place, the room itself was modest and undistinguished, a dingy hall full of nooks where speculators lurked. In its centre stood a cast-iron cupid, splashing water into a bowl, tinkling and clinking like coin of gold, around which gathered brokers shouting out their offers and bids. In the background the telegraph clattered noisily, and on one wall was placed a large dial, whose arm swung to and fro, indicating the latest price. A similar dial on an exterior wall signalled the price to crowds of speculators on the street. Speculation in the gold room was said to be purer and more intense than in the stock market. According to the journalist Horace White, the room resembled a rat pit in full blast. For James Medbury, the gold room was a human maelstrom, where men battle for gold, 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 with a naked greed and fury that satirizes life beyond all imaginings. Gold speculation reached a climax in early 1864, when a new gold exchange opened. Since the prices of gold and other metals were rising faster than wages, it was natural that the attention of speculators should turn to mining. A mining board was established in March, and nearly 200 mining companies, with a capital of over $300 million, were floated in the following month. These new companies were ventures in distant territories. Exotic names adorned them, such as the Arizona Metalliferous and Scalping Ledge Gold and Silver Mining Company, the Mount St. Elias Silver Lode and Gold Vein Mining Company, the Alligator Bayou Salt Company, and the Angel's Rest Quicksilver Company. Brokers, eager to attract custom, affected a knowledge of fissure veins, faults, spurs, loads, pyrites, and other mining terms, and filled their offices with cabinets containing assays of gold and specimens of other metals and minerals. The promoters of the mining companies harnessed the mood of the day with age-old ploys. First, a claim in some unknown place was purchased for a pittance in cash or a quantity of shares, and specimens of ore were submitted to an assay and certificated by a mineralogist. Then a wealthy and respectable merchant, joined by other notables, was brought onto the board in return for a free distribution of shares. 
the capital of the company would be inflated to many times its value. For instance, the property of the Titan Ledge and Black Mountain Gold, Silver and Copper Company was bought for a thousand dollars and later capitalized at a million dollars. A broker was hired and advertisements placed in the papers announcing a limited subscription. On street corners, boys were employed to hand out prospectuses with lavish descriptions of the company's prospects. Scouts, known as bubble blowers, were hired to lure the bigger investors. Several companies were brought under the control of the same directors who used the capital raised for one company to pay the unearned dividends of another. The mining mania took place against the background of rising gold prices and a bull market led exuberantly by Anthony Morse. When Morse failed on the 18th of April 1864, there was a panic in the stock market, in which mining company stocks declined by an average of more than 90%. Eventually, speculators came to heed Mark Twain's warning that a mine is a hole in the ground with a liar standing next to it. Although the market was quiet for a few months after the collapse of the mining mania, by late summer exuberance had returned. In early 1865, a new bubble was blown, this time tinged with the translucent colours of petroleum, a new wonder product hailed as a disinfectant, a vermin killer, hair oil, boot grease, and a cure for kidney stones. During this boom, which was linked to the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania, the price of crude oil increased ninefold within a few months, reaching a level that in real terms has never been equaled. The brokers cleared their offices of mineral samples and certificates of assay, and in their place installed models of oil barrels, files of petroleum, and framed property deeds. A petroleum board was inaugurated in October 1865, and 35 companies were floated. In a rerun of the mining mania, new companies were formed at little or no cost, fraudulent claims to oil-rich land were incorporated into companies with inflated capitalizations, and petroleum stocks were heavily manipulated. Shares were run up to a great height before the petroleum bubble evaporated into thin air. Milking the Street The great stock operators did not trifle with the transient mining and petroleum bubbles. Their attention was focused almost exclusively on the market for railroad stocks, where manipulation was a fine art and consequently the investment returns more certain. The great aim of the operator was to achieve one of the railroad corners, which recurred with unprecedented frequency throughout the period. Among the most notorious corners were those in Harlem, 1863 and 1864, Michigan Southern, 1863 and 1866, Prairie du Chien, 1865, Erie, 1866, 1867 and 1868, and Chicago and Northwestern, 1867 and 1872. The profits could be enormous. Henry Keep's pool in the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad in 1867 netted over $2 million. These operations were not without danger, as corners could be broken by watering existing stock with new issues, or by repatriating stock held in Europe. Therein lay the excitement of the game. A pool operator would start by simulating weakness in a particular stock in order to shake out those holders on small margins and entice others to sell the stock short. This was known as the partridge trick. The pool even lent from its own stockholding to facilitate short sales. Disreputable brokers provided wash sales, which set misleading prices. In a market hungry for points, or tips, false rumours were rife. Broken speculators, known as pointers, singed cats, or ropers in, were commissioned to put out specious stories and solicit short sales. False rumours became so common that many acted contrary to what they were advised in the market, a practice known as coppering. Once the stock had been oversold, the operator would catch out the short sellers and force up the price. This was known as the scoop game. A corrupt press was a useful tool in the hands of a stock manipulator. The notorious operator Jay Gould, of whom more later, controlled several newspaper editors, who in exchange for share tips would print whatever story he told them. After his death, the New York Times remarked, 
Mr. Gould's editors were known to the public as stool pigeons. It was their function to entice the incautious investor or speculator within reach of his ammunition, to hammer securities that he wished to acquire, and to exalt by artful misrepresentation the quotations of those he desired to unload. Away from the stock exchange, other ways were found to manipulate securities. Influence over the board of directors was the most common and effective method, as Daniel Drew had shown with the Erie Railroad. Drew was frequently a bear, even in the stock of his own company, since his ability to issue new Erie shares made it almost impossible for the other operators to corner him. Railway directors, wrote James Medbury, are the heavy artillery of the stock market, and no corner can attain Napoleonic victory without them. Directors manipulated dividends to suit their speculative activities, sometimes paying them out of capital, broadcast false rumours. In 1869, the directors of the Pacific Mail circulated stories of an impending dividend increase in order to unload their shares, passed expected dividends, and issued unauthorised stock. Occasionally, speculating directors went even further. When Jim Fisk was a director of the Erie Railroad, he sold short the stock of the United States Express Company, which had a contract with the Erie, and then cancelled the contract. Once the Express Company's share price had fallen, Fisk covered his shorts, bought more shares, and then reinstated the contract. This technique was refined later in the century by the notorious gambler and speculator John Bettermillion Gates, who shut down his Chicago steel plant during a period of prosperity and put thousands out of work, claiming that the business was not making money. Like Fisk beforehand, Gates had sold the stock short, and after making a killing in the market, he reopened his factories. The behaviour of speculating directors corrupted the relationship between directors and shareholders, especially the British shareholders, who on the other side of the Atlantic were unable to influence events and were led like lambs to the slaughter. It appeared to justify Adam Smith's claim that joint stock companies were beset by negligence and profusion, since the personal interests of directors differed from those of their shareholders. In his Theory of Business Enterprise, Torstein Veblen contended that it was the custom of American directors to mislead the stock market in order to profit from successive over- and undervaluations of stock. Jay Gould, who once described the Erie Railroad as his plaything, was accused by Matthew Josephson of pursuing a deliberate policy of mismanagement as a matter of principle, deriving his gains from the discrepancies between the real value of the affair and its supposed or transient value in the securities markets. In good times he would give an appearance of gauntness and misery to his enterprises. In bad times he would pretend affluence. The example of Gould and many contemporary directors perhaps explains why ordinary stocks in 19th century America provided a higher yield than fixed-interest bonds, despite the growing wealth of the nation. Directorial depredations and speculations meant that the ownership of shares carried an added uncertainty, justifying what one might call an agency risk premium. Even the federal government was entangled in the national web of speculation. The process of milking the state came very close to that of milking the street. In Twain and Warner's The Gilded Age, Congress resembles a caricature of the stock market, where votes are traded, lobbyists assume the role of stock operators, whom they match in guile and intrigue, members of Congress take the part of brokers, and battles between opposing factions for federal grants and appropriations are engaged with a passion and excitement similar to the contests between the bulls and the bears on Wall Street. Like broken speculators on the curb, the shabby old claimants who loiter around the capital are sustained by nothing save eternal hope. When he arrives in Washington, Colonel Sellers, an irrepressible speculator, is in his native element. Philip Sterling, the novel's hero, on the other hand, finds Washington the maddest vanity fair one could conceive. It seemed to him a feverish, unhealthy atmosphere, in which lunacy could be easily developed. Throughout the Civil War, Washington swarmed with war contractors eager to make a fast buck. Cornelius Vanderbilt furnished the Navy with unseaworthy vessels, 
the young Pierpont Morgan sold faulty carbines to the army, and other contractors supplied goods to the government that were equally shoddy, the words derived from a material made from shredded rags used for Union soldiers' coats. This vanity fair on the Potomac, where everything was for sale, took its place alongside the Carnival of Speculation, William Fowler's phrase, on the banks of the Hudson. The satire of the Gilded Age was directed against the venality of Washington politicians exposed by the Credit Mobilier scandal in 1872. A decade earlier, the Union Pacific Railroad, parodied in the novel as the Salt Lick Pacific Extension, had been established, with the aid of vast federal land grants and loans, to provide the first transcontinental rail connection. After the Civil War, the railroad fell into the hands of a businessman named Oakes Ames, who was also a member of Congress. Ames created a holding company, the Credit Mobilier, through which all the railroad's construction contracts were placed. This presented a perfect opportunity for graft. Construction costs were inflated, for which the Credit Mobilier received Union Pacific shares in payment. That is to say, the shareholders of the Union Pacific were milked to provide profits for the shareholders of Credit Mobilier. In December 1867, the Credit Mobilier declared a dividend equal to its entire capital, and its stock soared to $260 a share. In order to maintain support in Washington, Ames distributed Credit Mobilier shares freely to a number of politicians, including the future president James Garfield, the future Vice President Schuyler Colfax, the leading Republican James Blaine, and many other senators and railway congressmen. By the time the scandal was uncovered, it was estimated that Ames and his group had plundered nearly $44 million from the Union Pacific. Credit Mobilier was the most prominent of many examples of political corruption involving railroads and federal grants, going back to the 1850s. After the election of President Grant in 1868, the unsavoury intimacy between the federal government and business interests deepened, providing an ideal breeding ground for speculation and corruption. At the lower levels of government, the fusion of political venality and financial speculation was laid bare by the two celebrated Harlem Corners of 1863 and 1864. Since the beginning of the war, Vanderbilt had been buying up Harlem Railroad stock, in an attempt to gain control of Wall Street's favourite football. In late April 1863, the New York City authorities gave the railroad permission to run streetcars down Broadway. Not long after, the stock market surged, with Harlem, whose share price more than doubled, leading the way. Once Harlem had peaked at 75, the city's aldermen colluded to sell Harlem short before rescinding permission to build the Broadway line. Unfortunately for them, Vanderbilt had picked up so much stock that its price kept on rising, reaching a peak of nearly 180 in August, when the city's representatives found themselves cornered. Unable to cover their shorts because Vanderbilt already owned all the available shares, they were obliged to settle with him. History repeated itself the following April, when the New York legislators in Albany, coaxed on by Daniel Drew, refused permission for the Harlem extension. On this occasion, Vanderbilt and his ally John M. Tobin succeeded in buying up 27,000 more Harlem shares than were in circulation. In early July, the price of Harlem shot to over a thousand dollars, and the legislators were forced to treat with the Commodore to his enormous profit and pleasure. We busted the whole legislature, and scores of the honourable members had to go home without paying their bills, he boasted. Having burnt their fingers at direct speculation, the New York legislators reverted to the more certain profits of bribery. Four years later, in 1868, they opened their pockets wide to receive the largesse distributed during the so-called Erie War. This event, recorded by Charles Francis Adams, Jr. in Chapters of Erie, concerned Vanderbilt's attempted takeover of the Erie Railroad, which was thwarted by Daniel Drew and his younger confederates, Jay Gould and Jim Fisk. Defying court injunctions and hiring a judge of their own, the Erie Gang, as they became known, dropped millions of dollars' worth of new Erie shares on the market. 
Afterwards, they repaired with their spoils to Jersey City, beyond the reach of New York's jurisdiction. Gould subsequently travelled to Albany with half a million dollars in cash, needless to say, the money technically belonged to Erie shareholders, in order to bribe the legislators to validate retrospectively the new issue of shares. Vanderbilt played the same game, but was defeated by Gould at what Adams called the Legislative Brokers' Board, where votes are daily counted. The total expenditure on bribes in Albany during the summer of 1868 was estimated to exceed a million dollars. J. Gould's Black Friday The victory of the Erie Gang marked the sudden ascendancy of J. Gould and James Fisk among the leading group of stock market operators. Together they comprised the oddest couple ever to enter Wall Street. James Fisk was the son of a Vermont peddler who had worked first in the circus, then as a dry goods merchant in Boston, and subsequently as a cotton smuggler during the war. In the early 1860s he came to Wall Street, where he was taken up as Drew's protégé. He was a tubby, expansive extrovert with a large walrus moustache on a face framed by fair kiss curls, who loved dressing up in absurd uniforms. In the summer of 1869, Fisk entertained President Grant on his pleasure boat, dressed in a blue uniform with a gilt cap band, three silver stars on his coat sleeve, lavender gloves and a diamond breastpin as large as a cherry. His operatic attire was not out of place in Pike's Grand Opera House, which Fisk purchased as the headquarters for the Erie Railroad. Inside this marble palace, Prince Erie Jim Jubilee Admiral James Fisk, Jr. was enthroned, surrounded by a harem drawn from a troupe of ballet dancers. Jim Fisk was, in Henry Adams's description, coarse, noisy, boastful, ignorant, the type of a young butcher in appearance and mind, who considered his Wall Street operations as a gigantic side-splitting farce. Yet for all his faults, he was charismatic and lovable, even to his enemies. Fisk's partner, Jay Gould, created an altogether different impression. Gould was slight, consumptive, dark, secretive, scheming, and loathed passionately by all except his family and Russell Sage, the skinflint millionaire usurer and speculator. The son of a poor farmer from Delaware County, New York, Gould worked his way from New York's leather market, the Swamp, his partner in the leather business shot himself after being ruined by Gould, to Wall Street. He became one of the most vilified figures in 19th century America. His touch is death, said Daniel Drew from personal experience. He was not a builder, he was a destroyer, wrote the financial journalist Alexander Dana Noyes. His sometimes partner, the legendary speculator James R. Keane, known as the Silver Fox, called him the worst man on earth since the beginning of the Christian era. He is treacherous, false, cowardly, and a despicable worm, incapable of generous nature. To Joseph Pulitzer, he was one of the most sinister figures that ever flitted bat-like across the vision of the American people. In his History of Great American Fortunes, Gustavus Myers described Gould as a freebooter who, if he could not appropriate millions, would filch thousands, a pitiless human carnivore glutting on the blood of his numberless victims, a gambler destitute of the usual gambler's code of fairness in abiding by the rules, an incarnate fiend of a Machiavelli in his calculations, his schemes and ambushes, his plots and counterplots. In short, Gould was the epitome of a robber baron. After the Erie War, Fisk and Gould made peace with Vanderbilt, at a cost of nearly five million dollars paid from the Erie Treasury. The sum included half a million paid to the Commodore's associates as compensation for their failed speculation. They soon forced Drew off the Erie board, before breaking him in a corner later in the year. The survival of the fittest, Herbert Spencer's axiom of social Darwinism, then popular in the United States, was nowhere in greater evidence than in the stock market. In autumn, Gould flooded the market with new Erie shares and effected a lock-up of greenbacks, in other words, a credit squeeze, 
which caused railway stocks to crash. After ousting Drew, Gould brought the notorious Tammany boss Bill Tweed onto the Erie board, so as to increase his sway over the city and its judiciary. In less than six months, Gould and Fisk had, according to Henry Adams, created a combination more powerful than any that had been controlled by mere private citizens in America or in Europe, since Society for Self-Protection established the supreme authority of the judicial name. They exercised the legislative and judicial powers of the state. They possessed almost unlimited credit, and society was at their mercy. By the end of 1868, Gould was ready to attempt the most audacious speculative feat in history. In his secretive mind, he harboured plans to corner the supreme object of speculation and emblem of the age, gold. A man of few words and a supreme cynic, Jay Gould understood well enough the uses of Kant. During the Erie War, he had posed as the people's champion, raising the cry against Vanderbilt's creeping railroad monopoly. With the gold scheme in mind, Gould became the farmer's friend. Since the end of the Civil War in 1865, agricultural prices had been falling, mainly as a result of extensions to the railroad system. At the same time, the federal government was withdrawing greenbacks from circulation, which caused gold to fall from nearly 300, in other words the number of greenbacks required to buy $100 in gold specie, in 1864, to around 130 in early 1869. As U.S. exports were paid for in gold, the decline in the gold price made American grain more expensive in Europe. This had a knock-on effect on the Erie Railroad, which derived much of its earnings from shipping grain to the east for export. Gould realised that if the price of gold were to rise, this predicament would be resolved. By posing as a monetary inflationist, he gave his planned gold corner a legitimate political gloss. As the corrupt Senator Dillsworthy declares in The Gilded Age, I never push a private interest if it is not justified and ennobled by some larger public good. Since the federal gold reserves were over a hundred million dollars, compared to a mere fifteen million dollars worth in circulation, the success of Gould's plans depended on control of government policy. In early 1869, Gould recruited as an ally in his scheme an aging political lobbyist and speculator named Abel Corbin, who had recently married President Grant's sister-in-law. Through Corbin, Gould gained access to the President, whom he entertained at the Opera House and on Fisk's steamboat in June, occasions which he used to extol the political benefits of allowing the gold price to rise and to impress upon Grant the necessity of halting further federal gold sales. In July, Corbin secured the appointment of Gould's man, General Daniel Butterfield, as assistant treasurer in New York. Gould's next move was to improve his access to credit by taking control of the 10th National Bank. So far, everything was going well, and in late summer, Corbin and Butterfield were rewarded with an allocation of $3 million worth of gold bullion at the price of 133. Early in September 1869, Corbyn arranged a further meeting with Grant, at which Gould became convinced that the President was prepared to pursue an inflationist policy in order to assist the Western farmers. Gould started buying more gold, although he suffered a setback at the end of the first week in September, when his two partners cashed in their profits and withdrew from the pool. As a result, Gould felt obliged to bring in Fisk, who so far had stood aloof from the scheme, Perhaps Gould felt that Fisk's boisterousness was ill-suited to the fine political manoeuvring required by the situation. It was at this stage, as the game became deeper, that the gold ring started to overplay its hand. They attempted to bribe Grant's private secretary, General Horace Porter, with a half-million allocation of gold, but Porter indignantly turned it down. In the middle of September, Corbyn was pressured into writing to Grant, who was then on holiday in western Pennsylvania, imploring him to stand firm against further gold sales. The letter was delivered by an Erie employee, who telegraphed to Fisk the brief reply. Delivered all, right. This was intended to signify merely the successful conveyance of the letter, 
but was interpreted by the ring as meaning that the president was in agreement with the letter's contents. In fact, Grant was far from pleased with the letter, and in his obtuse way perceived that Corbyn was involved in a scheme to put up gold. The president instructed his wife to write to Mrs. Corbyn, expressing his unease and advising Corbyn to have nothing to do with the gold speculators. Grant received Corbyn's letter on Sunday the 19th of September. The following day, gold opened at just under 138, and despite heavy buying by the clique, it remained around that level for the next couple of days. On Wednesday, Fisk boldly entered the gold room, buying heavily and offering bets of $50,000 that gold would reach 145. That evening, after the exchange closed, Gould paid a visit to Corbyn, only to find him in a desperate state, his wife having received Mrs. Grant's letter. Corbyn begged for permission to sell his gold and take his profits, but Gould demurred and ordered Corbyn to keep silent about the letter's contents. Gould now realised that Grant could not be relied upon to restrict further federal gold sales, and that his own situation was perilous. As a result, he decided to unwind his gold position in secret. What followed next is subject to dispute. It has been suggested that Gould did not inform Fisk of his reversal, although this seems unlikely given that the partners did not fall out afterwards, when in later years Gould double-crossed his brokerage partner Harry Smith and the speculator James R. Keane, all Wall Street heard about it. What appears more credible, given Gould's lack of scruples, is that he decided to sell his gold holdings under the cover of Fisk's continuing purchases. Presumably Fisk knew that the gold scheme was doomed, since he placed all his orders through a broker intermediary, William Belden, and wrote nothing down that would make him liable for the debts. Gould was careful to make no sales of gold to Belden or his associates, as the hapless broker's ruin was carefully prepared. On Thursday the 23rd of September 1869, the gold exchange opened in pandemonium, with gold at just under 142. Throughout the day, the smaller bear speculators, operating on tiny margins, were wiped out as the price edged upwards, despite Gould's sales, on a turnover exceeding $325 million. That evening, Belden reported that his brokers held $110 million worth of gold on Fisk's behalf. Early the next day, a day remembered thereafter as J. Gould's Black Friday, a massive crowd gathered in New Street outside the gold room, in anticipation of the climax that everyone knew was coming. Not daring to appear directly on the exchange, Gould and Fisk directed operations from the broker Heath's offices in Broad Street. When the market opened at ten o'clock, three hundred brokers gathered nervously around the Cupid statue in the centre of the room. Albert Spires, Fisk's broker, opened the bidding at one hundred and fifty, at eleven o'clock, it was observed that General Butterfield's broker was selling, which suggested that government gold sales were about to commence. Fisk ordered Spires to put the price up to 160, while Gould, employing a dozen brokers, continued his sales. Less than an hour later, word reached the room that Treasury Secretary George S. Boutwell had ordered the sale of four million dollars worth of gold. Spires, crazy as a loon, in Fisk's words, carried on bidding at 160, even as the price crashed to 135, and the market descended into chaos. Brokers became quite crazy, or at least irresponsible, and ran, hatless, to and fro, gesticulating and making incoherent bids and offers among others who hardly saw them or realised where they were. Then the rumours grew wilder and wilder, true and false mixed up together. According to Fisk, the atmosphere was not so much sauve qui peut as each man drag out his own corpse. The rapid fluctuations bankrupted thousands of margin holders, mobs formed in Broad Street and outside Gould's brokerage office, and troops were put on alert to enter the financial district. Mindful for their own skins, Gould and Fisk slipped out of Heath's offices by a side entrance and retreated to the Erie Castle, where they were protected by an armed corps of railroad employees. Scores of brokers failed on Black Friday. One of them, named Solomon Marler, shot himself the next day. Fisk cheerfully repudiated his contracts. As he said after the Erie War, nothing is lost save honour. 
but his brokers Spires and Belden failed, with debts nearing one hundred million dollars. Spires was reportedly driven mad by the experience. The Gold Exchange Bank, which operated as the clearinghouse for the gold room, was swamped by over five hundred million dollars worth of transactions, and gave up attempting to sort them out. The daily rate charged on margin loans, the call rate, rose to over fourteen hundred percent, and railroad stocks crashed. Vanderbilt's New York Central falling by nearly three quarters from its peak. The chaos continued into the following week. One man on Wall Street remained safe. Huddled with his pet judge, Jay Gould shielded himself from his creditors with twelve injunctions. When the wreckage was cleared, his own brokerage firm, almost alone, stood strong. It was rumored that Gould had even made eleven million dollars from the debacle. On the subject of profit and loss, however, the Mephistopheles of Wall Street was grimly silent. J. Cook's Black Thursday. The panic of Black Friday did not bring the era of speculation to a close. The railroads, in particular, continued to attract huge capital investment. Between 1865 and 1873, the addition of over 30,000 miles of new track, at a cost of nearly one and a half billion dollars, almost doubled the size of the rail system. This massive investment was fueled by the anticipation that new railroads would produce a rapid settlement of the uninhabited Western territories, which in turn would make the railroads' huge land holdings rise dramatically in value. When the Union Pacific advertised the sale of its plots in Columbus, Nebraska, it lured potential purchasers with the prospect that a fifty-dollar lot may prove a five-thousand-dollar investment, and asked of them. Would you make money easy? Find then the site of a city and buy the farm it is built on. How many regret the non-purchase of that lot in New York, that block in Buffalo, that acre in Chicago, that quarter section in Omaha? In 1869, J. Cook, the banker who had made his name and fortune distributing federal bonds during the war, took over the Northern Pacific Railroad. Whose land grant of nearly fifty million acres in the Northwest was larger than the entire territory of New England. Cook set about hyping the land through a network of agents. His chief publicist, a journalist named Sam Wilkerson, described the railroad's property as a vast wilderness waiting like a rich heiress to be appropriated and enjoyed. Duluth, where the Northern Pacific had a terminus. Was promoted as the zenith city of the unsalted seas. Unfortunately, the agents and publicists could not stir up sufficient popular enthusiasm for what became known derisively as J. Cook's Banana Belt. Cook's Belt was saddled with the responsibility for distributing one hundred million dollars of North Pacific bonds, a task made substantially more difficult by the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War in July 1870. Which halted the flow of European capital to America. By the spring of 1873, fears of an imminent financial crisis were mounting. Conditions in the New York money market were tight, and speculators were forced to pay half a percent a day on their margin loans. Apparently, these high rates were not sufficient to put them off their game, since in May the Bankers Magazine complained that the excessive demand for margin loans was depriving legitimate business of credit, and fostering a growing mania for gambling, which is one of the worst features of the day. The atmosphere was further soured by the continuing revelations of the Credit Mobilier scandal, which undermined investor confidence in the railroads. Nevertheless, intense speculation continued. In the summer, share turnover on the New York Stock Exchange reached one hundred thousand a day for the first time, and the nation warned of increased bucket shop activity. Uncertainty increased in August when several railroads experienced trouble refinancing their outstanding loans, and newspapers carried stories of forged railroad bonds and shares in circulation. At the end of the first week in September. The New York Warehouse and Security Company announced its insolvency after making imprudent loans to certain Western railroads. On Thursday, the 18th of September, 1873, Jay Cook was entertaining President Grant at Ogon's, his lavish mansion in Pennsylvania. That afternoon, at half past two, 
It was announced on the New York Stock Exchange that J. Cook and Company had failed. Unable to sell its railroad bonds, the bank had lost the confidence of its creditors. The initial reaction to the collapse of America's leading bank was disbelief. In Pittsburgh, a paper boy was arrested for shouting out the news. Incredulity soon gave way to panic as the stock market collapsed and daily call rates rose to five percent. The next day, crowds thronged the financial district to witness the unraveling of the speculative drama that had entranced the nation for the past decade and a half. Jim Fisk was no longer on the scene, having been murdered by his mistress's lover two years earlier. Although Vanderbilt continued to contact him through a medium for stock tips, but other characters emerged to play their accustomed roles. Jay Gould viciously shorted stocks. Hetty Green bargain hunted among distressed stocks, while Cornelius Vanderbilt drove his carriage furiously down Broad Street with the intention of dispersing the crowd and with it the atmosphere of panic. Vanderbilt's son-in-law, Horace Clark, was found dead after the failure of the Union Trust Bank, from which he had borrowed heavily to finance his margin speculations. Daniel Drew, the old man of the street, took his final curtain call as his brokerage, Kenyon Cox and Company, was swept away in the panic. Declared bankrupt, Drew retreated to his bed, where he covered himself with blankets and fought off the demons born of over half a century's speculation. He died a year later. When the panic continued into Saturday, the president of the New York Stock Exchange announced that, for the first time in its history, the exchange would close until further notice. Anyone who stood on Wall Street, reported the Nation, or in the gallery of the Stock Exchange last Thursday or Friday and Saturday, and saw the mad terror—we might almost say brute terror. Like that by which a horse is devoured by a pair of broken shafts hanging to his heels, or a dog flying from a tin saucepan attached to his tail, with which great crowds of men rushed to and fro, trying to get rid of their property, almost begging people to take it from them at any price, could hardly avoid the feeling that a new plague had been sent among men, that there was an impalpable, invisible force in the air robbing them of their wits. Of which philosophy had not yet dreamt. The plague metaphor, first applied to describe a financial crisis by Daniel Defoe in 1720, was revived by a Wall Street broker, who described the events of Black Thursday as the worst disaster since the Black Death. The stock exchange reopened after ten days. This time, however. The nation did not escape the consequences of over a decade of speculative excess and overinvestment. Throughout the following winter, factories closed down, railroads discharged employees, banks failed, wages were cut, and money was hoarded. By the end of 1873, over 5,000 commercial failures had been announced, among them the Northern Pacific Railroad and nearly 50 New York brokerages. In January, a crowd of unemployed protesters rioted in Tompkins Square, New York, and were charged by mounted police armed with billy clubs. The depression continued for the remainder of the decade. By 1877, it was estimated that only a fifth of the labor force was in regular employment. Strikes and unrest became frequent. The conflict between capital and labor escalated into violence with the terrorist activities of the Molly Maguires in the Pennsylvania coal fields, and the riots in Pittsburgh during the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. In New York, a religious revival movement thrived in response to the apparent endlessness of the depression. The evangelist Dwight L. Moody, together with the gospel singer Ira Sankey, filled huge halls in the city. Where attendance was noticeably drawn from the Wall Street and Fifth Avenue crowd, driven perhaps by a desire to atone for their sins, which had brought the nation to its parlous state. Peculation, speculation, and manipulation. After the advent of the ticker machine, it became a saying on Wall Street: "Don't argue with the tape. Don't buck the market." It was also said that there is no such thing as a free lunch, which meant that easy profits are not to be found in the stock market. Such adages suggest a market acting efficiently, 
where risk is offset by reward and market price is a reflection of true or fair value. Market operators were happy to promote a view of speculation that fitted this benign picture. When the stockbroker Henry Clues gave testimony to a legislative committee in 1881, he argued that speculation is a method for adjusting differences of opinion as to future values, whether of products or of stocks. It regulates production by instantly advancing prices when there is scarcity, thereby stimulating production, and by depressing prices when there is overproduction. Speculation, Clues added impudently, was also one of the most beneficial agents in the business world for the prevention of panics. While Clues's depiction of speculation might have come straight from the pages of a modern economics textbook, it does not adequately or even honestly describe the nature of American speculation in the second half of the 19th century. The role of speculation was not limited to regulating the distribution of capital and the forces of production. In reality, its influence was far broader and more sinister. Periods of speculation had always fostered dishonesty, but in the 19th century American stock market this tendency was even more pronounced. The corruption of speculation was not limited to company promoters and stock operators. It infected the entire political class in the 1860s. Even three decades later, the reforming President Grover Cleveland was implicated in a stock market pool arranged by James Keane. The rogue trader, much in evidence in the 1990s, was a common figure in 19th century Wall Street. According to James Medbury, writing in 1870, the story of financial irregularities caused by unsuccessful stock speculations is one of the somberest chapters of our recent history. Throughout the second half of the 19th century, there were many infamous cases of financial fraud in the United States. Robert Schuyler's railroad stock forgery in 1854, E.B. Ketchum's gold certificate forgery in 1865, and forgeries of railroad stock at the brokerage White & Company in 1868, which caused losses estimated at $10 million. In 1884, massive frauds were discovered at the brokerage house of Grant & Ward, where General Grant was a partner, albeit of the sleeping variety, which, according to Alexander Dana Noyes, were accompanied by individual wrongdoing, of a kind and on a scale for which even the lax financial morality of those days provided no precedent. During the Gilded Age, frauds by speculating employees of brokers were so common that Medbury claimed, every day, clerks are discharged for dishonesty. There is hardly a house in the whole money quarter that has not suffered from peculation. Trustees and guardians also speculated with their charges property. In February 1869, it was discovered that the Metropolitan Church trustees were using $2 million of church funds in personal stock transactions. It is difficult to ascertain whether the prevalence of speculation actually lowered moral standards, or whether the moral decay of the era simply manifested itself through speculation. It is clear, however, that speculation and financial fraud were frequent bedfellows. Far more serious than the loan activities of rogue traders was the persistence of manipulation by operators in the stock market. This undoubtedly undermined the beneficial aspects of speculation claimed by Clues, and made speculation the cause of frequent panics and depressions. As Matthew Smith noted towards the end of the century, men who corner stocks in Wall Street can produce a panic in an instant that will be felt like an earthquake. A Wall Street panic comes suddenly like thunder from a blue sky. No shrewdness can foresee, and no talent avert it. Speculative manipulation both soured the relationship between directors and shareholders, leading to serious mismanagement, and drove share prices away from their intrinsic or fair value. Charles Dow, the founder of the Wall Street Journal, divided stock market movements into three classes, the result of changes in intrinsic value, the product of manipulation, and the outcome of daily trading. Stock speculators, he suggested, focused on the movements caused by manipulation. 
The vagaries of manipulation, according to Medbury, gives even to irrefragable values the quality of quicksilver. When Jay Gould, as president of the Erie, was asked about the railroad's actual value, he replied brazenly, There is no intrinsic value to it, probably. It is speculated in here and in London, and it has that value. In other words, the value of one of the world's great railroads derived solely from its attraction as a Wall Street fancy. Although the markets are far better regulated today than in the 19th century, the speculator's propensity for manipulation has not diminished with time. In May 1991, a bond trader at Salomon Brothers was discovered attempting to corner the market in two-year U.S. Treasury notes. Attracted by rising stock prices during the 1990s bull market, the American mafia became involved in several pump-and-dump schemes for penny stocks. In the online investment world, manipulation and false rumours abound. One of the most spectacular examples of stock ramping in history occurred in the spring of 1996, when the share price of Comparator, a failed manufacturer of fingerprint identification technology, with net assets of less than $2 million and cumulative trading losses of around $20 million, soared from $0.03 cents to $1.75, at which price the company's market capitalization exceeded a billion dollars. On the 9th of May 1996, 177 million Comparator shares were traded on the Nasdaq exchange, a record figure for an individual company. Belatedly, the Securities and Exchange Commission intervened and suspended trading in the stock. Less than a year later, in the early spring of 1997, the share price of Briex, a Canadian gold mining operation quoted on the Vancouver Exchange, soared from a few cents to 280 Canadian dollars, valuing the company at nearly $7 billion. The company purported to have discovered 200 million ounces of gold on its Indonesian mining concession. Tragically, in late March, the company's deputy geologist fell to his death from a helicopter over the Borneo jungle. Briex's own demise followed shortly after when its auditors released a report condemning what they called a fraud without precedent in the history of mining anywhere in the world. By this date, however, the company's chief executive had cashed in his profits and was enjoying an extended holiday on some sunny island beyond the reach of the law. Such are the tales of a modern gilded age. Believers in efficient markets claim that speculators help to discover values and that stock prices move randomly because they reflect all information relevant to their value. In the 19th century American market, however, intrinsic values were actually hidden by the operations of speculators. Under such conditions, the outsider could only trust to luck in making an investment decision. This suggests a random walk of a very different nature, not the randomness of efficiency, where every share price reflects its current inherent value, and future changes in price come about only on the receipt of new information, but the randomness of manipulation, where a stock might be bulled, bared, trapped, gunned, or cornered at the whim of a small clique of operators. As one stock market commentator advised in the middle of the century, the most rational mode of deciding, in our opinion, with regard to the expediency of being a bull or a bear, is to close one's eyes, toss up a penny, and abide by the result. What were known as the three M's, mystery, manipulation, and thin margins, hindered the stock market from fulfilling its theoretical function of allocating capital efficiently. Instead, railroads were placed where they were not needed, Companies were crippled that might have prospered had they kept away from the stock market, and stock market panics caused unnecessary bank failures. At the end of the 19th century, the American economist H. C. Emery wrote that, whereas gambling consists in placing money on artificially created risks of some fortuitous event, speculation consists in assuming the inevitable economic risks of changes in value. In the American stock market, however, the greatest risks were neither inevitable nor strictly economic, 
since they were mostly the creation of market operators. Samuel Johnson defined gambling as the redistribution of wealth without an intermediate good. The speculation of the Gilded Age conformed to Dr. Johnson's definition. It brought more harm than good and transferred property from the hands of the many into the pockets of the few. Chapter 7 The End of a New Era The Crash of 1929 and Its Aftermath the four most expensive words in the English language are This Time It's Different, attributed to Sir John Templeton. Stock prices have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau, declared the eminent Yale economist Irving Fisher in the autumn of 1929. A few weeks after this oracular pronouncement, the Dow Jones Industrial Average had declined by more than a third, the worst was still to come. On the 8th of July 1932, the Dow Jones closed at 41.88, a drop of nearly 90% from its 1929 peak. The stock market chart of these years resembles a precipice rather than a plateau. Why did Professor Fisher get things so wrong? The answer is that he had fallen for the decade's most alluring idea a thesis which underpinned the great bull market of the late 1920s. He believed that America had entered a new era of limitless prosperity. In fact, the notion of the dawning of a new age of capitalism had appeared in several former speculative periods. Disraeli had asserted that the boom of 1825 would not turn to bust because the period was distinguished from previous ages by superior commercial knowledge. The 19th-century journalist Walter Badgett claimed that, during each speculative revival, merchants and bankers fancy the prosperity they see will last always, that it is only the beginning of a greater prosperity. Alexander Dana Noyes, the financial editor of the New York Times during the 1920s, remembered the stock market boom at the beginning of the century associated with the creation of the great trust companies, such as U.S. Steel, as the first of such speculative demonstrations in history which based its ideas and conduct on the assumption that we were living in a new era, that old rules and principles and precedents of finance were obsolete, that things could safely be done today which had been dangerous and impossible in the past. This new era came to an end in the panic caused by the Northern Pacific Corner in May 1901. It was soon forgotten, only to be replaced by a far more powerful and persuasive New Era argument that came to the fore in the second half of the 1920s. The first premise of the New Economics, as it was otherwise called, was that the business cycle— the periodic undulations of trade first observed in Sir William Petty's successions of dearth and plenty back in the 17th century, had been effectively abolished by the establishment of the Federal Reserve System in 1913. Before this date, financial crises in the United States had been exacerbated by the absence of a central bank to provide funds to the banking sector during periods of instability. The Federal Reserve, with its ability to control interest rates and conduct open market operations, buying and selling government bonds in order to affect the supply of money available to banks, was hailed in the 1920s as the remedy to the whole problem of booms, slumps and panics. As a result, bankers and speculators alike were lulled into a false security which led them to operate irresponsibly, exacerbating the severity of the ensuing crisis. Alongside the belief in the omnipotence of the Federal Reserve, a variety of additional explanations were offered for the endurance of the Coolidge prosperity, which had commenced with the election of President Calvin Coolidge in 1924, and promised to continue into the administration of his successor, Herbert Hoover. They included the extension of free trade, the decline of inflation, and a more scientific style of corporate management, associated with the alumni of the recently established Harvard School of Business Administration and the automated car production lines of Detroit, known in the managerial techno-speak of the day as Fordism. 
Better management brought improvements in productivity and lower levels of inventory stocks. The excessive build-up of inventory was believed to be the most common cause of the economic cycle. Professor Fisher argued that modern production is managed by captains of industry. These men are specially fitted at once to forecast and to mould the future within the realms in which they operate. The industries of transportation and manufactures, particularly, are under the lead of an educated and trained speculative class. Fisher found other reasons to be optimistic. The relaxation of the antitrust laws during Coolidge's presidency allowed for a series of mergers of banking, railroad, and utility companies that promised greater economies of scale and more efficient production. Gains in productivity, which rose by over 50 percent between 1919 and 1927, were ascribed to increasing investment in research and development. American Telephone and Telegraph employed over 4,000 scientists, and over 100,000 applications were lodged with the Commissioner of Patents at the end of 1928. Fisher also celebrated the compliant attitude of labour after the Great Red Scare and strikes of the early 1920s. His most singular New Era argument, however, lay in the benefits he saw flowing from Prohibition, which had begun in 1920. Fisher cited the work of Professor Paul Nystrom of the Columbia Business School, who concluded that a dry nation would increase the efficiency of workers and switch demand from liquor to home furnishings, automobiles, musical instruments, radio, travel, amusements, insurance, education, books and magazines. Fisher was not the only proponent of the new era. In 1927, John Moody, founder of the Credit Ratings Agency, declared that no one can examine the panorama of business and finance in America during the past half-dozen years without realising that we are living in a new era. In April of that year, Barron's, the Investment Weekly, envisaged a new era without depressions. Bernard Baruch, the patrician Wall Street financier who later excoriated the new economics, argued in 1929 that the prospect of peace and free trade, improved statistical information, better understanding of economics among businessmen, and cooperation among the world's central bankers, were producing an industrial renaissance in the United States. Even Herbert Hoover's presidential nomination acceptance speech in the summer of 1928, when he declared the end of poverty to be in sight, was marked by the prevailing New Era optimism. If the economic fundamentals of the country had changed, and panics, along with cyclical fluctuations, were consigned to history, then it followed that these changes should be reflected in the stock market. If corporate earnings were both stable and growing, then a higher value should be attached to them. In 1924, the year of Coolidge's election and the beginning of the Great Bull Market, Edgar Lawrence Smith published a little book entitled common stocks as long-term investments. In this work, Smith attempted to overthrow the conventional wisdom that common stocks were solely a medium for speculation. Given the history of American stock markets, such an attitude was understandable, argued Smith, but it had led investors to exaggerate the dangers of stocks to those who bought them as long-term investments. Applying a statistical analysis to the investment returns of bonds and stocks from the middle of the 19th century onwards, Smith showed that stocks had outperformed bonds, especially during the inflationary period of the first two decades of the 20th century. Smith's conclusion was axiomatic. Even when stocks were bought at a market peak, there is definitely to be expected a period in which we may recover as many dollars as we have invested. Translated into statistical terms, he found that in any 15 period, there was only a 1% chance of a stock market investor suffering a loss of principal. Smith concluded the case for stocks with a few more New Era arguments. Management was becoming more responsive to shareholders' interests, and investment research was improving. The result, he forecast, would be improved returns for common stocks in the near future. For Smith, the chief attraction of stocks derived from the compound growth of retained earnings 
that is, the earnings of companies that were not paid out in dividends. Another contemporary investment writer, Kenneth Van Strum, supplemented this argument with the observation that bonds, unlike stocks, lost purchasing power during inflationary periods. The writings of Smith and Van Strum brought about a profound change in the public's attitude to stock market investment. They provided an intellectual framework for what was soon called the cult of the common stock. Old yardsticks of valuation, which priced stocks at roughly ten times earnings and expected dividend yields to be greater than bond yields, were replaced by the discounting of future earnings. By this method, future receipts were reduced to their present value by applying a discount rate, so that $100 paid in one year's time, discounted at 10%, is valued today at $90. The discount method of valuation is the most speculative method of valuing stocks, since it relies entirely on estimates of future earnings which remain uncertain. As Keynes wrote in The General Theory, the outstanding fact is the extreme precariousness of the basis of knowledge on which our estimates of the prospective yield have to be made. Our knowledge of the factors which will govern the yield of an investment some years hence is usually very slight and often negligible. Some years later, Benjamin Graham, who commenced his own career as an investor in the 1920s, attacked the methodology of discounting profits. The concept of future prospects, and particularly of continued growth in the future, invites the application of formulas out of higher mathematics to establish the present value of the favoured issues. But the combination of precise formulas with highly imprecise assumptions can be used to establish, or rather to justify, practically any value one wishes, however high, for a really outstanding issue. The more important the goodwill or future earning power factor, the more uncertain becomes the true value of the enterprise, and therefore the more speculative inherently the company stock. Mathematics is ordinarily considered as producing precise and dependable results, but in the stock market, the more elaborate and abstruse the mathematics, the more uncertain and speculative are the conclusions we draw from them. Calculus gives speculation the deceptive guise of investment. Contemporaries were aware of this problem. In 1929, it was commonly said that the market was discounting not only the future, but the hereafter. Several commentators warned against these new era developments in the pricing of stocks. To forego a fair normal current return for the sake of hoped-for enhancement of principle, wrote Lewis H. Haney in the North American Review, August 1929, is speculation, pure and simple. It is not investment, for it takes a chance on the future at the expense of safety in the present. In the same journal, Alan Temple analysed the state of the speculative psychology as the market approached its peak. As stocks cannot be purchased upon the basis of what they are intrinsically worth now, these new era buyers pay what they hope the shares will be worth in a year from now, accepting the handicap of a year's start in the race ahead, perhaps a lifetime. Over such a period, they say, a few points more or less difference in the price of a stock will be insignificant. Nor does the possibility of a recession worry them very much, so strong is their belief in stability, in the new era, in the destiny of large corporations. He concluded with an attack on E. L. Smith's thesis. The policy of buying stocks at prices which have already discounted the future to a considerable extent constitutes an amendment to the theory of common stock investment as originally outlined, and the amendment conceivably may destroy its validity. It is an irony, not uncommon in the looking-glass world of the financial markets, where proven investment theses tend to lose their validity when acted upon, that the great stock market boom of the 1920s was induced by the statistically reasoned proposition that stocks were neither speculative nor even particularly risky investments. Aside from new era arguments, there were strong reasons to be bullish on stocks in the second half of the 1920s. The indolent President Coolidge, given to catnapping in the Oval Office, followed a personal and economic philosophy of laissez-faire, laissez-dormir. 
In the absence of an ideology for purposeful government, business was venerated. As Coolidge famously expressed it, the business of America is business. His Treasury Secretary, the wealthy Philadelphia banker Andrew Mellon, agreed. In his opinion, government existed mainly to facilitate business. Indeed, it was no more than a business itself. Mellon set about improving the conditions for business by reducing the top rate of income tax from 65 to 32 percent, cutting corporation taxes to two and a half percent, and slashing capital gains taxes. As a result of these tax cuts, the rich had more money to invest in stocks, companies reported higher after-tax earnings, and more of the profits of speculation could be retained by the players. Mortgaging the future. While the rich became richer during the 1920s, unions were weak, and workers were unable to enjoy the benefits of their improved productivity. At his Baton Rouge plant, Henry Ford employed armed thugs to terrorize his employees against collective action. Unable to maintain their share of the economic surplus, workers experienced a decline in real wages during the decade, and corporate profits rose as a percentage of national income. Capitalism, however, requires consumers as much as savers, and demand was maintained by the massive expansion of consumer credit, then called instalment purchases. Radios, fridges, cars, and clothes could all be purchased on credit. By the end of the decade, when outstanding instalment debt had risen to six billion dollars, it was estimated that around an eighth of all retail sales were made on credit. There was a decidedly speculative element in the growth of instalment credit. Present consumption was being financed with anticipated earnings. Put another way, in their appetite for immediate gratification, the consumers of the 1920s were devouring their future. When the future eventually arrived, they found the cupboard bare. At the time, however, instalment purchases were seen as yet another beneficial new era development. Credit and consumption, it was argued, formed a virtuous circle, since from the immediate increase in prosperity would come the ability to pay off debt. Margin loans comprised another popular source of personal credit during the 1920s. When the stock market rose, investors could cash in some of their profits by increasing their margin loans, and use the money to make good any shortfall in their earnings. Margin loans climbed in tandem with the stock market in the second half of the 1920s. By October 1929, brokers' loans and bank loans to investors had reached a total of nearly 16 billion dollars. At this level, they represented roughly 18 percent of the total capitalization of all listed stocks. As we have seen, margin loans had long been considered a source of instability in the American financial system. President Coolidge, however, viewed the escalation of stock market credit without concern. In January 1928, he announced that margin loans were no cause for concern. They were, he claimed, merely rising in line with bank deposits and stocks. As the bull market continued, others became less sanguine. The Federal Reserve in Washington, the institution that had supposedly abolished panics, had inadvertently ignited the stock market boom by lowering interest rates in 1925. This policy was intended to accommodate the Bank of England. Which was suffering from an outflow of gold after a disastrous return to the gold standard at the pre-war exchange rate. In the summer of 1927, the Fed bowed once more to British demands, backed by the French and Germans, and lowered the discount rate to a record low of three and a half percent. Faced with the growth of speculation, the Fed changed tack, and from February 1928 successively raised the discount rate. Until it reached six percent in August 1929, yet the profits from buying shares on margin were simply too enticing. As long as the market continued rising, speculators were prepared to pay more for their margin loans. While interest rates remained too low to restrain speculation, they became too high for the economy as a whole, or what in the 19th century used to be called legitimate commerce. In February 1929. The Federal Reserve warned its member banks that it did not consider brokers' loans a suitable use for funds, 
But this attempt to restrain speculation through moral suasion was equally ineffective. One reason margin loans proved intractable was that they were increasingly supplied by American corporations and foreign banks, neither of which were responsive to the Federal Reserve. Companies boosted their profits by raising funds in the stock market, which cost around 4% in dividends, and lending their surplus cash in the call loan market at rates of up to 15%. Stock prices, in turn, were propelled forward by speculators buying shares on margin. The effect of call loans on the stock market, in the words of one contemporary, was truly a vicious circle. Selling Stocks Brokerage houses expanded rapidly in the second half of the decade, with nearly 600 branch offices opening in 1928 and 1929, an increase of over 80%. In the summer of 1929, Mike Meehan, the broker cum pool operator, opened the first brokerage office on a transatlantic liner using new wireless technology supplied by the Radio Corporation of America. Equipped with the new era ideology of common stock investment and a limitless supply of brokers' loans, American financial institutions began applying new hard-sell methods in their dealing with retail investors. Although American commercial banks were forbidden to deal in securities, they circumvented the law by using fully owned affiliates to handle their stock and bond sales. This practice was pioneered after the First World War by Charles E. Mitchell, the president of the National City Bank, who established the National City Company to sell securities to the public. Mitchell, a former electrical goods salesman, ran the business in an aggressively commercial fashion. Securities were first manufactured, then distributed, in Mitchell's words, like so many pounds of coffee. Potential clients were viewed as prospects, and sales staff were urged to lie in wait and pounce on them outside nightclubs, railway stations and bucket shops. Other clients were drawn from the parent bank's customers, a practice now known as cross-selling. Quotas were instituted and sales contests organised in order to keep the salesmen on their toes. After the Great War, the United States emerged as the world's leading creditor nation and the stock market boom was accompanied by an explosion of speculative lending to foreign countries. The National City Company became a prominent distributor of high-yielding bonds from South American and Central European states to American investors. In 1928, it sold bonds for Minas Gerais, a Brazilian state, despite an internal company report highlighting the inefficiency and ineptitude and complete ignorance, carelessness and negligence of the former state officials in respect to external long-term borrowing. The term Mitchellism came to describe the peddling of second-rate securities to the public. Charles Mitchell became the most prominent cheerleader of the bull market. As an advocate of the New Era ideology, he informed the public that stocks were as safe as bonds. Throughout the summer and early autumn of 1929, he remained indefatigably bullish. In August, he cabled Bernard Baruch from the grouse moors of Scotland with the message that the stock market was like a weather vane pointing into a gale of prosperity. In Germany, a few weeks later, he declared that the industrial condition of the United States is absolutely sound. Nothing can arrest the upward movement. On the eve of the crash, he assured investors that stocks had already declined too far and that he knew of nothing fundamentally wrong with the stock market or the underlying business or credit structure. The public, he added, is suffering from broker's lonitis. When the crash came, he personally borrowed and lost millions of dollars in a failed attempt to support his bank's share price. Mitchell resembled a snake oil peddler who had come to believe in his own pitch. Pools of Speculators In a nation where a twentieth of the population controlled nine-tenths of all wealth, the stock market was naturally dominated by the wealthier class of speculator. Among the rich speculators, two groups stood out. The first comprised businessmen who had made their first fortunes in the automobile industry and later turned to the stock market for their entertainment. According to Professor Charles Amos Dice of Ohio State University,
These men were particularly well suited to speculative activities, since they did not come into the market hampered by the heavy armour of tradition. The Detroit crowd, as they were known, included Walter Chrysler, the car manufacturer, the Fisher brothers, whose family firm produced car bodies, and John J. Raskop, a director of General Motors. The most flamboyant member of this group was William Crapo Durant, the founder of General Motors. He had resigned from the company in 1920, after losing a fortune speculating in its stock, and thereafter dedicated his professional energies to stock operations, which he conducted on a grand scale. In 1929, Durant's investment pool was rumoured to control more than $4 billion worth of stocks, roughly $38 billion at today's prices, and his profits from speculation were estimated at over $100 million. Although in his private life Durant displayed certain eccentricities, he travelled everywhere with a folding barber's chair and had all his meals prepared at home and driven in to work, his speculations were straightforward and always on the bull side. Irish Americans comprised another leading clique of speculators. They included Charles Mitchell, raised in the immigrant Boston suburb of Chelsea, Mike Meehan, another Irish Bostonian, who had earned his living as a Broadway ticket tout before turning broker and organised two famous pools in the stock of the Radio Corporation of America, Bernard Selim Ben Smith, the trader who managed the radio pool for Meehan, Joseph P. Kennedy, the father of the future president, who famously sold out before the collapse, and J. J. Reardon, the president of the Country Trust Bank, and another member of Meehan's radio pool, who lost his fortune in the crash and committed suicide a few days later. Born mostly into poverty and excluded by their religion from the East Coast financial elite, which was dominated by wasps and German Jews, these men were prepared to take great risks in order to establish themselves. As outsiders, their speculations conformed to the observation of the 18th century financial writer Thomas Mortimer, he who values not his neck, because he is conscious it is worth nothing, may take the boldest leap. Whereas in the 19th century the vulnerability of the stock market to manipulation had tended to frighten away the public, the operations of the major players in the 1920s served as an enticement to outsiders who hoped to share in the good fortune of a Durant by hanging on to his coat-tails. Rumours that pool operators were taking a stock in hand were eagerly received. Taking advantage of the public's weakness, one pool operator bribed journalists on several newspapers to plant stories. Mike Meehan's first pool in the stock of Radio Corporation of America, which propelled RCA's share price from 95.5 to 160 in only 10 days in March 1928, was credited with reviving bullish sentiment in the market. Mitchell's National City Company left nothing to chance. In late 1928, it joined a pool in Anaconda Copper, whose shares it sold on at inflated prices to its own clientele. In two months, the company offloaded a million and a quarter Anaconda shares to the public, making a profit of more than $20 million at a time when the price of copper actually declined by over 25%. Anaconda shares subsequently fell from $125 to less than $4. Company directors were also frequent pool members. Both the chairman and president of Anaconda were involved in the pool in their company's stock, along with Percy Rockefeller and James Stillman, who were directors of the National City Bank. Walter Chrysler operated a pool in the stock of his own company, while Mrs. David Sarnoff, the wife of the founder and chairman of Radio Corporation of America, was a member of Meehan's radio pool. In late 1928, Harry T. Sinclair, the oil man implicated earlier in the decade in the Teapot Dome scandal, involving the corrupt distribution of naval oil reserve leases during President Harding's administration, hired the speculator Arthur Cutton, along with Chase Securities Corporation, an affiliate of Chase National Bank, and Blair and Company, an investment bank, to drive up the share price of Sinclair Consolidated Oil Corporation. The successful operation netted the syndicate a profit of $12 million. In this case, 
Both the presidents of Blair and Company and Chase National were also directors of Sinclair Oil. It was estimated that during 1929, the stocks of over a hundred companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange were subject to similar pool manipulations. A ballyhoo for stocks. Although the total number of stock market players in the late 1920s is variously estimated at between one and two million out of a population of over 120 million, the bull market attracted a public interest far exceeding these numbers. As J.K. Galbraith observed, the striking thing about the stock market speculation of 1929 was not the massiveness of the participation, rather it was the way it became central to the culture. The stock market lured the leading celebrities and entertainers of the age, including Groucho Marx, Irving Berlin and Eddie Cantor, the Siegfeld Follies comedian, who all speculated on margin and eventually lost fortunes. Charlie Chaplin was more fortunate. He sold his stocks in 1928 and remained in cash thereafter. In the stock market of the Roaring Twenties, Americans found a secular religion whose ludic qualities, cynicism and materialism reflected the zeitgeist of the jazz age. F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, published in 1925, A Tale of Hope and Disillusionment, is a parable for the era. Its hero, J. Gatsby, is a self-made man with deluded social ambitions. Born in the Midwest, the breeding ground for many of the great 19th century speculators, he has risen from poverty to great wealth by mysterious means involving bootlegging and forged bonds. His romantic dream is rooted in materialism. The well-born Daisy Buchanan, the object of his love, is described in his own words as having a voice full of money and can only be attained with riches. Gatsby's decadent parties are compared to Trimalchio's feast in Petronius's Satyricon. We are meaner than flies. Flies have their virtues. We are nothing but bubbles, says one of Trimalchio's guests, an observation that links the vanities of ancient Rome and its forum to those of Long Island and Wall Street. For the evanescent Gatsby, the epitome of the homo bulla of humanist discourse, the price for living a single dream too long is death. A similar fate lay in store for the nation's speculators. The 1920s were an age of women's emancipation. Employed in ever greater numbers since the war and granted the vote in 1920, women enjoyed greater social freedom. They smoked, danced to the music on the radio, and in the face of the law drank cocktails. The motor car provided them with the freedom to enjoy illicit sexual encounters, and was denounced by one preacher as the house of prostitution on wheels. More than ever before, women came to exercise their economic franchise in the stock market. In an article entitled Ladies of the Ticker, published in the North American Review in the spring of 1929, Eunice Fuller Barnard reported that Wall Street had finally arrived in Fifth Avenue. In the hotels of Upper Broadway, special brokers' rooms were set aside for women, where, according to Barnard, day in and day out, through a long five hours, aggressive and guttural dowagers, gum-chewing blondes, shrinking spinsters who look as if they belonged in a missionary society meeting, watch, pencil in hand, from the opening of the market till the belated ticker drones its last in the middle of the afternoon. It was estimated that women possessed over 40% of the nation's wealth and accounted for 35% of stock market turnover. Their presence was heavy in the shareholder registers of America's largest companies. They owned over 30% of the shares in U.S. Steel and General Motors and more than 50% of the shares in American Telephone and Telegraph and the Pennsylvania Railroad, which became known as the Petticoat Line. It was a sign of the times that J. J. Raskob of General Motors chose the Ladies' Home Journal to publish his essay entitled Everybody Ought to be Rich, where he suggested that, through a judicious selection of stocks and the application of debt, a small regular investment would inevitably turn into a large fortune. Women were said to provide the main impetus behind the bull market. In the past year, wrote Eunice Barnard, 
The growth of the woman investor and the woman speculator has been amazing, and it is getting larger almost weekly. They came from all classes, heiresses, stenographers, businesswomen, housewives, farmers' wives, cleaning ladies, waitresses, telephone girls, cooks, and washerwomen. Rumors circulated of great fortunes attained by the lady bulls. It was argued that as women spent the household money, they knew better than their husbands which retailing and manufacturing stocks to invest in. They were said to be good losers. A lady speculator told the financial journalist Edwin Lefebvre that she had lost a million dollars. I had a perfectly stunning time while it lasted. I never knew what fun it was to make money. Yet some brokers found their female customers to be hard losers, naggers, stubborn as mules, and suspicious as servants. As in earlier periods, there was a feminist angle to women's involvement in the stock market. Women are at last taking a hand in man's most exciting capitalist game, wrote Eunice Barnard. For the first time, they have the interest, the self-assurance, and the entrance fee. If they become intelligent players. And if, to any extent, they should win financial power, they would probably, in our economic society, as a matter of pragmatic fact, do more to raise the level of common respect for women as a class than all the hard-fought suffrage campaigns. The pick of the stocks. The speculator's fancy for new technologies was well served by the bull market. The motor car replaced the railroads as both the engine of economic prosperity and the favoured object of speculation. It transformed the culture and geography of the nation. Roads were surfaced, highways built, and garages erected to accommodate the increasing number of passenger cars, which rose from seven million to twenty-three million during the 1920s. Over a million visitors flocked to view the new Model A at Ford's New York headquarters. The excitement was reflected in the stock market, where General Motors' share price increased over tenfold between 1925 and 1928, an advance so rapid that it put the stock market on the front page of the newspapers. When J. J. Rascob made his proposal for universal wealth in August 1929, he pointed out that ten thousand dollars invested a decade earlier in General Motors would have grown to more than one point five million. The public interest generated by the motor car was exceeded only by that for the radio, first launched by Westinghouse in 1920. The wireless became the purveyor of fashions across the nation. Sales of radio sets rose from $60 million dollars in 1922 to $843 million six years later. The new industry was dominated by Radio Corporation of America, often referred to simply as radio. Which was both the largest manufacturer of radios and the leading broadcaster. The company's earnings increased from 2.5 million dollars in 1925 to nearly 20 million in 1928, and its stock climbed from a low of one and a half in 1921 to 85 and a half in early 1928. From there, it was propelled by Meehan's Pool operations to a high of 114 in 1929. Seventy-three times its earnings and nearly seventeen times book value. RCA was highly leveraged, paid no dividends, and expanded rapidly through acquisitions. In 1929, it was the most heavily traded stock on the New York Stock Exchange, where it was known as the General Motors of the Air. The national euphoria following Charles Lindbergh's solo crossing of the Atlantic in 1927. Propelled the speculative appeal of the young aircraft industry, Wright Aeronautical, Curtiss, and Boeing Airplane, renamed United Aircraft and Transport in 1929, became favourites in the stock market. The motion picture industry was also attractive to speculators. As Hollywood made the transition from silent films to talkies, the large studios were consolidating their positions, and profits expanded rapidly. In October 1928, Joseph Kennedy merged his movie interests to form the giant RKO, and the following year, the Fox Film Corporation paid $72 million for Lowe's chain of movie theaters. The debt taken on by this deal caused Fox's share price to collapse from 106 to 19 after the crash. Contrary to public perception, 
movie stocks performed badly during the Depression. The Appeal of Leverage The dominant feature of the 1920s stock market was not the wild pursuit of speculative innovations, but the use of debt to pyramid investments and enhance gains. With margin loans, speculators could afford to buy AOT, any old thing. As Groucho Marx, who personally borrowed over a quarter of a million dollars to play the stock market, recalled in his memoirs, during the bull market there was no need to employ a financial adviser to select your stocks. You could close your eyes, stick your finger any place on the big board, and the stock you bought would start rising. Leverage was not confined to individual speculators' margin holdings. It became built into the financial structure of corporate America. Utility and railway companies were consolidated into giant holding companies called systems, an unconscious echo of John Law's Mississippi system, which were constructed upon multiple layers of debt. Samuel Insull, a former secretary to Thomas Edison, constructed a giant utility network in the Midwest, which diversified into tyre manufacturing, shoe factories and real estate. Insull Utility Investments, an investment trust, owned cross-shareholdings in a number of utility companies, each of which was highly leveraged with debt, so that a small rise in the earnings of the operating businesses had a disproportionately large effect on the profitability of the holding company. Profits were also manufactured by subsidiaries selling assets to each other at inflated prices. As the structure of Insull's business empire was too complex for even the sophisticated investor to understand, Insull arranged to sell his company's shares directly to their customers. A frenzy for utility holding companies dominated the last phase of the bull market, their shares reaching a 1929 peak of more than four times book value and dividend yields falling to less than 1%. In January 1929, J.P. Morgan, the investment bank, acted as the promoter for the United Corporation, a holding company that produced a fifth of the nation's electricity. It was later revealed that Morgan had retained for itself nearly two million warrants, providing the right to subscribe to new shares in the company at a fixed price, and had distributed United's shares at below market prices to its preferred clients, who included Charles Mitchell of the National City Bank, J.J. Raskob of General Motors, and former President Calvin Coolidge. The fashion for holding companies extended far beyond the utilities. The Van Swearingen brothers, two property developers from Cleveland, Ohio, used a complicated structure of holding companies to merge a number of railroads in the Midwest. Their Allegheny Corporation, sitting atop a mountain of debt, was also sponsored by J.P. Morgan. Ivar Kruger, the Swedish match king, built an international chain of monopolies, which controlled around three-quarters of the world's match production. His heavily indebted holding company, Kruger & Toll, financed its operations by issuing bonds in New York. Banks also clustered themselves together. The Transamerica Corporation merged the banking interests of A.P. Giannini, which included the California-based Bank of Italy, and the Bank of America in New York. In Detroit, two holding companies, the Guardian Detroit Union Group and the Detroit Bankers Company, had a monopoly on local banking. The holding company concept found its widest application in the field of investment trusts. The purpose of the investment trust, which originated in Scotland in the late 19th century, was to hold the securities of other companies, providing the small private investor with the benefits of professional management and investment diversification at a low cost. They thrived in the bull market. In 1928, over 200 new investment trusts were launched, with combined assets of over a billion dollars. Three years earlier, the combined capital of American investment trusts had been less than half a million dollars. During the first nine months of 1929, a new investment trust appeared for every working day, and the industry issued over $2.5 billion worth of securities to the public. Investment trusts were sold to the public with all the puffed-up rhetoric of the new era. In an article published in the summer of 1929, Professor Irving Fisher asserted that 
the influence of investment trusts is largely toward cutting the speculative fluctuations at top and bottom, thus acting as a force to stabilize the market. Investment trusts buy when there is a real anticipation of a rise due to underlying causes, and sell when there is a real anticipation of fall, thus ensuring that stocks sold more nearly to their true value. The high turnover of shares in the investment trust portfolios was hailed as sound management. It was even argued that investment trust purchases were providing stocks with a new scarcity value. In reality, the effect of investment trusts on the stock market was highly destabilizing. Their managers invested heavily in blue chip stocks and lent their surplus cash to the call loan market, thus serving both to increase the demand for shares and to stimulate speculation. They borrowed heavily against their assets in order to leverage profits, thereby increasing stock market volatility. The high stock turnover in the trust's portfolios reflected baneful trend following rather than the sober pursuit of intrinsic value. The investment banks, which sponsored the new trusts, frequently dumped stocks into their portfolios that they found difficult to sell elsewhere. As a result, the investors were diversified in junk. Worst of all, several investment trusts invested in the shares of affiliated trusts, the history of the Goldman Sachs Trading Corporation is exemplary. Launched in December 1928 with a capital of $100 million, the company first invested $57 million in its own shares. Then, in July 1929, it launched the Shenandoah Corporation, in which it retained a sizable stake. A month later, another investment trust called Blue Ridge issued forth from Shenandoah. As with the systems of Insol and others, the returns of these investment companies were enhanced with leverage. The public was initially enthused by this exercise in what Professor Galbraith has called fiscal incest, and shares in Goldman Sachs trading rose to nearly three times their book value. Not all contemporaries were sanguine. In the summer of 1929, the chairman of the New York State Assembly's Committee on Banks feared that if a crash were to happen, the investors who own investment trust shares would be worth little or nothing after the banks took up the stocks that are given as security for loans. Paul M. Warburg, a prominent banker and a leading figure behind the establishment of the Federal Reserve System, dismissed the investment trusts as incorporated stock pools. Warburg's fears were not confined to the vogue for investment trusts. In March 1929, he alerted readers of the Commercial and Financial Chronicle that history, which has a painful way of repeating itself, has taught mankind that speculative overexpansion invariably ends in overcontraction and distress. If orgies of speculation are permitted to spread too far, however, the ultimate collapse is certain not only to affect the speculators themselves, but also to bring about a general depression involving the entire country. Warburg was not alone in harbouring fears of the possible outcome of the speculative mania. Herbert Hoover, Commerce Secretary under Coolidge, had warned privately since early 1926 that excessive speculation and the overextension of instalment credit were threatening the long-term prosperity of the nation. When he assumed the presidency early in 1929, Hoover attempted to address the issue of speculation. Since he did not feel it was constitutionally proper for him to dictate the level of stock prices, he urged newspaper editors to warn their readers about stock prices. Treasury Secretary Mellon, who until this date had been decidedly bullish, was asked to exhort the public to purchase bonds rather than shares. Yet Hoover's admonitions were as ineffective as those of Prime Minister Robert Peel during the railway mania of 1845. The bankers with whom Hoover consulted politely informed him of the tenets of the new era philosophy, while less eminent Cassandras were told to stop sandbagging America. The Madness of Crowds the arguments against the new era revaluation of stocks, which had sent shares trading to 30 times income, were compelling. Since 1924, 
share prices had risen three times faster than corporate earnings. High interest rates were beginning to throttle economic activity. Installment loans had reached the limits of their expansion since wages were not rising. Gold was flowing to New York from London and Berlin, forcing up European interest rates and weakening their economies with negative consequences for American exports. In the United States, declining agricultural commodity prices brought a reduction in the purchasing power of American farmers, who then comprised a sizable proportion of the population. In August 1929, the North American Review noted. Over against the mergers, increased exports, growing population, and multiplication of new products, which the profits of the new era visualize, we must set the possibility of antitrust law enforcement, increased European competition, retaliation to tariff measures, declining price levels, and limited purchasing power. Yet none of these points carried much weight against the prospect of continuing profits from stock speculation. In his introduction to the 1932 edition of Mackay's Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Bernard Baruch suggested that American speculators in 1929 displayed the attributes of a crowd psychology. He cited the German playwright Schiller's dictum that anyone taken as an individual is tolerably sensible and reasonable. As a member of a crowd, he at once becomes a blockhead. Although they were not directly concerned with financial markets, the early studies of crowd or herd mentality conducted by Freud and the nineteenth-century psychologist Gustave Le Bon identified certain features also commonly found in a bull market mentalité. According to Freud and Le Bon, the defining characteristics of a crowd are invincibility, irresponsibility, impetuosity, contagion. Changeability, suggestibility, collective hallucination, and intellectual inferiority. The crowd and the stock market have other features in common. They both thrive on uncertainty and rumor. While crowds generally seek out a leader, whom Freud termed the dreaded primal father, this figurehead may be substituted by a common tendency, a wish in which a number of people can have a share. In crowds and power, Elias Canetti claimed that money was capable of creating the focus of interest and purpose necessary for a crowd mentality to form. Like the forces behind a bull market, the crowd is inherently unstable. It has no stasis, no point of equilibrium, and is driven by a dynamic either to grow or to shrink. At the moment of its dispersal, a crowd frequently succumbs to panic. It is of the very essence of a panic, wrote Freud, that it bears no relation to the danger that threatens it, and often breaks out on trivial occasions. The intellectual inferiority of the crowd is a sign that people are filtering and manipulating new information to make it accord with their existing beliefs. Psychologists call this behavior cognitive dissonance. Dissonant information, which contradicts the collective fantasy. Is uncomfortable, and people seek to avoid it. They may do this either by shooting the messenger or by proselytizing and seeking fresh converts to their fold. In his theory of cognitive dissonance, Leon Festinger argued that people will tolerate increasing degrees of dissonance if they are motivated by a sufficiently enticing reward. In financial markets. One might say they are prepared to ignore bad news because they still hunger after the immediate profits of speculation. A description of the speculators in William Fowler's circle during the 1860s provides an illustration of this behaviour. They were engaged, wrote Fowler, in bolstering each other up, not for money, for we thought ourselves impregnable in that respect, but by argument in favour of another rise. We knew we were wrong. But tried to convince ourselves that we were right. Baruch's assertion that, as a group, the stock market speculators of 1929 displayed a crowd mentality, fits well with the analysis of Freud and others. The crowd mentality may be seen to have its source on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, like the war drum of the African tribes. The ticker 
excitedly clattering out the latest stock prices to brokers' offices, spread the spirit of the crowd from further afield. During the normally torpid summer months, an actual crowd, estimated at 10,000 persons, filled New York's financial district, lending a carnivalistic atmosphere to the last days of the bull market. Informal speculative groups congregated everywhere, while the radio joined those living in isolated communities to the bull crowd. This crowd, led by men such as Charles Mitchell and Mike Meehan, gained cohesion from the New Era ideology and a collective faith in rising stock prices. In the face of minor stock market panics, in June and December 1928 and later in March 1929, the bull forces succeeded in regrouping. They came out stronger for their trials, until the point was reached when speculators became deaf to warnings they did not wish to hear, and developed a belief in their own invincibility. Instead of reasoning, they thrived on the countless rumours of fabulous wealth gained in the stock market by valets, chauffeurs, cattlemen, actresses, farmers' wives, and so on. In Only Yesterday, Frederick Lewis Allen described the trance into which the average American had fallen by the summer of 1929. He visioned an America set free from poverty and toil. He saw a magical order built on the new science and the new prosperity. Roads swarming with millions upon millions of automobiles, airplanes darkening the skies, Lines of high-tension wire carrying from hilltop to hilltop the power to give life to a thousand labour-saving machines, skyscrapers thrusting above one-time villages, vast cities rising in great geometrical masses of stone and concrete, and roaring with perfectly mechanised traffic, and smartly dressed men and women spending— spending with the money they had won by being far-sighted enough to foresee, way back in 1929, what was going to happen. Nemesis According to Festinger, a group will maintain a state of cognitive dissonance until the pain exceeds the rewards. In stock market terms, this might be seen as the moment when the fear of loss outweighs the greed for gain. That point was reached on the 3rd of September, 1929, when the Dow Jones reached its year high. The following day, at the annual National Business Conference, an investment advisor named Roger Babson forecast an imminent stock market crash. He predicted that factories will shut down, men will be thrown out of work, the vicious circle will get in full swing, and the result will be a serious business depression. The pronouncement elicited a savage response from the apostles of the new era. No pun was too corny. One paper dubbed Babson the prophet of loss. Another suggested that he was suffering from an attack of Babson-mindedness. Stockbrokers pointed out that Babson had made the same forecast in the two previous years. Professor Irving Fisher emerged from his ivory tower to justify the current stock price levels and deny the likelihood of a crash. Yet on this occasion the market appeared to heed Babson's warnings and weakened sharply. The new era invocations had suddenly lost their potency. Although investment trusts issued a record $600 million worth of new securities in September, the stock market remained weak throughout the month. It became increasingly receptive to bad news. In the middle of September, the information was received from London that the business empire of Clarence Hattrey had collapsed amidst revelations of fraud. The Bank of England reacted by raising interest rates, causing British investors to start selling their American investments and repatriating their capital. On the 4th of October, Alfred Sloan, the head of General Motors, observing a sudden dip in car sales, announced that the end of expansion was at hand. A week later, the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities denied the request of the Boston Edison Company to split its stock, four shares for one, on the grounds that speculators had already driven its share price above intrinsic value. Rumours surfaced that Bear Pools, led by the renowned speculator Jesse Livermore, were preparing to drive the market down with short sales. 
Livermore received a mailbag of death threats and issued a public statement denying the rumour. At the beginning of September, Winston Churchill had arrived in the United States on a lecture tour. The former Chancellor of the Exchequer was not only the descendant of speculators, Sarah, Duchess of Marlborough, and Leonard Jerome, he was also connected with the leading players in the current bull market. In New York, he stayed with Percy Rockefeller, a member of numerous stock pools, and dined with Bernard Baruch. Churchill enlivened his visit by purchasing shares on margin, using as capital £20,000 he had recently earned from journalism and lecture fees. On Thursday the 24th of October, Churchill was walking down Wall Street when a stranger invited him to enter the visitor's gallery of the New York Stock Exchange. Two months earlier, James Walker, the mayor of New York, had visited the same place to witness what he called the Eighth Wonder of the World, the continuing bull market on the big board. A rather different spectacle confronted Churchill that day, a day known thereafter as Black Thursday. The panic that unfolded before his eyes had no palpable cause. Unlike former stock market panics, it was not preceded by tightness in the money market. No banking, brokerage or industrial failures served as a trigger, and yet panic there was. Within half an hour of opening, many stocks were dropping ten points between trades. Several stocks hit air pockets when no bid was offered. By one o'clock, the ticker was running an hour and a half late. There was a surreal quality to events. Churchill had expected to see pandemonium, but the rules of the exchange precluded members from running or shouting. So there they were, walking to and fro like a slow-motion picture of a disturbed ant heap, offering each other enormous blocks of securities at a third of their old prices and half their present value, and for many minutes together finding no one strong enough to pick up the sure fortunes they were compelled to offer. A measure of calm was restored after leading bankers met at the offices of J.P. Morgan and supplied funds to buy shares and stabilise the market. Although the stock averages had not fallen greatly by the close of trading, the Dow Jones closed down only six points at 299, nearly 13 million shares had changed hands on the New York Stock Exchange, triple the normal daily turnover, and more than double the previous record. Black Thursday marked only the beginning of the disorderly liquidation of financial assets inflated by the preceding bubble. The following two trading days were relatively quiet. Over the weekend, staff at the brokerage houses remained at their desks, clearing up the backlog of paperwork and calculating the margin calls to be sent out by telegram to their clients. On Monday, the 28th of October, disaster struck. The Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 38 points to 260, the largest drop on record. The ticker ran three hours late at closing. Throughout the day, foreign and corporate lenders to the call market scrambled to withdraw their loans. From the moment it opened on Tuesday, the 29th of October, the stock market was deluged by a further wave of sale orders as margin calls forced speculators to dispose of their stocks. Gone was the composure witnessed by Churchill a few days earlier. On the floor of the exchange, a broker grabbed a messenger by his hair, another fled the floor screaming like a madman, jackets were torn, collars dislodged, and clerks in their frenzy lashed out at each other. The panic worsened after the technology upon which the market had become dependent collapsed. The transatlantic cable broke, the ticker stopped running, telephone lines became clogged with inquiries, and the telegraph system was unable to cope with the volume of brokers' margin calls sent out across the nation. In New York, Western Union was forced to hire a fleet of taxis to deliver its telegrams. When the market closed, the ticker carried on clattering its dismal message for two hours. The Dow Jones Industrials were down 30 points at 230, on a massive turnover of 16.5 million shares. They called it the Day of the Millionaire's Slaughter. On Black Tuesday, the glamour stocks of the bull market suffered the worst damage. Radio Corporation of America, which on Monday had shed $19, 
collapsed from 40.25 to 26 in the first two hours of trading, at which point it was down over 75% from its peak. The Goldman Sachs Trading Company opened at 60 and closed at 35. Blue Ridge, its affiliated investment trust, which a few weeks earlier was selling for 24, dropped from 10 to 3. And the United Corporation, J.P. Morgan's giant utility, went from 26 to 19.30. Bank stocks were slaughtered. The First National Bank of New York declined from $5,200 to $1,600, while National City sank from 455 to 300, despite a rearguard action from Charles Mitchell, who personally borrowed $12 million to support the stock. The Hollywood favorites, Paramount, Fox and Warner Brothers, were also hit hard. For many stocks, there was simply no bid. A messenger boy was reported to have picked up a parcel of White Sewing Machine Company, which had traded earlier in the day at 48 and closed the previous day at 11 and one-eighth, for a dollar a share. The Slide into Depression America faced its stock market ordeal with a sense of humour. The market steadied the day after Black Tuesday, when John D. Rockefeller Sr. announced that he and his son were purchasing sound common stocks. Sure, reported Eddie Cantor from the Broadway footlights, himself down a reported million dollars. Who else had any money left? It was Cantor who gave publicity to the suicide legends of two speculators leaping from a bridge holding hands because they shared a joint account, and of hotel reception clerks asking new arrivals whether they came to sleep or to jump. He also observed that since the crash, women's hemlines had come down. The jazz age, according to Scott Fitzgerald, had leapt to a spectacular death. More austere times were around the corner. Although stocks continued to slide until the middle of November, Hoover's administration acted promptly to mitigate the fallout from the crash. The president's public pronouncements were consistently upbeat. He convened business leaders and urged them to maintain wages in order to sustain demand. Private and public organizations were asked to bring forward their construction plans, and Treasury Secretary Mellon announced a small tax cut in November. The banking authorities also acted speedily. On the 31st of October, the Federal Reserve reduced the discount rate to 5%, followed by a further reduction of half a percent two weeks later. The New York Federal Reserve Bank oversaw a massive shift in the call loan market, as outstanding margin loans dropped by 50% between September and November. Foreign and corporate lenders continued to withdraw their funds from the call loan market, and were replaced by the New York banks, which maintained low rates on loans and reduced margin requirements to 25%. There were no significant banking or brokerage failures in the immediate aftermath of the crash, apart from the Industrial Bank of Flint, Michigan, which was forced to close its doors after it was discovered that a cabal of employees had stolen $3.5 million and lost it in the stock market. American corporations also did their best to steady nerves. The day after Black Tuesday, U.S. Steel and several other companies announced increased dividends. Samuel Rosenwald of Sears Roebuck and Samuel Insull declared they would guarantee their employees' margin accounts. When General Motors announced an extra dividend on the 14th of November, the news was greeted jubilantly, and the Dow Jones stepped off its low of 198 and rose by nearly 25% over the next few days. Optimism was quick to resurface. On the day the market turned, Bernard Baruch cabled Churchill to inform him that the financial crisis was over, although this was of little comfort to the future Prime Minister, who lost more than £10,000, roughly £300,000 at today's values, in the crash, and was obliged to live frugally for the next few years. Baruch's was a conventional opinion shared by many of the smaller market players, who believed the crash presented them with yet another buying opportunity. The news was mostly positive. Turnover in the stock market was lively at five to six million shares a day. Many corporations announced record profits for the previous year, and mergers in banking and utilities continued, as did the property boom. People took comfort in the fact that the major banks appeared well capitalized. 
In New York, J. J. Raskob continued with his plans for the hundred-story Empire State Building, which he described as a symbol for a land which reached for the sky with its feet on the ground. In his ambition to build the world's tallest building, Raskob faced competition from his fellow speculator Walter Chrysler, who was building his own 1,146-foot-high skyscraper. Meanwhile, William Crapo Durant busied himself with new stock pools. In March 1930, President Hoover announced that the worst effects of the crash upon employment will have passed during the next 60 days. The following month, the Dow Jones broke through the 300 barrier, up nearly 50 percent from its post-crash low. Yet the suckers' rally, as it was later called, came to an end in the spring of 1930, and the market resumed its downward course until the summer of 1932, when the Dow reached a low of 41.88 on a turnover of under 400,000 shares. In the intervening period, the country's gross national product had fallen by 60 percent from its 1929 level, and unemployment had risen to 12 and a half million. Over a third of the non-agricultural workforce was unemployed. As the nation sank into depression, the apotheosis of the businessman came to an end. In March 1932, Ivar Kruger, the Swedish match king, committed suicide in a Paris hotel. After his business empire collapsed under the weight of debts and the discovery of Kruger's own frauds, the following month Samuel Insull's Middle West Utilities went into bankruptcy, and Insull fled the country. He later returned to face trial and was acquitted of fraud. The directors of the Goldman Sachs Trading Corporation were put on trial for wasting the company's assets. Charles Mitchell was forced to resign from the National City Bank. Whose share price fell from four percent of its 1929 peak, and in 1934 he was tried for income tax evasion. William Crapo Durant was sold out by his brokers in late 1930 and declared bankrupt in 1936 with debts of nearly a million dollars. He found temporary employment washing dishes in a New Jersey restaurant. Jesse Livermore, who had made his first fortune in Wall Street during the 1907 panic. Lost an estimated thirty-two million dollars before being declared bankrupt in March 1934. Six years later, Livermore blew his brains out in the washroom of the Sherry Netherland Hotel in New York. When the market touched bottom in 1932, Radio Corporation of America was selling for two dollars fifty a share, down from one hundred and fourteen dollars three years earlier. Mike Meehan, the radio specialist on the New York Stock Exchange, Was reported to have lost forty million dollars in the crash. His seats on the exchange were put up for sale, and his brokerage offices on the transatlantic liners were closed down. In 1936, Meehan entered a lunatic asylum. Popular history holds these men, along with their countless followers, responsible for the Great Depression. At his inauguration in March 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation. Plenty is at our doorstep, but a generous use of it languishes in the very sight of the supply. Primarily, this is because rulers of the exchange of mankind's goods have failed through their own stubbornness and their own incompetence, have admitted their failure and have abdicated. Practices of the unscrupulous money changers stand indicted in the court of public opinion, rejected by the hearts and minds of men. True, they have tried. But their efforts have been cast in the pattern of an outworn tradition. Faced by the failure of credit, they have proposed only lending of more money, stripped of the lure of profit by which to induce our people to follow false leadership. They have resorted to exhortations, pleading tearfully to restore confidence. They know only the rules of a generation of self-seekers. They have no vision, and when there is no vision, the people perish. The money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. We may now restore that temple to the ancient truths. The measure of the restoration lies in the extent to which we apply social values more noble than mere monetary profit. Had Roosevelt referred to speculators rather than money changers, his meaning might have been clearer. But as it was a time for divine retribution, with the new president playing the role of a wrathful Christ, 
the biblical money-changers had a more suitable ring. Less than a year earlier, in the summer of 1932, Roosevelt had staked his claim to presidential office on the failure of economic individualism and the responsibility of Wall Street for the Depression. Hoover was stigmatised as an unfeeling, laissez-faire, new-era Republican, an attack that unfairly overlooked Hoover's unceasing, if futile, attempt to revive the economy. In the spring of 1932, the Senate Committee on Banking and Currency opened its investigation into the operations of Wall Street during the 1920s. Ferdinand Pecora, the Sicilian-born head counsel for the investigation, interrogated the prominent financiers of the 1920s and mercilessly exposed their shortcomings. Tales of pools, market manipulation, preferential treatment for insiders, shoddy treatment of outsiders, tax evasion and excessive remuneration were revealed to the public at the moment of its greatest distress. It was Pecora's conclusion that the exchange had become a glorified casino where the odds were heavily weighted against the eager outsiders. During Roosevelt's first administration, a series of measures were initiated to restrict the freedom under which speculators had formerly operated. Investment and commercial banking were separated by the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933. In future, the capital of commercial banks and their ability to lend would no longer fluctuate with the rise and fall of the stock market, and their customers would no longer be pushed second-rate securities. A year later, the Securities Exchange Act became law. Stock market pools, insider trading and market manipulation were proscribed. The Federal Reserve was given the power to restrict margin loans, which were limited to a maximum of 50% of the collateral value of shares. The Securities and Exchange Commission was established to police the capital markets and prevent unnecessary, unwise and destructive speculation. In a controversial move, Roosevelt appointed Joseph Kennedy, a member of numerous stock pools, as its first chairman. Bear speculators, whose short selling was blamed by nearly everyone, including Hoover, for the collapse in market confidence, were restricted by the introduction of the uptick rule, which permitted short sales only after a stock had risen on its last trade. The politics of Roosevelt's New Deal rejected the freewheeling individualism of the 1920s and replaced it with governmental direction in economic affairs. In place of market forces came federal welfare, housing and work programmes, bank deposit insurance, prices and income policies, minimum wage legislation and a number of other measures. Speculation, whether in stocks, bonds, land or commodities, was no longer to play such a key role in economic life. These largely ad hoc measures were provided with an intellectual framework by the publication of Keynes's The General Theory of Employment, Interest and Money in 1936. Keynes attacked the earlier prominence given to speculators and the stock market in the allocation of capital resources. He asserted that there is no clear evidence from recent experience that the investment policy which is socially advantageous coincides with that which is most profitable. In perhaps the most quoted passage from the book, Keynes wrote, Speculators may do no harm as bubbles on a steady stream of enterprise, but the position is serious when enterprise becomes a bubble on a whirlpool of speculation. When the capital development of a country becomes a by-product of the activities of a casino, the job is likely to be ill done. In support of this statement, Keynes drew his readers' attention to the recent history of Wall Street, whose success in directing new investment towards the most profitable channels cannot be claimed as one of the outstanding triumphs of laissez-faire capitalism. As a cure for the evil of speculation, he suggested a punitive capital gains tax on stock market transactions in order to force investors to take a long-term view. For the state, a body free from the animal spirits that characterise the speculator and thus able to consider social advantages rather than mere profit, he foresaw a greater role as an investor. In Europe, at least, the age of nationalisation beckoned. Not all economists and historians have been convinced by this scapegoating of speculators in the wake of the crash. Milton Friedman, the monetarist economist, 
has claimed that the stock market crash in 1929 was a momentous event, but it did not produce the Great Depression, and it was not a major factor in the Depression's severity. Instead, Friedman and his co-author Anna Schwartz, in their Monetary History of the United States, blamed the Federal Reserve for allowing an overly restrictive monetary policy, which caused the stock of money to decline by a third between August 1929 and March 1933. According to Friedman and Schwartz, the depression deepened after the first banking crisis in the autumn of 1930, when the Bank of the United States was, in their view, unnecessarily allowed to fail. This analysis appears to play down the degree to which the early major banking failures of both the Detroit banks and the Bank of the United States were largely due to their exposure to declining property prices and stock market losses at their securities affiliates. It was these failures which, in turn, triggered the general banking crisis. The experience of the Japanese banks after the bubble economy of the 1980s, considered in Chapter 9, reinforces the impression that the banking crisis of 1932 was the direct result of the preceding era of speculation. Charles Kindleberger, viewing events from a more international perspective, saw the depression as the result of declining commodity prices due to endemic overproduction since the First World War and the failure of the United States to adopt the role as international lender of the last resort to European nations. In place of loans, the Hoover administration introduced tariffs which led swiftly to retaliation followed by competitive currency devaluations across the world. Other economic historians have blamed the Depression on the rigidities caused by the gold exchange standard, which operated during the 1920s and early 1930s. Murray Rothbard, an American economist, has argued that the policies of Herbert Hoover were to blame for the Great Depression, not for being too laissez-faire, as Roosevelt asserted, but because they were insufficiently so. Hoover's essential failure, Rothbard claimed, was to ignore Treasury Secretary Mellon's advice that the crash would be beneficial if it were allowed, in his oft-quoted phrase, to liquidate labour, liquidate stocks, liquidate the farmers, liquidate real estate. In other words, Mellon suggested that the market should be left to fall until it found its own clearing level, when demand would return and the economy revive. Instead, Hoover's policies prevented wages from falling at a time when asset and commodity prices were declining. This served to increase unemployment and reduce the returns on capital, thus preventing reinvestment. Rothbard concluded that the guilt of the Great Depression must be lifted from the shoulders of the free market economy and placed where it properly belongs, at the doors of politicians, bureaucrats and the mass of enlightened economists. As if this were not enough, Herbert Hoover blamed Franklin Roosevelt and the Democrats for deepening the public's fear and distrust throughout the election campaign of 1932, and for failing to cooperate with the outgoing administration's relief measures. Hoover has received recent support from Barry Wigmore in The Crash and Its Aftermath, who claimed that Roosevelt's speeches in 1932 and his refusal to guarantee the gold standard precipitated the public's hoarding of money and brought on the banking crisis of early 1933. Wigmore concludes that Roosevelt, as much as anyone, raised the crash to its symbolic position as the cause of the Depression. The relationship between the crash and the Great Depression is one of the most keenly debated issues in economic history. Because the debate is politically charged, concerning whether markets should ultimately be controlled by governments or left to their own devices, it will never be resolved to the satisfaction of all parties. As Roosevelt showed, political capital could be earned by insinuating a causal link between the crash and the economic crisis. Subsequently, that link was used to justify the policies of the New Deal. A generation later, Professor Friedman's assertion that the stock market collapse did not cause the banking crisis or lead to the Great Depression was taken up fervidly by the Reagan Republicans, who wished to overturn Roosevelt's legacy. We find from the record of contemporaries that the crash and the subsequent decline in asset values had a profound effect on people's expectations. In an essay entitled Echoes from the Jazz Age, 
first published in Scribner's magazine in November 1931, Scott Fitzgerald claimed that the jazz age ended with the crash. The most expensive orgy in history was over because the utter confidence which was its essential prop received an enormous jolt, and it didn't take long for the flimsy structure to settle earthward. It was borrowed time, anyhow, the whole upper tenth of the nation living with the insouciance of grand dukes and the casualness of call girls. As the market crashed, the happy vision of the future dispelled, leaving the American people uncertain and unprepared for the difficult economic conditions of the early 1930s. In Only Yesterday, Frederick Lewis Allen saw the Depression as a profound psychological reaction from the exuberance of 1929. Prosperity is more than an economic condition, it is a state of mind. The big bull market had been more than the climax of a cycle in American mass thinking and mass emotion. There was hardly a man or a woman in the country whose attitude toward life had not been affected by it in some degree, and was not now affected by the sudden and brutal shattering of hope. With the big bull market gone and prosperity going, Americans were soon to find themselves living in an altered world, which called for new adjustments, new ideas, new habits of thought, and a new order of values. During the late 1920s, American economic reality had become dependent on a precarious vision of the future. After the crash, when every tenet of the new era philosophy was shown to be false, Americans lost that confidence in the future which is necessary for the successful operation of the economic system. As George Orwell observed, poverty annihilates the future. When asset values declined, causing havoc in the banking system, a psychology of fear replaced the optimism of the previous decade. Perhaps, as some claimed, the Roaring Twenties were morally degenerate years deserving of a biblical visitation. But they were also a period when people exhibited a capacity for dreaming, a faith in the future, an entrepreneurial appetite for risk, and a belief in individual freedom. These profoundly American traits took a severe knocking in October 1929, and appeared to be extinguished during the Great Depression. They would return. Postscript. The New Paradigm. A 1920s Revival on Wall Street. During the 1990s, the United States experienced a bull market remarkably similar to that of the 1920s. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose from a low of 2,365 in 1990 to reach 10,000 in March 1999, a gain of more than 320%. As in the 1920s, the recent rise in speculation was initially stimulated by low interest rates set by the Federal Reserve during the early 1990s. The rapid expansion of information technology provided the stimulus to economic growth in the 1990s, just as the motor car did in the 1920s. The profitability of American corporations was similarly enhanced by the inability of unions to push through real wage increases. Once again, workers maintained their consumption by purchasing goods on credit, an indulgence which led a million Americans to declare themselves bankrupt in 1997. Although the presidency was held by a Democrat throughout the 1990s bull market, the Republican control of Congress and the shift of the new Democrats to the political center have meant that the policies emanating from the White House resembled more closely those of Calvin Coolidge than those of Franklin Roosevelt. Lax enforcement of antitrust laws has facilitated a series of corporate mergers on a far greater scale than that experienced in the 1920s. During the same period, the separation of investment and commercial banking enshrined in the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933 was under siege. By the middle of the 1990s, the cult of equity, a slight rephrasing of the 1920s cult of common stocks, was clearly in evidence. Approximately 50 million Americans held shares, and the stock market was being discussed everywhere, in bars, golf courses, clubs, gyms, beauty salons, and on television chat shows. Mutual funds were featured on the front cover of Playboy magazine. 
a primary school in Florida launched a new course entitled Material Wealth and the Stock Market. Within six months, the children's model portfolios were up by a third, and they all dreamed of becoming stockbrokers. An investment seminar held in Las Vegas by Louis Rukeyser, the presenter of Wall Street Week on public television, attracted nearly 10,000 people. On his show, Rukeyser hailed investors who maintained the faith. The business channel, CNBC, drew the fastest-growing audience in America. By 1998, there were over 37,000 investment clubs, up from 6,000 at the beginning of the decade, where amateur stock market players gathered to exchange ideas and swap tips. The explosion of investment trusts during the 1920s was exceeded by the rapid growth of mutual funds in the 1990s. Between 1990 and the first quarter of 1998, equity mutual funds attracted over a trillion dollars from American investors. In 1990, there were 1,100 mutual funds in operation. Seven years later, nearly 6,000 mutual funds competed to attract investors' capital. Inflows into mutual funds became the mainstay of the bull market. During 1996, a total of $221.6 billion was invested in U.S. equity funds, with a further $231 billion invested the following year. By the end of 1997, the total assets of U.S. mutual funds had risen to $4.2 trillion, a sum roughly equal to the assets of the banking system. Just as in the 1920s, it was argued that private investment in shares by people saving for retirement would provide a long-term support for the stock market. The revival of faith in the stock market was accompanied by the observation that shares had provided superior investment returns compared to bonds since the 1950s. In April 1966, on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the Wall Street Journal reported that in 98% of all 20-year periods since 1925, shares had outperformed bonds. This was, of course, exactly the same message that E. L. Smith popularised in the 1920s. One fund manager described the stock market as a very nice casino in which everyone can get to go home with a return of 10% after the house take. Such a sentiment appeared to echo the claim of Will Payne, who argued, in the January 1929 issue of World's Work, that the difference between gambling and investment was that while a gambler could only profit at the expense of someone else, with stock market investment everyone was a winner. The belief that the stock market would invariably produce the greatest returns led investors to purchase shares regardless of price. The market's price-earning ratio rose to a historic high of more than 28 times earnings in the spring of 1998. The only financial risk in the 1990s bull market was to leave money idle in a bank account, while the stock market notched up gains of over 20% year after year. The rising market inflated investors' expectations to irrational levels. On the eve of the market correction in October 1997, a broker's poll found mutual fund investors expecting an average 34% annual return over the next 10 years, an expectation which, if realised, would send the Dow Jones to 151,000 and the total US stock market capitalization to 1,500% of national income. The American investor of the 1990s had many qualities in common with his 1920s predecessor. Although the use of leverage was less conspicuous than in the 1920s, margin debt increased from around $30 billion in 1990 to $154 billion in July 1998. A number of ploys were used to skirt the Federal Reserve's restriction on margin loans to 50% of the collateral value of the shares. Speculators slowed down the repayments of their mortgages or took out home equity loans to finance stock purchases. They bought shares on credit cards and availed themselves of the futures markets where no margin regulations were applied, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange obligingly created a mini S&P contract that required a deposit of only $3,000.
Several finance companies used the futures markets to hedge loans they made to private investors. James Grant, editor of Grant's Interest Rate Observer, discovered one company, First Security Capital of San Diego, providing 90% loan-to-value margin loans with a minimum loan of $100,000. Since First Security was neither a bank nor a broker-dealer, its margin loans were not controlled by the Federal Reserve. The 1990s American investor, just like his earlier counterpart, convinced himself that he was buying shares for the long term rather than speculating for quick profits. Buy and hold, observed James Grant, have replaced I love you as the most popular three words in the English language. In both periods, investors saw each market decline as an opportunity to buy into the dip. As a result, every downturn was quickly reversed, supplying the bull market with an aura of invincibility. This tendency reached its apogee on Monday the 27th of October 1997, when the Dow Jones fell by over 7% on fears generated by the collapse of the Asian economies a couple of months earlier. Employing the same language as Herbert Hoover used after the 1929 crash, U.S. Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin reassured investors that the fundamentals of the American economy were sound. On Tuesday, long lines were seen outside New York brokers' offices. However, they were queuing to buy more shares rather than sell. That day, the market rose by more than 5% on a record New York Stock Exchange turnover of 1.2 billion shares. Within six months, the Dow had climbed by over a quarter from its low of the 27th of October, and the S&P 500 index was up over 50% on the last 12 months. The 1990s bull market was accompanied by the reappearance of a new era ideology similar to that of the 1920s. Known as the New Paradigm, or the Goldilocks economy, like the porridge in the fairy tale it was neither too hot nor too cold, the theory suggested that the control of inflation by the Federal Reserve, the decline in the federal deficit, the opening of global markets, the restructuring of corporate America, and the widespread use of information technology to control inventory stock levels had combined to do away with the business cycle. Point for point, this was a reiteration of the new era philosophy of Irving Fisher's day. The new paradigm made its first appearance in the middle of the decade. In late 1995, a Salomon Brothers analyst named David Shulman produced a report entitled 1996 Stock Market Bubble or Paradigm Shift, in which he argued that the decline in inflation had caused the third fundamental shift in stock market valuation in 40 years. Abby Joseph Cohen, chief investment strategist for Goldman Sachs, became the best-known advocate of the new paradigm, the Irving Fisher of her day. Appearing frequently on television shows, on magazine covers and in the newspapers, she was hailed as the guru who had first identified the outlines of the latest new era. Ralph Acampora, chief technician of Prudential Securities, was another prominent spokesman for the new paradigm. It makes all the sense in the world that our stock market should go up, because we have more confidence in our way of life, he told Fortune magazine in August 1997. As the rising stock market served as a palliative to the scandals that dogged Clinton's presidency, the new paradigm was warmly received in Washington. In February 1997, a member of the Clinton administration was quoted in the Herald Tribune as saying that there is no inevitable economic cycle and we have found in a recent study by the Council of Economic Advisers that cycles don't die of old age. A month later, President Clinton himself was moved to observe that the U.S. economy was performing so well that the concept of the business cycle may have been effectively repealed. In June 1997, the New Republic reported, under the headline, Bust Busting, The End of Economic History, that... Top officials at the Treasury Department believe that, with the proper mix of policies and the absence of external shocks, the United States can prolong the current expansion indefinitely. The attitude of Alan Greenspan, the Federal Reserve Chairman, towards the new paradigm has been more difficult to discern. 
Greenspan seems to have hedged his bets. When he observed irrational exuberance among investors in December 1996, the stock market fell 2.5%. On other occasions, he denied that the business cycle had been repealed and questioned whether stocks were not overpriced. Yet when asked to account for the long period of economic growth, Greenspan fell back on new paradigm explanations, claiming that information technology had enhanced the stability of business operations and that America was moving beyond history. Business Week concluded that the Fed chairman had become an avant-garde advocate of the new economy. Unlike his 1920s predecessors, Greenspan saw no need to stem the rise of speculation with either higher interest rates or stern warnings. As the guardian of the bull market, Greenspan's reappointment to office in 1996 was greeted with the same fervour as Treasury Secretary Mellon's in 1929. The most striking similarity between the 1920s and 1990s bull markets is the notion that traditional measures of stock valuation had become obsolete. Once again, it was argued that an investment in the stock market helped retain purchasing power during inflationary periods, and that management was becoming more responsive to shareholders' interests. Abby Joseph Cohen of Goldman Sachs claimed that a longer business cycle and lower inflation justified an upward valuation in stock prices. In their securities analysis, Benjamin Graham and David Dodds wrote that Instead of judging the market price by established standards of value, the new era of the 1920s based its standards of value upon the market price. In similar fashion, consultants in the 1990s invented a concept named market value added, which simply measured the difference between the market value of the firm and the amount of capital tied up in it. The higher the market value added, the greater the firm is deemed to be worth. The net asset value of a company, the value of its factories, machinery and such like, became the most despised of traditional valuation tools. Dividend yields, which slipped to a historic low of less than 1.5%, were also dismissed as irrelevant. At times, even the price-earnings ratio, a measure favourable to speculative values, has looked too conservative. Discounting future cash flows was used to justify any price for fast-growing technology companies. In late October 1996, a headline in the Investor's Business Daily, a stock market daily which published relative strength figures, asked and answered a question that vexed many minds. Overvalued? Not if the stock keeps on rising. The new paradigm, or new economics, of the 1990s provided the intellectual underpinning for the greatest bull market in American history. When stock prices fell sharply in October 1997, Abby Joseph Cohen of Goldman Sachs saved the day by advising her clients to increase their holding of shares. James Grant has suggested that the reappearance of the New Era ideology was a sign that markets make opinions, not the other way round. In other words, the new paradigm ideology is simply a product of the bull market. As long as investors maintain their faith in a new era and ignore dissonant information, then stocks will continue to rise. In the short run, a rising market serves to cover up weaknesses in the economy. Consumers spend their stock market gains and ignore their rising debts. Companies issue new shares or bonds to purchase other companies or finance capital expenditure and governments enjoy rising tax receipts as the economy prospers. In this way, the new era analysis becomes something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It has been estimated that between early 1990 and the spring of 1998, the rising US stock market boosted household wealth by around $6 trillion. Capital gains realised from the sale of shares reached $184 billion in 1997. Profits on investment have supported the growth of consumer expenditure, which has risen faster than wages and enabled the savings rate to decline until it turned negative in 1998. Rising receipts from capital gains tax, $44 billion in 1997, also helped to produce a federal budget surplus in 1998. 
Escalating share prices encouraged the establishment of new businesses and boosted capital expenditure. The stock market was hailed as the greatest wealth creator America has ever seen. According to one analyst, it had become a perpetual motion machine, an unconscious echo of the legendary bubble company of 1720, in which every share price rise generated further rises. Yet in the past, a point has always been reached where both speculation and credit arrive at the limits of their expansion. At that moment, the business cycle reappears with a vengeance, the perpetual motion machine begins rotating in another direction, and the new era is consigned to history. Chapter 8 Cowboy Capitalism From Bretton Woods to Michael Milken There is no way you can buck the market. Margaret Thatcher, 1988 the foundation of the post-war economic system was laid in the summer of 1944, when delegates of the Allied powers, the British party led by Keynes himself, met at the Mount Washington Hotel in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. Instead of reviving the old gold standard, they agreed that foreign currencies should be fixed in relation to the dollar, with the dollar convertible into gold at $35 an ounce. As the new system depended for its success on the control of capital movements between countries, it was marked by a deep antipathy towards the currency speculator. Echoing Roosevelt, the American Treasury Secretary, Henry Morgenthau, hoped that Bretton Woods would drive the usurious moneylenders from the temple of international finance. For the next thirty years, the speculator remained a figure of public obloquy, almost indistinguishable from the wartime black marketeer. In early 1946, after the market in grain futures was curtailed owing to shortages, President Truman declared that grain prices should not be subject to the greed of speculators who gamble on what may lie ahead of our commodity markets. Truman denounced grain speculators as merchants of human misery. Such sentiments were even shared by the young Mrs. Thatcher, who announced to the House of Commons during the 1961 budget debate, it is the speculators in shares that we want to get at, the person who is making a business of buying and selling shares, not to hold them for their income-producing properties, but to live on the profit he makes from transactions. When governments found their formal currency arrangements disintegrating, the speculator became a convenient scapegoat for the failure of policy. Before the war, Hitler had blamed the inflation and deflation of the Weimar Republic on foreign currency speculators, while both Lenin and Stalin cursed speculators for the Soviet Union's economic woes. Now the leaders of the so-called free world joined in similar denunciations. During the Suez Crisis of 1956, the future Prime Minister Harold Wilson lashed out at speculating Swiss bankers, the little gnomes in Zurich, in his celebrated phrase. The Gnomes had their revenge in 1967, forcing Wilson's Labour government to devalue sterling. Four years later, when Nixon finally suspended the convertibility of the dollar into gold, thus bringing an end to the Bretton Woods system, he also condemned speculators. They thrive on crises. They help to create them. Even in the period of largely floating exchange rates since 1971, Intemperate attacks on currency speculators by politicians have continued. When Britain was once again forced to devalue its currency and leave the exchange rate mechanism in September 1992, Lord Jenkins, a former Chancellor of the Exchequer, denounced the predatory packs of salivating speculators, to which the French finance minister Michel Sapin added that during the revolution such people were known as agiotards and they were beheaded. During the Asian crisis of 1997, the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, described speculators as ferocious animals whose trade was unnecessary, unproductive and totally immoral. In a more sinister fashion, he struck out personally at George Soros, the hedge fund manager, claiming that behind the speculators lay a Jewish agenda to return the developing nations to colonial status. The Malaysian government threatened to treat currency speculation as a capital offence, 
banned short sales on the Kuala Lumpur Stock Exchange and later introduced currency controls. In part, the immediate post-war attacks on speculators and their trade reflected a profound change in the attitude to money-making and the pursuit of profit. In an essay entitled Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, first published in 1930, Keynes imagined a world in which increasing prosperity and material security would finally do away with the profit motive. During the period of strong and stable growth enjoyed by Western economies in the 1950s, it appeared that this vision might be realised. In The Quest for Wealth, The History of Man's Acquisitiveness, published in 1956, Robert Heilbronner asserted that money-making in the current age was no longer esteemed. Opulence, the adulation of money-makers, and the wish for great wealth have given way, in part at least, to a new set of values, the camouflage of wealth, the contempt of mere money-makers, and even a certain disdain or disinterest in the goal of wealth itself. Heilbronner ascribed the anti-mammonism of the period to the experience of the Great Depression, which represented not merely an economic failure, but the bankruptcy of the philosophic foundation of an age. In the post-war world, the businessman was no longer flattered and admired as he had been in the 1920s. Instead, he became the dull, reliable, colourless figure satirised by Sloane Wilson as the man in the grey flannel suit, this change of style was accompanied by a shift in corporate priorities. Other goals, such as stability, continuity and responsibility towards employees and the community, predominated over the simple profit motive. According to Heilbronner, the individual quest for wealth had been replaced by a corporate ideal in which individuals took only a small share of their corporation's earnings, enjoying instead the prestige and security of employment with an established company. In the 1950s, these changes appeared so self-evident and enduring that Heilbronner concluded his study by pondering whether the further accumulation of wealth in the near future might bring a new economic motivation to displace Adam Smith's invisible hand. The Financial Revolution when President Nixon suspended the convertibility of the dollar into gold on the 15th of August 1971, he brought to an end the Bretton Woods system of the previous quarter of a century and ushered in a new era in the history of speculation. Although the first financial revolution of the late 17th century had seen the expansion of paper debt circulating as money, all values remained ultimately tethered to gold. Gold represented the antithesis of speculative values. Whenever speculation got out of hand and a financial crisis appeared, everyone sought refuge in the precious metal. Only John Law, the land bank projector and progenitor of the Mississippi bubble, realised that the value of all money, including gold, rested ultimately on a consensus. After Law introduced a paper currency into France in 1720, Lord Stair, the English ambassador to Paris, commenting on Law's recent conversion to Catholicism, undertaken so that he could assume the official post of Controller General of Finances, wrote, There can be no doubt of Law's Catholicity, since he has proved transubstantiation by changing paper into money. For Stair and his contemporaries, Law's paper money was an act of faith, as bold as the belief in the miracle of the Eucharist. Finally, in 1971, a year that coincidentally marked the 300th anniversary of John Law's birth, his vision was at last realised. The transition from credo to credit was complete. At the end of the Bretton Woods system, money became only a figment of the imagination, weightless and ethereal. In this new world, where all monetary values were in flux, speculation, the self-adjustment of society to the probable, in Oliver Wendell Holmes' phrase, was destined to play a greater role. In the past, the suspension of gold convertibility had been associated with uncontrolled eruptions of speculation, for instance in France in 1720 and in the United States in the 1860s. During the turmoil surrounding the collapse of Bretton Woods, this was overlooked, 
Henceforth, all currency values would be a reflection of their perceived future values. The present would be as much determined by the future as the future by the present. And the grand arbiter of this confusing new system was the speculator. One person quick to grasp the significance of these events was Walter Riston, the head of Citicorp, who declared that the information standard has replaced the gold standard as the basis of world finance. A new financial revolution necessary to accommodate this momentous change was facilitated by advances in information technology. From 1969, details of banks' bond trading was provided by the Telerate machine, which became the electronic marketplace for U.S. Treasury bonds. Four years later, the British news agency Reuters introduced its Monitor Money Rates service, which created an electronic 24-hour global marketplace for foreign currencies. Over the next few years, the computerization of financial markets continued apace. Most commentators viewed advances in information technology as a boon. If markets were inherently efficient, they would become even more so when supplied with better information. They might even become rather dull, like a reliable motor car. In fact, there is little historical evidence to suggest that improvements in communications create docile financial markets or better informed investment behaviour. If anything, the opposite appears to be the case. In the past, the wider availability of financial information and improvements in communications have tended to attract impulsive new players to the speculative game. The first generation of daily newspapers stimulated the South Sea bubble. The new money market columns of the British newspapers contributed to the mining mania of 1825. Railways facilitated railway speculations in the 1840s, just as the ticker tape assisted stock market gambling in the Gilded Age, and radio programmes in the 1920s excited a later generation of speculators. More recently, the Internet has brought the stock market into the home, where it has thrived. Mobile phones, handheld trading devices, and online brokerage accounts have enabled investors to trade from anywhere in the world. This had led to the appearance of hordes of day traders, amateur speculators who operate mostly from their homes, using their computers to access the cheap share-dealing services provided by online brokerages. They are called day traders because they close their positions at the end of each trading day. By the summer of 1998, five million Americans had accounts with internet discount brokerages, and around a million of them were day traders. Average turnover on these online accounts was 12 times heavier than at conventional brokerages. Some traders reportedly carried out a thousand trades a day. Because the Internet allows people to conceal their identity, the information revolution has generated an extraordinary amount of fraud, mostly of a low-level nature. Scattered across the World Wide Web are literally hundreds of thousands of get-rich-quick investment scams. Behind a veil of anonymity, crooked promoters pump and dump stocks through online investment forums. Perhaps more worrying than the appearance of fraud is the unsettling effect the Internet has had on investors' behaviour. Described by its early advocates as an affinity group, the Internet has become a forum for herd-like speculation. Private traders spur each other on with messages posted on Internet bulletin boards. In some cases, online investors have developed unhealthy obsessions with individual stocks. Momentum investment the mindless practice of buying and selling stocks as they rise and fall with the market, is said to be a sign of investors' reaction to information overload. Wall Street has joined with Silicon Valley to produce an investment argo for a virtual world. A world of momos, momentum stocks, P&D, pump and dump, head fakes, large traders creating the illusion of a stock movement, gapping up, stock rises sharply, Scared money, desperate traders closing their positions at the end of the day, grinding, taking small profits from many trades, jiggles, volatile stocks, and noise, disagreement among traders. The cyber marketplace of the late 20th century, with its bashers, bears, and hipsters, bulls, closely resembles the coffeehouses of Exchange Alley three centuries earlier, 
with their bubblers, sharpers, and cullies. The people and their practices remain the same, only the language and technology are new. The lack of a positive relationship between improved information and financial sagacity was most evident in Japan during the bubble economy of the 1980s, when a nation of information junkies, awash with financial data, nevertheless made some of the worst investment decisions in history. Nor is it clear that advances in communications have produced any improvement in the performance of professional investors. Speedier communications have created conditions for greater feedback and more trend following in the financial markets, which offset any improvement in the operational efficiency of the markets. Self-fulfilling currency crises, provoked by panicking traders, have become the norm of the 1990s. The speedier the communication, the faster the contagion spreads. The Revival of the Liberal Economic Ideology Bretton Woods, Keynes's last significant achievement before his death in 1946, had failed for practical reasons. By the early 1970s, however, Keynesianism, as a body of economic thought, was also under sustained attack. For two decades, Milton Friedman, an economics professor at the University of Chicago, had been battling against Keynesian orthodoxy. Resurrecting the economic liberalism of the 19th century under the new guise of monetarism, he argued that the market was fundamentally a self-correcting mechanism, and that government attempts to interfere with its operation, whether by introducing price controls to curb inflation or by compelling management to influence the level of unemployment, were doomed to failure. In Free to Choose, a popular introduction to the free market ideology that Friedman wrote with his wife, Rose, he contended that all government intervention, however well-intentioned, had harmful side effects. For Friedman, markets were the best way to distribute information and provide incentives, regardless of the inequities that might emerge. In a 1973 interview with Playboy magazine, Friedman boldly asserted that all societies were structured on greed. The problem of social organisation, he claimed, is how to set up an arrangement under which greed will do the least harm. Capitalism is that kind of system. Friedman not only defended the speculator against the charge of causing the Great Depression, he was also highly sympathetic to the speculator's economic role. This much maligned figure sought out future economic developments and fed them through to the current prices, thereby preventing shortages and contributing to the efficient distribution of scarce resources. Like the insurer, the speculator was prepared to assume some of the inevitable risks of the capitalist process. If he was motivated by a desire for personal profit, so much the better. In an essay entitled In Defense of Destabilizing Speculation, published in 1960, Friedman claimed that speculation was castigated by economists because of a natural bias of the academic student against gambling. He suggested that speculation was unlikely to have harmful economic side effects, since so-called destabilizing speculators, who sold when prices were low and bought when they were high, would inevitably lose money, while the counterparties would gain at the speculator's expense. A process of social Darwinism would eventually eradicate the destabilizing speculator. For Friedman, speculation in the futures market was a zero-sum activity, which at worst supplied gaming activities to those who required the service. Friedman was the most prominent of a group of American academics whose work contributed to the revival of economic liberalism. The work of other economists, interested specifically in the operation of financial markets, joined together to form a new body of economic thought known as the Efficient Market Hypothesis, EMH. Exponents of the efficient market maintained that investors are rational agents seeking to optimise their wealth, and that stock prices move randomly, since at any moment they contain all information relevant to their price, that is to say, they are only moved by new information, which by its nature is random. While Friedman revived discarded nostrums, such as the quantity theory of money, the efficient marketers resurrected ideas concerning equilibrium in the financial markets, 
that harked back to Adam Smith's assimilation of Newton's theory of equilibrium, the invisible hand being the analogue of the divine watchmaker, and to Leibniz's notion of the imminence of rationality in the world. During the 1970s, the efficient market hypothesis spread throughout American universities and business schools, while businesses and banks began applying financial techniques founded upon its assumptions. By the end of the decade, it had become the working ideology of financial capitalism, wholly writ in the words of Warren Buffett. The efficient market school of economists, many of whose members received Nobel Prizes, were highly sympathetic to speculators. If markets were efficient and in constant equilibrium, and if price movements were always random, then the activities of speculators could be neither irrational in motivation nor destabilizing in effect. Such a conclusion required the historiography of speculation to be rewritten, leading to a denial of the existence of irrational bubbles, and replacing them, as we have seen, with the tendentious notion of the rational bubble. While Friedman dismissed the idea that speculative excess caused the economic collapse of the 1930s, several economists of a historical bent attempted to show that the great speculative manias, such as the tulip mania and the South Sea bubble, were mere legends. In so far as share prices rose during these periods, they argued, it was for very good reasons. Not everyone was convinced. As Warren Buffett pointed out, Observing correctly that the market was frequently efficient, they, the efficient marketers, went on to conclude incorrectly that it was always efficient. The difference between the two propositions is night and day. Paradoxically, the widespread acceptance of the efficient market hypothesis may have served to make the markets less efficient. In the Panglossian world of efficient markets, investors were told that, theoretically, it was not possible to pay too much for financial assets. As a result, they were encouraged to bid up prices to unsustainable levels. The Derivatives Revolution Out of this new age of paper money, economic liberalism and information technology came forth a flowering of financial creativity as profound and far-reaching as the earlier financial revolution at the turn of the 18th century. Nowhere was this activity more in evidence than in the field of financial derivatives. As we have seen, a derivative is simply a security created by contract which derives its value from an underlying asset, such as a share or bond. In the form of futures and options on shares and commodities, derivatives are as old as capitalism itself. Because derivatives, such as share options, require smaller down payments, normally around 5% for a three-month option, than the purchase of a real share, they were traditionally believed to encourage speculation. This prejudice was reflected in numerous government attempts to outlaw the derivatives trade, such as the Dutch ban on futures in 1609 and Sir John Barnard's Act passed by the British Parliament in 1734. In the new era of economic liberalism, however, the old stigma was removed, and derivatives emerged at the forefront of financial innovation. In 1967, Milton Friedman attempted to bet against sterling prior to Britain's forced devaluation, but was turned down by the Chicago banks on the grounds that his action would encourage speculation. Afterwards, Friedman related his frustrating experience in print, his article attracted the attention of Leo Melamed, president of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, known familiarly as the Merck, the smaller of the city's two agricultural futures markets. Given Friedman's consistent advocacy of laissez-faire, his defense of speculation, and his distrust of government regulation, it was not surprising that Melamed, a fanatical believer in free markets, should seek him out to assist with plans to create the most radical futures contract in history. After the collapse of Bretton Woods, Melamed approached Friedman and asked him to write a paper justifying the creation of a market for currency futures. The professor obliged, demanding a payment of $5,000 for his services. He is reported as saying, I'm a capitalist, remember that. 
Friedman had long argued against capital controls in favour of floating exchange rates and the free movement of capital. In his paper for Melamed, entitled The Need for Futures Markets in Foreign Currencies, he claimed that currency futures would have a stabilising effect on exchange rates and encourage the development of other financial activities in this country. Melamed's money was well spent. Permission was granted by the US Treasury and Federal Reserve to establish the new international money market at the Merck, which opened in May 1972. The financial revolution had begun. Less than a year later, the Chicago Board of Trade opened a new exchange for trading share options. Other derivatives markets opened during this period included gold futures in 1975, Government National Mortgage Association, Ginny May Futures in 1975, Treasury Bond Futures in 1976, Crude Oil Futures in 1978, and Currency Options in 1982. In the past, a legal distinction had been made to distinguish the derivatives trade from mere gambling. It rested on the stipulation that the buyer and seller of a future must be able to contemplate actual delivery of the commodity at the end of the contract period. Gambling transactions, on the other hand, could only be settled with money. Yet in 1976, the Merck introduced a euro-dollar interest rate futures contract. Professor Friedman rang the bell on the opening day. This was a significant innovation, since it was impossible to deliver an interest rate. This undeliverable derivative, however, was legitimated retrospectively five years later, when a sympathetic head of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the federal regulatory body created in 1974 to oversee the derivatives markets, declared that contemplation of delivery was no longer necessary for futures transactions, and cash settlement was an acceptable alternative. This decision paved the way for the introduction of a plethora of index futures contracts at a number of exchanges. The first and most popular of the index futures, Standard & Poor's 500 Index Future, a more broadly based measure of the US stock market than the Dow Jones Industrial Average, opened for trading at the Merck on the 21st of April 1982. Within a year, the nominal value of S&P futures traded in Chicago exceeded the turnover on the New York Stock Exchange. Around the same time, the Chicago Board of Trade introduced options on futures, a derivative of derivatives. This financial revolution was given further impetus in the early 1980s when Sidney Homer, a brilliant bond specialist employed by Salomon Brothers, the investment bank, devised the idea of separating, stripping in technical language, bonds from their dividends, and selling the two securities separately. This breakthrough enabled banks to turn a variety of previously illiquid assets into tradable securities, a process known as securitization. Homer's insight was applied to the enormous US federally guaranteed mortgage market and led to the creation of synthetic mortgage bonds, in which interest and principal payments were stripped and sold as separate bonds. The PO, principal only bonds, were divided into several tranches with different repayment priorities. The final tranche, called Z bonds because they were the last to repay the principal, were highly volatile and known as toxic waste by the traders who handled them. They have been described as among the most speculative instruments ever offered to American investors. Salomon Brothers invented many other new financial products in this period, including cars, collateralized automobile receivables, spins, low-coupon debt securities which paid back on the rise and fall of the S&P index, and the gloriously named Heaven and Hell Warrant, a security whose payments varied under different circumstances. In 1981, Salomon Brothers also arranged the first debt swap between the World Bank and IBM, which was followed by the rapid growth of the international swaps market. Financial innovation continued into the 1980s with a multitude of new financial instruments. Negotiable floating rate notes, income warrants, puttable bonds, butterfly swaps, currency swaps, floor ceiling swaps, interest rate swaps, swaptions, Synthetic equity, synthetic cash, 
and zero coupon bonds. The offshore euro bond market in London was a fount of creativity with its foreign bonds, shoguns, sushis, down unders, kiwis, and so on, zero coupon convertibles, dual currency yen bonds, and countless warrants bonds. By the end of 1996, the size of outstanding derivatives contracts was estimated at around $50 trillion, although since most of the derivatives trade was conducted away from the exchanges in the over-the-counter market, no one was sure of the figure. The derivatives world lost none of its creativity in the 1990s. Rocket scientists, or quants, at investment banks were kept busy devising increasingly exotic financial instruments, such as discrete payoff bull notes, principal exchange rate linked security, and prime LIBOR inverse floating rate notes. The new derivatives are explained in an arcane language of forward yield curves, option adjusted spreads, duration, and negative convexity. Few people apart from their creators understand either the language or how the financial instruments functioned. Opinions differ as to whether the proliferation of new financial instruments stimulated speculation. Professor Merton Miller, the Nobel laureate who took a seat on the board of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, maintains that derivatives are essentially industrial raw materials, created to cope with uncertainty and financial volatility after the end of Bretton Woods and the 1974 oil crisis. One man's insurance, however, might be another man's speculation. If a derivative position is hedged, that is, when its risk is offset either by ownership of the underlying security, such as a share, or by a normal business risk, such as a foreign currency exposure, then it is insurance against potential loss. However, if the position is unhedged, then it is highly speculative. Anecdotal evidence suggested that players were not slow to exploit the opportunities for super-leveraged speculation offered by the new derivatives markets. This conclusion appears to be borne out by recent experience. Of the series of great derivatives disasters in the middle of the 1990s, only one, that of Metallgesellschaft, loss $1.5 billion, has been caused by the mishandling of bona fide hedging transactions. The others, Bearings, loss £850 million, Orange County, loss $1.7 billion, and Sumitomo, loss $2.6 billion, have been the result of unhedged and unauthorised speculation. Nick Leeson, a 27-year-old plasterer's son, displayed the speculator's traditional disdain for hierarchy by bringing down the Queen's Bank, Baring Brothers, in February 1995. He did so by selling options and futures in the Singapore futures market, which created a total exposure of $18 billion, many times Baring's capital base. The escalating losses that caused the bank's failure came with a suddenness that only derivatives can produce. Several other high-profile cases of derivatives losses at American corporations appear to have been caused by a combination of aggressive pushing of derivatives by investment banks and speculative risk-taking by corporate treasurers. When Procter & Gamble sued Bankers Trust to recover derivatives losses of $102 million incurred in 1994, it produced a recorded transcript of a Bankers Trust derivatives salesman stating that he aimed to lure people into the calm and then just totally fuck them. Professor Miller dismisses these derivatives scandals as inconsequential management failures. The Reagan Revolution the full potential of the financial revolution was realised only when the political conditions were right. It took the better part of the 1970s for the revived free market ideology to feed through from American universities to the political world. Milton Friedman, very much a political economist, played a key role in the process. In the 1960s he advised Republican presidential candidates, including Richard Nixon, Later, he briefed Ronald Reagan, who as president showed off his economic proficiency by using his hands to draw charts of the money supply in the air. During the 1970s, Friedman visited Britain frequently, 
where his ideas were taken up by Mrs. Thatcher, then leader of the Conservative opposition. By the end of the decade, he was the best-known economist in the world. He had received the Nobel Prize in 1976, his face had graced the cover of Time, and he had presented a ten-hour television documentary on his views. On both sides of the Atlantic, Margaret Thatcher, elected in April 1979, and Ronald Reagan, elected in November 1980, were poised to put Freeman's economic philosophy in practice. A powerful alliance had emerged between economic liberals and Reagan Republicans. Both agreed that government intervention in economic affairs was undesirable and that the judgment of the market was paramount. Throughout Reagan's administration there was a profound dogmatic distrust of regulation, which was seen as merely another malevolent aspect of big government. One of the first acts of Reagan's Justice Department was to drop the ten-year antitrust action against IBM. The regulatory structure of the 1930s, which had been designed to act as a counterweight to speculative excesses, was now allowed to decline. The Glass-Steagall separation of investment and commercial banking was not rigorously enforced, the Securities and Exchange Commission's budget was reduced, and regulators everywhere were expected to be infused with the spirit of the free market and deregulation. Influenced by free market economists such as Friedman and Arthur Laffer, Reagan rejected the Keynesian antipathy towards profit and actively encouraged the pursuit of self-interest. What I want to see above all, he announced, is that this remains a country where someone can always get rich. As in the 1920s, income and corporation taxes were reduced, and the role of the entrepreneur was exalted. In the summer of 1981, Reagan broke the air traffic controllers' strike, ushering in an era of weak unions, declining real wages, and growing inequalities of wealth. While Reagan expressed the desire to create a nation where someone could become rich, what his laissez-faire policies actually created was one in which the financial operator could become wealthy beyond his wildest dreams. The rest of the population was promised an elusive trickle-down of wealth, as the rich spent the money they saved on taxes, and new fortunes were expended on the consumption of luxuries. The Rise of the Trader the 1970s were a decade of chronic financial instability. Floating currencies, rising inflation, stop-go economic policies and declining growth rates produced unwelcome volatility that made the stock market a dangerous place for investors. The Nifty Fifty boom of 1972, during which no price was deemed too high to pay for America's leading companies, was followed by a steep market decline. During a period of low growth and high inflation, stagflation, stocks did not arouse the speculative interest of the public. Although the Dow Jones Industrial Average had breached 1,000 in February 1966, by the spring of 1980 it was below 800. Faced with uncertainty, most private investors preferred to play it safe and enjoy the high interest rates paid on money market funds. Those with a greater appetite for risk were able to speculate in commodities and precious metals, which offered the best hedge against the chronic inflation of the period. One person who availed herself of this opportunity was the wife of the governor of Arkansas, Hillary Rodham Clinton. In late 1978, the future first lady embarked on a brief career as a speculator. Trading in cattle futures, soya beans and live hogs Mrs. Clinton turned an initial $1,000 stake into $100,000 ten months later, at which point she retired from the game. The derivatives contracts into which she entered during this period were extremely risky, carrying an underlying value of over $3 million, which was roughly 30 times the net wealth of the Clinton household. The most remarkable aspect of this speculative foray, however, is that Mrs. Clinton achieved phenomenal success despite the fact that most of her trades were on the short side at a time when cattle prices doubled. Mrs. Clinton was not the only person looking to make a quick buck in the volatile commodities markets. In January 1979, after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, 
the price of gold rose to $875 an ounce. Six months later, Nelson Bunker Hunt and William Herbert Hunt, the sons of the Texas oil billionaire H. L. Hunt, together with several wealthy Arabs, formed a silver pool. In a short period, they amassed more than 200 million ounces of silver, equivalent to half the world's deliverable supply. The price of silver rose nearly tenfold, peaking at over $50. Once the silver market was cornered, outsiders joined the chase. But a combination of changed trading rules on the New York Metals Market, COMEX, and the intervention of the Federal Reserve lanced the bubble. The price of silver fell back to $10 in March 1980, bringing losses of over a billion dollars and eventual bankruptcy to the Hunt brothers. During the silver bubble, an official at the Peruvian Ministry of Commerce, who was employed to hedge his country's silver production, lost $80 million by illicitly selling silver short. Although a relatively small sum for a sovereign nation, it was an omen. The rogue trader had appeared on the modern financial scene. A number of institutional factors contributed to the rise of the professional market trader. During the 1970s, several leading U.S. investment banks, including Morgan Stanley, went public. Rather than cautious partners with unlimited liability and limited capital, these banks now had greater capital resources and answered to anonymous shareholders. Institutionalized speculation, known as proprietary trading, became an appealing route to quick profits and large bonuses. Proprietary trading became even more attractive after May Day 1975, when fixed commissions were abolished on the New York Stock Exchange. The rapid growth of securitization, the process of turning illiquid assets into tradable securities, further enhanced the role of the trader salesman. By the early 1980s, traders were running Wall Street. John Goodfriend, the cigar-chomping son of a wholesale butcher, had risen from being a lowly municipal bond trader to become head of Salomon Brothers. Robert Rubin, the head of risk arbitrage at Goldman Sachs, became the firm's senior partner and later treasury secretary under President Clinton, following in the steps of Salomon's legendary trader William E. Simon, Nixon's treasury secretary. Another trader, the foul-mouthed Lou Glucksman, was appointed chief executive of Lehman Brothers, the prestigious White Shoe Investment Bank. His brief and disastrous tenure at Lehman ended with the firm being taken over by American Express. The two most influential financiers of the 1980s, Louis Ranieri of Salomon Brothers, who built the collateralized mortgage business into a $1 trillion market, and Michael Milken, Drexel Burnham Lombert's junk bond guru, were both traders by training and inclination. The trader also flourished outside the world of investment banking. Advances in communications encouraged the growth of hedge funds, private investment partnerships which evaded the SEC's regulation. The most successful of these, the Quantum Fund, founded in 1973 by the Hungarian-born financier George Soros, produced average annual returns in excess of 25% from its leveraged positions in a variety of stock, bond and currency markets. Alongside the hedge funds, risk arbitrage investment partnerships appeared in the 1970s. Highly leveraged like the hedge funds, they looked to profit from the sharp price movements associated with corporate takeovers. One of the most high-profile of the risk arbitrageurs was Ivan F. Bosky, the son of a Detroit bar owner, who set up his own partnership in 1975. Egotistical, short-tempered and flashy, the trader became a symbol of the 1980s. The master of the universe in Tom Wolfe's The Bonfire of the Vanities and the big swinging dick of Michael Lewis's Liar's Poker. The title of the book alluded to an alleged $1 million game of Liar's Poker between Goodfriend and John Merriweather, Salomon Brothers' chief trader. The trader was an international phenomenon, a product of deregulation and globalization. In London, young traders employed by rapidly expanding American investment banks at the time of the Big Bang, the deregulation of the London Stock Exchange in 1986, earned six-figure bonuses. They were caricatured in the press as Porsche-driving barrow boys, 
and satirised in Carol Churchill's play Serious Money. In pursuit of ever larger bonuses, traders introduced a frenzied, brutal quality into the world of finance. Aggressive became a synonym for ambitious in the curriculum vitae of the young banker, and The Art of War, a martial classic by Sun Tzu, the Chinese Clausewitz, became fashionable reading in financial circles. The trader's language was couched in violent metaphors. At Salomon Brothers, salesmen boasted of ripping the faces off their clients. Capital no longer moved at a sedate pace. It whirled with the mesmerising speed of a roulette wheel, and the trader had to keep up with it. In such an atmosphere there was no time to pause. Lunch is for wimps, declared Gordon Gecko, the anti-hero of Oliver Stone's film Wall Street. Possibly no man worked longer hours than Michael Milken, head of Drexel Burnham Lombert's Beverly Hills Bond Department. Sleeping only three or four hours a night, Milken arrived at work before four o'clock in the morning in order to catch the opening of the market in New York, and handled up to a thousand transactions a day. While Milken ascetically avoided all stimulants except money, Ivan Bosky bolstered himself with endless cups of coffee to sustain his gruelling twenty-one-hour day. Hard work, a product of the trader culture, came to replace play as the motif of the super-rich. Gone was the extravagant idleness of the privileged, described in Torstein Veblen's The Theory of the Leisure Class. The new symbols of wealth in the 1980s private jets for the wealthy, mobile phones for the less affluent, exemplified not repose but ceaseless striving. In the era of global twenty-four-hour trading, money didn't sleep, nor did those who pursued it. The Rise of Michael Milken By the early 1980s, the popular lessons of the Great Depression had worn thin, under the influence of Reagan, business was once again venerated. Debt was perceived as tax-efficient rather than imprudent. In the capital markets, deregulation was replacing supervision. The individualistic pursuit of wealth had displaced the communal goals of full employment and equality of distribution. Yet for the first eighteen months of Reagan's presidency, the bond and stock markets remained depressed as interest rates were raised to record levels in order to squeeze inflation out of the system. Commercial interest rates peaked at over 20%, and the yield on long-term bonds climbed to over 15%. Finally, in the summer of 1982, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker, reduced the discount rate. The battle against inflation was now over. Half a century after the stock market nadir of 1932, the market began to rise. While Mrs. Thatcher pioneered the privatisation of state-owned public corporations by floating them on the stock market, President Reagan witnessed privatisations in his country of a rather different nature. They involved taking public companies, those quoted in the stock market, and putting them back into private hands. The purpose of the leveraged buyout, or LBO, was to acquire a company with the maximum amount of debt. The interest and principal on the LBO debt was to be paid off as quickly as possible with the cash flow generated by the company. Once the leverage had reached a conventional level, the company was normally put up for sale or refloated on the stock market. The potential of this type of transaction was first set before the public in the summer of 1983, with the flotation of Gibson greetings cards. Eighteen months earlier, former Treasury Secretary William Simon, together with a partner, had purchased Gibson for $1 million in equity and $79 million of debt. Yet when the company was offered in the stock market, its market capitalization was $290 million, and Simon's modest personal investment of $330,000 had turned into a fortune of over $66 million. The beauty of the deal lay in its timing. Simon had purchased the company when the stock market was in the doldrums, and sold it when interest rates were declining and the market had revived. Falling interest rates and rising asset prices were not the only factors working in favour of LBOs. The fiscal system was conducive to leverage, since corporate interest payments were tax-deductible, whereas dividend payments were not. This tendency was reinforced in 1981, 
when the Reagan administration persuaded Congress to pass the Economic Recovery Tax, allowing companies to accelerate depreciation charges, thereby reducing their tax bills and enabling them to take on more debt. Although the Federal Reserve prevented speculators from buying shares on a margin of more than 50%, there were no restrictions on the amount of leverage applied in a buyout. The participant in a leveraged buyout had several other advantages over the margin speculator. His interest payments were tax-deductible, he was not subject to margin calls, that is, asked to provide more collateral when asset values fluctuated, nor was he personally responsible for the LBO debt, which was packaged as bonds and sold on to other investors. If the company went bankrupt, he could walk away with little loss, but if the deal was a success, his gains were outlandish. Although he was the son of an accountant, Michael Milken of Drexel Burnham Lambert preached a message heretical to accountants' ears. He advocated turning the balance sheets of companies upside down, replacing shareholders' capital with debt. Milken was employed by Drexel in 1970 as a trader in high-yield or junk bonds, loan securities which paid a higher rate of interest because their issuer's credit rating was low. He challenged the conventional wisdom that high-yield bonds were speculative in the sense of being more risky. This message was derived from an analysis which showed that the bonds of lowly rated companies, or fallen angels, as Milken called them, offered good investment opportunities, since high yields more than compensated for their historical rate of default. Investing in a portfolio of speculative bonds, he claimed, would produce better returns over the long run than a portfolio of AAA rated debt issued by the likes of General Motors. Having successfully sold this idea since the early 1970s, Milken looked for new applications for his junk bonds. His first idea was to use them as venture capital for fast-growing businesses, such as Ted Turner's Cable News Network and McCaw Cellular, a mobile phone operator, along with a number of Las Vegas casino businesses. As Milken came to dominate both the primary, that is, issuing, and secondary trading markets for high-yield bonds, a visionary side to his junk bond philosophy revealed itself. He claimed that he was able to distinguish between popular perception and reality. Bond rating agencies such as Moody's, he complained, looked to the past rather than the future. People and industries of the future are considered risky. Junk bond users are the industries of the future. At other times, his vision was less exalted. Defending his bonds, he declared, Everything we like is junk. Junk food, junk clothes, junk records. Everything that stands the test of time is junk. Milken's instinctive salesmanship was as brilliant as his financial mind, which retained an encyclopedic knowledge of companies' financial histories and market information. Had he confined his activities to the existing market in low-grade corporate bonds, supplemented with the issue of bonds for high-risk ventures, it is unlikely that his name would ever have attracted attention outside his professional field. Out of the mergers and acquisitions department of Drexel Burnham Lombard, however, came the idea of using high-yield bonds to finance leveraged takeovers of American public companies. In August 1984, Milken and Drexel made their first move into the field of hostile takeovers, backing T. Boone Pickens, the Texas oil tycoon and head of Mesa Petroleum, in his attempt to gain control of the giant Gulf Oil. Without actually having the funds necessary for the takeover, Drexel produced a letter stating it was highly confident of raising the capital through the sale of junk bonds. Although this bid failed, the highly confident letter symbolized Drexel's ability to finance deals of limitless size. The bank's first successful hostile bid came in April 1985, when a Milken-backed raider, Nelson Peltz, acquired National Can in a $465 million deal involving leverage of 11 parts debt to one part equity. A few months later, Drexel client Ron Perelman captured Revlon, the cosmetics firm, in the largest hostile LBO to date. More successes soon followed. In April 1986, Kohlberg Kravis Roberts, an investment partnership specializing in LBOs, raised over $6 billion through Drexel to take control of Beatrice, 
a conglomerate whose interests ranged from Samsonite suitcases to Avis car rental. Milken and his corporate raiders relished their position as outsiders to the corporate world. At the 1985 Drexel High Yield Conference, otherwise known as the Predators' Ball, the bank's chief executive, Fred Joseph, declared triumphantly that, for the first time in history, we've levelled the playing field. The small can go after the big. In the manner of Jay Gould, the raiders applied a rhetoric of public service to their activities. They claimed that incumbent management, or corpocracy as they styled it, was inefficient and only concerned with its own security and the perquisites of office. Nelson Peltz went so far as to argue that American management was more communist than the Russians. More bluntly, Sir James Goldsmith declared, Takeovers are for the public good, but that's not why I do it. I do it for the money. Yet the raiders' claim that they were promoting the democratization of capital was hollow. At Milken's junk bond feast, there was no vacant cover for the uninvited guest. Milken pursued his operations through a clique whose membership was far more exclusive than the so-called establishment. Junk bonds were issued for a small number of corporate raiders and sold to a small number of institutional investors. The group was so closely connected that it was nicknamed the Daisy Chain. From his X-shaped trading desk in Beverly Hills, Milken commanded the financial and corporate worlds. He was revered by clients and associates. He only cared about bringing the truth. If Mike hadn't gone into the securities business, he could have led a religious revival movement, claimed a former Drexel executive. Another colleague asserted that Michael is the most important individual who has lived in this century. Contemporary descriptions of Milken as a messiah preaching a junk bond gospel abound. As Milken's power waxed, he began proselytizing on non-financial issues, rambling about the prospects of housing the world's population on floating hotels, lecturing his visitors on the risks of tampering with food packages, and pondering on human longevity. Yet there was a crude, bullying quality to the Drexel organization, which gave the outfit more the air of a mafia family than a religious cult. Fierce turf wars were fought with other investment banks. Since Milken controlled around two-thirds of the junk bond market, no one could afford to alienate him, and companies which didn't play ball might find one of Milken's raiders, or even Drexel itself, appearing suddenly on its shareholder register with a potential hostile holding. By 1986, Drexel had stakes in over 150 companies and owned a junk bond portfolio worth several hundred million dollars. This gave Milken even greater power in his ceaseless quest to dominate the junk bond market. An anonymous colleague told Connie Brook, author of The Predator's Ball, Michael is interested in power, dominance, 100% market share. Nothing is good enough for Michael. He is the most unhappy person I know. He never has enough. He drives people by insult. He drives everything. More, more, more deals. Although Milken had little interest in flaunting wealth, he had an insatiable desire to accumulate it. In addition to being a talented creative genius, said one Drexel employee, Michael is one of the most avaricious, ruthless, venal people on the face of the earth. In the early 1970s, Milken had negotiated a generous compensation deal with Drexel, giving him the right to retain one dollar of every three he made for the firm. Hostile LBOs generated fees running into tens of millions of dollars for Drexel. Milken supplemented his Drexel income by running a number of private investment partnerships, which participated in the more lucrative deals. On occasion, when clients issued bonds during a takeover, Milken demanded warrants, options to buy shares, as a sweetener. Instead of being distributed to the purchasers of junk bonds, these warrants were handed out to favoured clients or retained by Milken's private partnerships and by Drexel. If we can't make money from our friends, who can we make it from? Milken is reported as saying. In January 1986, Milken interviewed Martin Siegel, a leading mergers and acquisitions adviser, for a job at Drexel. If people here know how rich they are, he told Siegel, they'll get slow and fat. 
You must never count your money. You have to keep driving yourself to make more. In 1986, Milken kept $550 million of the junk bond department's $700 million bonus, making him the highest-paid individual in American history. Sometimes the wealth amassed by Milken's raiders was even greater. Ron Perelman, the Revlon raider, was reputed to have turned a loan of two million dollars in the late 1970s into a fortune of nearly three billion a decade later. Although costs were cut after buyouts and management was pruned, corporate extravagance persisted. The former chief executive of Revlon, Michel Bergerac, observed that although much had been made of his supposed extravagance during the takeover, the new management under Perelman was, if anything, more luxurious. These so-called raiders, complained Bergerac, managed to get hold of one of these large companies, and a mysterious process of osmosis seems to take place. They go to London to get their suits. They hire French chefs. They drink French wine. One plane is not enough for them, and some of them have two or three planes. So all I can say is that either the demands of the job create these things, or that the good life is contagious. Flushed with their newfound wealth. The junk bond jillionaires, as one writer called them, and their bonus-laden financial advisers put on a show of wealth without parallel in post-war America. President Reagan's glitzy six million dollar inauguration in January 1981 set the tone for a decade in which conspicuous consumption became a sign of the vitality of the American dream. Lavish parties were held at New York's cultural monuments. The Metropolitan Museum of Art, Club Met, to one gossip columnist, was decorated with twelve thousand Dutch tulips and fifty thousand French roses to celebrate the marriage between the children of corporate raider Saul Steinberg and Larry Tisch, head of the Lowe's Corporation, a baronial extravagance on the scale of Castile and Aragon in the fifteenth century, cooed Vanity Fair's editor Tina Brown. For a while, Susan Goodfriend, the wife of Salomon Brothers boss, led Nouvelle Society. Whether redecorating her Fifth Avenue apartment at a reputed cost of twenty million dollars, booking two seats on the Concorde to fly a cake to Paris for her husband's sixtieth birthday, or sending out invitations styled "At Home" to a party at Blenheim Palace, the extravagances of social Susie became the talk of the town. The former air hostess amused the world with her gaucheries. Bonsoir, Madame," curtsied the native Texan on being introduced to the first lady. "It's like living in a fairy tale," she told the New York Times. The value of the good friend's invitations, remarked Michael Lewis in Liar's Poker, seemed to rise and fall with Salomon Brothers' share price. "It's so expensive to be rich." She lamented a few weeks after the Wall Street crash. As power shifted from the bankers to their clients, John Goodfriend was usurped as King of Wall Street by Henry Kravis. The title was bestowed by Business Week magazine. In society, Susan Goodfriend ceded place to Kravis's fashion designer wife, Caroline Rome. The second Mrs. Kravis was a tall and skinny Midwesterner, the definitive social X-ray. A type diagnosed by Tom Wolfe as suffering from anorexia ricciosa, her activities were followed insatiably by gossip columnists. Bent on self-improvement, she studied French in France and opera in Salzburg. She took up the piano and announced that she was a reincarnation of Brahms. While many of her husband's employees laboured longer hours for lower wages to pay off the debts incurred by his leveraged buyouts. Rome announced to the press that she worked like a slave, designing dresses embroidered with precious stones. A press release stated she was crazy about diamonds. A party she gave at the Metropolitan Museum was described by one guest as medishishi. The diminutive Kravis, according to his wife, he is quite tall when he stands on his wallet, affected a patrician air. At his Manhattan office, he lunched off the finest Wedgwood china, had his shoes buffed while seated behind his mahogany desk, and one day was visited by Princess Margaret, who dropped in to admire a painting by Stubbs. An air of unreality hung over these inhabitants of Nouvelle society. Beauty and glamour are a state of mind.
announced Caroline Rome's publicity material. Her husband might well have said the same of stock market values. The boom in leveraged buyouts became the driving force behind the bull market of the mid-1980s. Conventional measures of value gave way to LBO valuations, known as private market value, which were calculated by examining how much cash, free cash flow, a company generated, and how much debt it could support. Professional risk arbitrageurs, on the lookout for the next takeover, became the medium through which private market value was established in the stock market. Acting in unofficial collusion, arbitrageurs searched for vulnerable companies and took large stakes in them, thus putting them in play. Members of the public followed the ARB's operations and imitated them, just as their forebears had followed stock market pools in the 1920s. Because the arbitrageurs and their followers had no loyalty to the company whose shares they owned, their activities made life simpler for the corporate raiders. When a bid was publicly announced, the raiders' broker needed only to call round members of the arbitrage club to acquire control of a company. This process, known as a street sweep, was most dramatically displayed in Robert Campo's takeover of Allied Stores, when, with a single telephone call, a Los Angeles broker named Boyd Jeffries acquired 32 million shares, or more than half the shares in circulation, giving Campo control of the $4 billion company. Arbs risked losing large sums of money when they took a stake in a company if a bid was not forthcoming or fell through. For example, when Gulf Oil's bid for Cities services collapsed in May 1982, Ivan Boski lost $24 million. Apparently, it was this loss that drove Boski to build a secret network of investment bankers, which included Martin Siegel of Kidder Peabody and Dennis Levine of Drexel. Using inside information supplied by Siegel, Boski made $28 million from Nestlé's acquisition of Carnation in 1984. Boski was not the only one who wished to play the game with loaded dice. A Business Week study in the spring of 1985 showed that nearly three-quarters of takeover bids were anticipated by strong advances in share prices, a sure sign of insider trading. With his average annual investment returns of over 80%, Boski was widely suspected of basing his speculations on insider information. On the 18th of May 1986, Boski addressed an assembly at a California business school with words that defined the 1980s zeitgeist. Greed is all right, by the way, he announced to whoops of delight from the attendant yuppies. I think greed is healthy. You can be greedy and still feel good about yourself. This speech was not so much a call to arms as Boski's perverse valediction to a life spent in pursuit of mammon. For by the time he uttered his celebrated words, Boski knew his time was up. Six days earlier, his chief informant, Dennis Levine, had been arrested on charges of insider trading in New York. On the 14th of November 1986, the Securities and Exchange Commission announced that Wall Street's most notorious arbitrageur had confessed to insider trading offences and was cooperating with investigators. Three days after Boski Day, the Wall Street Journal announced that Milken's role in the affair was under investigation. In reaction, the Dow Jones fell 43 points, junk bonds dipped sharply, and Ron Perelman abandoned his bid for Gillette. Although the game was not yet over, it had begun to turn. The market soon forgot the insider trading scandals. In January, President Reagan delivered an ebullient State of the Union address that caught the mood of the nation. The calendar can't measure America, because we were meant to be an endless experiment in freedom, with no limit to our reaches, no boundaries to what we can do, no end point to our hopes. In sympathy with the notion of limitless aspirations, the Dow broke through the 2000 mark for the first time. It continued upwards, despite a sharp fall in late January 1987, which brought a warning from the SEC chairman of an impending first-class catastrophe. Around the world, a speculative froth was evident. In London, Saatchi & Saatchi, an advertising group best known for its services on behalf of the Conservative Party, launched an abortive bid for the Midland Bank, 
one of the country's largest commercial banks. A financial Hitler arrives on Wall Street. In America, mergers and buyouts rebounded after Boski Day. Milken and Drexel faced growing competition from other Wall Street banks eager to muscle in on their LBO franchise. The world of junk bonds and hostile takeovers took on the attributes of a game, expressed in an esoteric, ludic language. A target company was said to be in play. If a white knight did not come to its rescue, management could thwart the predator with a poison pill or a Pac-Man defence, which involved making a counterbid for the predator. And if all this failed, the chief executive could bail out with a golden parachute compensation package. A banker proposing a deal talked of teeing up the concept. A high bid was a hat trick, and a successful junk bond issue a home run. The banker was rewarded with a small plastic encased tombstone advertisement recording details of the completed transaction. It was known as a deal toy. In the words of a Drexel executive, this was Disneyland for adults. As the competition increased, the quality of the deals declined. Symptomatic of this development was the elevation of Robert Campo, a Canadian property developer, to the rank of successful corporate raider. Campo was a prize eccentric whose business success had been accompanied by increasing grandiosity, vanity, and quirkiness. He maintained two separate families, took elocution lessons, had his teeth capped, his face lifted, and his hair transplanted. A hypochondriac, he flew regularly to Germany for injections of sheep brains and travelled everywhere with large supplies of mineral water and fresh oranges. His unusual appearance was enhanced by a penchant for wearing pork pie hats with feathers sticking out. In New York, Campo would call his bankers in the middle of the night. And hold meetings with them in his hotel room, dressed only in a pair of underpants. At one meeting, Campo emphasized a point by picking up a fork and stabbing it through the tabletop. In fact, Campo was a manic depressive, given to throwing tantrums and delivering stream of consciousness tirades. At such moments, his eyes, the one part of his physiognomy untouched by the surgeon's knife, would bulge out of his head and his hands would shake. The Canadian business establishment rightly viewed Campo with suspicion, and blocked his attempted takeover of a large financial institution at the beginning of the decade. In the giddy atmosphere of the 1980s, Wall Street was less fastidious. In 1986, Campo came to New York, where he took a suite at the Waldorf Astoria, equipped himself with a lawyer from a prominent Wall Street partnership, and started looking for an acquisition. After much thrashing around, he finally set his sights on the department store sector. He decided to bid for Allied Stores, owner inter alia of Brooks Brothers, the preppy clothing store. Allied had sales of four billion dollars, seventy thousand employees, and a market capitalization of two billion dollars, over ten times that of the Campo Corporation. Campo's advisers, led by Bruce Wasserstein, first Boston's star dealmaker. Were unfazed either by the disparity in size between predator and victim, or by their client's lack of experience in retailing. Although Campo talked vaguely of a synergy between real estate and retailing, instead, First Boston offered to lend the aspiring department store magnate nine hundred million dollars from its own coffers, a sum equal to the bank's entire capital, and to raise a further six hundred million with a margin loan secured against Allied stock. Campo even succeeded in borrowing the three hundred million dollars of equity he had promised to put into the four billion dollar bid. On top of these loans, over a billion dollars worth of junk bonds were issued to finance the acquisition. Because Allied did not generate sufficient cash to service the interest payments on these debts, First Boston issued on Campo's behalf two hundred and fifty million dollars worth of pay-in-kind preferred shares. That is. Securities that paid dividends with loan notes rather than cash. The total bill for the acquisition of Allied came to four point one billion dollars. In March nineteen eighty seven, Allied succumbed to Campo's bid. Its chief executive was dismissed, complaining bitterly of having been blindsided by a trainload of clowns, 
although he got a $15 million golden parachute. The bankers received fees totaling more than $500 million, and a financial Hitler, to use the description of one of his advisers, found himself in charge of America's second-largest department store group. The novel financial practices involved in the Allied takeover, in which banks staked their entire capital on strangers, debt could not be serviced without asset sales, bonds paid interest in yet more bonds, and advisory fees exceeded the equity investment of the investor, were hailed by Wasserstein as the dawn of a new era of merchant banking. The October Crash On the 25th of August 1987, the Dow Jones Industrial Average closed at 2,746, up 43% on the year. Although sentiment remained bullish into the early autumn, with Morgan Stanley advising its clients to have 100% of their investment portfolio in stocks, the flow of funds to the market faltered. In preparation for a massive $35 billion issue of shares in Nippon Telephone and Telegraph, Japanese investors started repatriating funds. As US bond yields were rising on fears of inflation and the dollar was falling against the yen, Japanese investors were also losing heavily on their massive investments in treasury bonds, which they now began to sell. This further depressed the price of bonds, and made shares, trading on a multiple of 23 times earnings, look increasingly overvalued. With the yield on Treasury bonds at over 10% by the beginning of the second week in October, there followed a spate of unsettling reports. Treasury Secretary James Baker was threatening to let the dollar go into free fall unless the German Bundesbank lowered interest rates. On Tuesday the 13th of October, the market buzzed with the rumour that Congress planned to end the tax breaks favourable to leveraged buyouts. The following day, a larger-than-expected US trade deficit was announced. On Friday, reacting to the news that a tanker carrying the US flag had been hit by an Iranian missile in the Persian Gulf, the market dropped 108 points, its largest points fall ever. The same day, the London Stock Exchange remained closed after a freak hurricane tore through southern England. Earlier in the week, Elaine Garzarelli, a research analyst with Shearson Lehman, had forecast on cable news network an imminent collapse in the stock market. It was to prove, in the words of Business Week, the call of the century. The international stock market crash of Monday the 19th of October 1987 rose with the sun in the east. Hong Kong, Malaysia and Singapore, followed by several of the European markets, were all down heavily while New York slept. When the New York Stock Exchange eventually opened at 9.30 on Monday morning, there were no bids for many of the large stocks. Half an hour later, only 25 of the 500 stocks in the Standard & Poor's 500 Index, representing America's largest companies, were trading. If people were unable to sell shares, they could at least sell stock index futures at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Concentrated selling of futures, however, caused futures to drop to a discount to shares traded on the big board. In normal circumstances, arbitrageurs would have acted to close the gap by buying futures and selling shares, but this day the volatility was too great for arbitrage and the markets became uncoupled. Instead, a vicious circle operated as panic selling of futures caused the stock market to drop, which in turn induced further sales of futures. Shortly before noon, the press reported that the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission was considering a trading halt. People hastened to dispose of stocks while the market remained open. The turbulence of October 1929 had been caused partly by the forced liquidation of margin accounts. In October 1987, an avalanche of computerised programme selling was to blame. The sales were induced by portfolio insurance, a fashionable and supposedly fail-safe investment strategy which dictated buying when stocks rose and selling when they fell. Funds managed by portfolio insurers had increased rapidly during the year to reach an estimated $90 billion. In the three trading days before the crash, portfolio insurers unloaded nearly $4 billion worth of stocks on a falling market. 
On Black Monday, in the hour after one o'clock, they were responsible for over half the sales of the stock index futures at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Portfolio insurers were contracted to make their sales in the futures market, so that even when futures fell to a discount to the stock market, they continued selling there. Aggressive traders, anticipating these sales, jumped on the bandwagon and sold stocks short. By the market's close, portfolio insurers had sold the equivalent of four billion dollars worth of stocks in the futures market, forty percent of the day's total volume. The panic on that day was similar to countless former stock market panics. A trader at the Merck fled his post, withdrew his life savings from a bank in the foyer, and disappeared over the horizon in his Porsche. Several other traders sold their seats at the Merck. Whose price crashed along with everything else, in the White House, a senior administrative official was witnessed running down the corridor, shouting, "It's in free fall!" As in 1929, the technology of the market began to collapse. On the New York Stock Exchange, the automated trading system broke down; its printers could not cope with the flood of selling, and brokers were left unable to confirm trades. The new derivatives markets performed no better. Owing to extreme volatility, it became impossible to price stock options, and the options market dried up. When the markets closed, the indexes told the story. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was down 22.6 percent, the S and P 500 down 20.5 percent, and the S and P futures contract down nearly 29 percent. Turnover on the big board exceeded 600 million stocks, worth 21 billion dollars, almost double the record set the previous Friday. A similar amount had been traded in the futures market. Two venerable New York Stock Exchange member firms, E. F. Hutton and L. F. Rothschild, failed, along with nearly 60 smaller brokers. For many, the collapse of the market appeared to threaten a systemic financial crisis, possibly the end of capitalism. The financier Sir James Goldsmith, who had recently sold most of his assets in anticipation of a crash, compared his feelings at the time to winning a rubber of bridge in the card room of the Titanic. Goldsmith's anticipation of doom was exaggerated. On Tuesday, the twentieth of October, after a sharp initial decline and the temporary closure of the futures market at the Merck, the stock market climbed sharply. This rally was assisted by actions of the Federal Reserve, which provided extensive liquidity to the financial markets in order to avert a banking crisis. Several major companies, urged on by telephone calls from the White House, announced they would buy back their shares. Conspiracy theorists later suggested that the recovery was engineered by the authorities, who had closed the futures market at the Merck in order to manipulate stock prices. Whatever its causes, the recovery effectively ended the panic. By the end of the year, investors who had held their stock positions since January were even able to record a modest profit, despite having lived through the greatest crash in percentage terms in history. Although a total of one trillion dollars was knocked off American stock market values during the month of October, the panic of 1987, unlike that of 1929. Was not followed by an economic crisis. The reason for this, according to some commentators, is that the 1987 bull market was not really a retail market, attracting ordinary members of the public. So when share prices collapsed, the effect on public confidence and consumption was slight. Andrew Smithers, an English economist, offers another explanation. He claims that the crash of 1987 did not produce a recession because stock prices were not actually overvalued at the time. Using a measure of valuation known as the Q ratio, devised by the American Nobel laureate James Tobin, which compares the market capitalization of companies to the replacement cost of their factories, plants, and other assets, Smithers shows that even at their peak in August 1987. Share prices were only slightly above their long-term average. If the mild aftermath of the 1987 crash remains an enigma to many, it was interpreted by the exponents of efficient markets as proof that speculative booms and stock market panics were rarely, if ever, the cause of depressions. 
Political Venality and the Savings and Loan Crisis The leveraged buyout boom was made possible by the deep-seated laissez-faire attitude of the Reagan administration, which dissuaded the Federal Reserve from applying margin restrictions on buyouts. At some point, principled laissez-faire gives way to a widespread acceptance of shortcuts in the pursuit of self-interest, and from there it is but a short step to outright dishonesty. As the Reagan years progressed, a fog of corruption gathered over Washington, reminiscent of the Gilded Age or the Harding Presidency in the early 1920s. By the spring of 1987, more than a hundred officials appointed to federal posts during the Reagan administration had been accused of misconduct. Many of the nation's political leaders were prepared to sell themselves to the highest bidder in exchange for campaign contributions. Milken brazenly told the Washington Post in April 1986 that the force in this country for buying high-yield securities has overpowered all regulation. That year, Drexel raised half a million dollars in campaign contributions for Senator Alphonse D'Amato, chair of the Subcommittee on Securities of the Senate Banking Committee, who had previously supported restrictions on hostile takeovers. After this donation, it was observed that D'Amato's disposition towards junk bonds underwent a remarkable transformation. Political venality, dogmatic deregulation and speculative opportunism combined explosively to produce the savings and loan scandal of the late 1980s. The savings and loan associations, known colloquially as thrifts, or S&Ls, were local banks originally created to provide mortgage loans to American homeowners, a role idealised in Frank Capra's movie It's a Wonderful Life, in which James Stewart played an honest and dependable thrift manager. By the early 1980s, however, many of these institutions were in trouble. In particular, they suffered from the deregulation of interest rates, which obliged them to pay higher rates for short-term deposits, especially high during the Volcker squeeze on inflation, when they had already lent for long periods at low fixed rates. The Reagan administration's prescription for the thrift's ills was a large dose of deregulation. First of all, thrifts were freed from dependence on local customers' deposits, and permitted to borrow funds wholesale from Wall Street money brokers. At the same time, federal deposit insurance on individual S&L accounts was raised to $100,000. Second, they were encouraged to diversify their loan portfolios to reduce their reliance on the local housing market. The Garn St. Germain Bill of 1982 removed restrictions on thrift loans, allowing them to invest in junk bonds, property deals, and almost any other speculative venture that took their fancy. On signing the bill, President Reagan commented, I think we have hit a home run. Important changes were made to thrift accounting rules. They were permitted to sell off bad loans without taking an immediate charge against profits. This was called euphemistically loss deferral. On the other hand, Anticipated earnings on real estate investments could be reported. Property development loans of up to 100% of appraised value were permitted. In short, virtually every rule in the book of prudent banking was either flouted or struck off. Depositors might have been wary of these developments and removed their cash to safer havens had their deposits not been guaranteed by the federal government. Deposit insurance more than dulled depositors, it positively encouraged them to seek out the highest rates offered by the shakiest institutions. In the words of one commentator, it was the crack cocaine of American finance. While depositors remained in a state of somnolence, savings and loan managers reacted swiftly to these changing circumstances. They proceeded to take the thrift out of thrifts. In California, Seminars were held informing them how to use the new legislation to get rich quick. Formerly sober thrift managers started speculating in collateralized mortgage obligations. Warned of the risks involved, one of their number retorted that hedging is for sissies. Many savings and loans invested heavily in junk bonds. Thomas Spiegel, a former Drexel salesman who ran a California thrift, Columbia Savings and Loan, 
was particularly close to Milcom, who took a large stake in his business. As the junk market took off, Spiegel expanded his bank's balance sheet from under $400 million in early 1982 to $13 billion five years later, of which nearly a third was invested in junk. Operating from an office in Beverly Hills, close to Drexel's bond department, Columbia participated in all of Milken's biggest deals. Spiegel enjoyed the good life. He purchased two corporate jets and paid himself a $9 million salary in 1985. Another junk bond buying bon vivant of the savings and loan world was David Paul, a former house builder who ran the Sen Trust Savings Bank of Miami. Paul bought $1.4 billion worth of junk bonds and a similar amount of unrateable speculative bonds from Drexel, which had earlier helped finance his takeover of Centrust. Paul paid himself $16 million, took an apartment at the Carlisle Hotel in Manhattan, and spent $1.4 million a year on a corporate jet, $13 million on a painting by Rubens, and $8 million on a yacht. Called Le Grand Cru, it came with gold-leaf ceilings and a jacuzzi in the master suite. While the yacht and the art collection appeared as assets on the bank's balance sheet, junk bond losses went discreetly unreported. The behaviour of the Texas savings and loan operators was even more unreal. They expanded their loan books by an average of over 1,200% a year, lending mostly on speculative property deals. Their business interests did not prevent them from enjoying the finer things in life. For instance, Don Ray Dixon of Vernon Savings took his wife by private jet and Rolls-Royce on a market study of French Michelin three-star restaurants. In return, she penned a report for the bank entitled Gastronomie Fantastique. He also bought half a dozen jets, a vintage car dealership, and the sister ship to President Roosevelt's yacht. Another operator, Edwin Fast Eddie McBurney of Sunbelt Savings, fed his guests at his North Dallas home on lion meat and antelope, while presiding over the festivities dressed as Henry VIII, with dry ice billowing around him. At another party at his penthouse suite in Las Vegas, McBurney allegedly diverted his bank's clients with an enthusiastic lesbian romp, while prostitutes performed fellatio on favoured guests. Milken's web of contacts in the savings and loan world was complex, for instance, the Southmark Corporation, a conglomerate which issued junk through Drexel and bought the San Jacinto Savings and Loan Association of Houston in order to finance real estate deals, became the landlord of another of Milken's clients, Circus Circus, a Las Vegas casino operator. Southmark was connected with MDC Holdings of Denver, which owned Silverado Savings and Loan, and also issued junk bonds through Drexel. McBurney's Sunbelt Savings held Southmark and MDC bonds in its junk bond portfolio. By far the most notorious of Milken's many contacts in the thrift world was Charles Keating, head of Lincoln Savings and Loan of Irvine, California. A former swimming champion, Keating had once worked as a lawyer for Carl Lindner, the business tycoon and corporate raider. In 1978, he purchased from Lindner a large house-building company, whose name he changed to American Continental. Five years later, Drexel issued junk bonds and preferred stock for American Continental, retaining a 10% stake in the company for itself. With this money, Keating bought Lincoln Savings and Loan. On taking control of Lincoln, Keating fired the thrift's senior management increased its supply of funds from Wall Street money brokers in order to grow the bank rapidly, and commenced speculating in risky securities and property deals. Keating put $100 million into Boski's arbitrage partnership. In the spring of 1985, he backed Sir James Goldsmith's leveraged bid for Crown Zellerback, the paper company. He made real estate deals in Texas and Arizona with the Southmark Corporation and Fast Eddie McBurney. In his dealings with Wall Street, Keating embarked on loss-making foreign exchange deals with Credit Suisse, purchased the junkiest of junk bonds from Drexel, 
and speculated in stock options and shares using a supposedly fail-safe computerized trading system developed by Salomon Brothers, which nevertheless lost several million dollars. Facilitated by the deregulation and lax banking supervision of the Reagan years, Keating resorted to numerous accounting tricks to conceal his mounting losses. In 1986, he issued unsecured bonds for American Continental, which he distributed to Lincoln's customers, many of whom believed, wrongly, that the bonds carried a federal guarantee. Although reckless in his speculations, Keating displayed great care in cultivating politicians and regulators. He provided campaign funds to nine senators and several congressmen, and offered lucrative jobs to several of Lincoln Bank's regulators and auditors. At one point, he even succeeded in getting a man heavily in debt to Lincoln appointed as commissioner to the bank board, the body ultimately responsible for regulating Lincoln's affairs. If he couldn't bribe bank regulators with employment, Keating threatened them personally with lawsuits. He hired the economist Alan Greenspan, later chairman of the Federal Reserve, to support Lincoln's application to increase its direct investments to more than 10% of assets. In a letter he must have come to regret deeply, Greenspan wrote to the California bank regulator that the management of Lincoln and American Continental was seasoned and expert, with a long and continuous track record of outstanding success in making sound and profitable direct investments. When regulators discovered that Keating was concealing losses and had exceeded the regulations on direct investments, he used his friendly senators, later dubbed the Keating Five, to browbeat the head of the bank board. For over two years, Keating successfully fended off the regulators. Finally, in the spring of 1989, Lincoln was taken over by the authorities. At a press conference held after the event, Keating announced, One question, among the many raised in recent weeks, has to do with whether my financial support in any way influenced several political figures to take up my cause. I want to say in the most forceful way I can, I certainly hope so. In similar manner, other thrift operators secured their freedom of action with political contributions. On his yacht, Don Dixon of Vernon S&L held fundraising parties for Jim Wright, the Speaker of the House, and several other leading Democrats. The golden rule, according to a lobbyist for the Texas thrifts, was that he who has the gold makes the rules, never mind that the gold was borrowed with a federal guarantee. By the end of the decade, the fastest-growing thrifts had accumulated staggering losses on their loan and investment portfolios. The bailout of Silverado Savings and Loan alone cost over $1 billion. Over 1,100 thrifts failed as a result of their imprudent practices, and the American taxpayer was left to pick up the bill, amounting to around $200 billion. But for the presence of federal deposit insurance, the very policy which had encouraged their reckless speculations, the collapse of the thrift industry would most probably have led to bank runs, followed by a credit contraction and asset deflation similar to that of the 1930s. The End of the Decade The junk bond mania continued into 1988. It was said that shortly after taking control of Allied stores, Campo, while on holiday in Florida, came across a Bloomingdale's store, whereupon he threw up his arms and declared, This is the store I should have bought. His bid for Bloomingdale's parent, Federated Stores, was launched in late January 1988. A contest developed, but Campo had no limit. He secured the company at a cost of nearly $11 billion, with his own equity investment limited to less than $200 million. Bankers' fees for the transaction exceeded Federated's annual earnings. Shortly after the Federated takeover, Campo ordered a lavish leather-bound book to be produced with photographs of his buildings and stores. In the introduction, America's greatest department store magnate expounded his vapid philosophy. Because we can be no more than we aspire to be, we will aspire to be more than the best of what we are. The quality of junk bonds declined progressively, 
as the gap between an LBO company's earnings and the interest payments on its junk bonds was whittled away. As a result, a slight decline in income would send the junk bonds into default and the company into bankruptcy. In order to conceal the fragility of this situation, Drexel and other investment banks issued more accrued interest securities, such as pay-in-kind and zero-coupon bonds, which, because they paid interest with corporate paper rather than cash, delayed the initial impact of interest charges on a company's cash flow. The amount of equity invested in LBO deals also declined. James Grant calculated that in 1987 and 1988, equity investment in LBOs averaged less than 4%. Some companies, such as Dr Pepper, the soft drinks manufacturer, went through multiple buyouts at ever-increasing prices. Warren Buffett was reminded of a New Yorker cartoon in which a grateful borrower tells his bank manager, I don't know how I'll ever repay you. On a more serious note, Buffett warned investors that, in the end, alchemy, whether it is metallurgical or financial, fails. A base business cannot be transformed into a golden business by tricks of accounting or capital structure. Ultimately, the health of the junk bond market rested upon an unwavering faith in Michael Milken. Unfortunately, the chief alchemist was removed from the scene just when his inspirational presence was most needed. Shortly after his arrest, Ivan Bosky had implicated Milken in order to lighten his own sentence. In September 1988, Milken and Drexel were charged with violating a number of securities laws, including those against racketeering, market manipulation, insider trading and stock parking, that is, executing false trades between parties in order to avoid taxes. After initial resistance, Drexel conceded to certain charges and agreed to pay a fine of $650 million and fire Milken. Milken initially proved more obdurate. In the spring of 1989, along with his brother Lowell and another Drexel associate, Milken received a 98-charge indictment which carried a potential maximum sentence of over 500 years and limitless fines. Shortly after, in exchange for clemency for his brother, Milken arranged to plead guilty to a few minor felonies. A full trial, which might have provided a definitive exposition of Milken's role in the junk bond mania and ascertained the full extent of his criminality, was avoided. On the 21st of November 1991, Milken was sentenced to ten years' imprisonment. His fines totaled over $600 million. At the time of his conviction, it was disclosed that between 1985 and 1987, Milken's cumulative earnings exceeded $1.2 billion. This revelation led the press to caricature the shy banker as Money Mad Mike. To many, Milken's ten-year sentence appeared a suitable punishment for his part in the decade of greed. Naturally, his lawyers did not see it this way. Describing the case prepared against the financier by the U.S. Attorney's Office under Rudolf Giuliani, Milken's lawyer, Arthur Lyman, stated, I am convinced that society needs a certain number of demons. The case took on the characteristics of a heresy trial. Milken had become a symbol, the symbol of an era, and it was beyond any kind of control. While it is true that Milken was indicted for relatively minor offences, having escaped by plea bargaining the more serious charges, and that, contrary to popular perception, the great bulk of his fortune was derived legitimately from his uncommonly generous remuneration package, Milken was not the innocent scapegoat portrayed by his legal team and PR advisers, whose budget ran to many millions of dollars. His total control of the junk bond market turned him and his fellow Drexel traders into bullies and braggarts. Corners were cut in the pursuit of profit. The lust for money and power created a collective adrenaline rush that fed upon itself, until Milken and Drexel became insatiable. Like Sir John Blunt in 1720, Milken overreached himself and brought about his own downfall. A greater degree of probity than Milken displayed has always been demanded from those who aspire to be great bankers. Perhaps the best way to judge Milken's career is through the unfolding of events in the junk bond market. 
The leveraged buyout craze reached its zenith in early 1989, with Kohlberg Kravis Roberts's $26 billion takeover of RJR Nabisco, the food and tobacco conglomerate. An episode described by Anthony Bianco, a financial journalist, as resembling Der Ring des Nibelungen, directed by Mel Brooks and starring a collection of ornery, steely-eyed midgets in the guise of gangsters. Time magazine simply called it a game of greed. The collapse of the junk bond world followed shortly after. In April 1989, Charles Keating's American Continental filed for bankruptcy. On the 15th of June, the day that Milken was sacked, Integrated Resources, a Drexel client, defaulted on its junk bonds, whereupon it became known as Disintegrated. In July, Congress passed a bill requiring savings and loan associations to dispose of their junk bond holdings. Two months later, the Campo Corporation, not a Drexel client, admitted it could no longer pay the interest on its bonds. It was as if, wrote the financial journalist James Stewart, the nation's investors had awakened from a decade-long dream and recognised finally that high returns could not be realised without increased risk. When the proposed buyout of United Airlines fell through in October 1989, the junk bond market collapsed and the Dow fell by 6%. A couple of months later, both the Campo Corporation and Integrated Resources sought bankruptcy protection, along with the Jim Walter Corporation, a Kohlberg Kravis Roberts buyout. Its balance sheet heavy with depreciating junk bonds, Drexel Burnham Lambert found itself unable to roll over its short-term debts. Its numerous Wall Street enemies refused to come to Drexel's aid. On the 13th of February 1990, the bank that had epitomised the 1980s financial culture joined its clients in bankruptcy. During the next 12 months, two of Milken's largest junk bond buyers, Fred Carr's first executive, an insurance company, and Thomas Spiegel's Columbia Savings and Loan, also failed. It was a sorry legacy for the empire of a man once hailed as the successor to Pierpont Morgan. The corporate raiders had enjoyed lambasting incumbent managements, complaining typically that senior executives had no stake in the businesses they ran. Yet most of the raiders' stakes were composed of borrowed money. The debts were serviced by sacking workers and cutting other operating expenses, and by reducing ongoing investments. This might lead to increased efficiency as Flab was cut from a company, but it could also seriously weaken its competitive position, as has been the case with RJR Nabisco. When the timing was right, as with Perelman's takeover of Revlon and Kohlberg Kravis Roberts's acquisition of Beatrice, the gains for the Raiders were mouth-watering. When the timing and execution were poor, as with Campo's venture into the department store business, the losses for the creditors were excruciating. The junk bond revolution was based on a profound asymmetry between risk and reward, with junk bond purchasers taking most of the risk and takeover entrepreneurs snaffling most of the rewards. In fact, the movement for leveraged buyouts represented the return of the large speculative margin loan through the back door. For instance, Robert Campo acquired control of an $11 billion company with an equity investment of only $200 million. Since he actually borrowed the equity portion, the margin loan was close to 100%. Examined in this light, the returns of Kohlberg Kravis Roberts for its investors look less than impressive. Leon Cooperman, a Goldman Sachs partner, calculated that holding a selection of stocks on 85% margin during the bull market of the 1980s would have yielded annual profits of nearly 75%. Using similar leverage, KKR achieved returns for its investors of only 60%. Yet these returns were sufficient to make vast personal fortunes for the firm's partners. Once the figures could be examined, it became clear that, contrary to Milken's gospel, junk bonds had considerably underperformed investment-grade bonds. Not only were the returns lower, but the risks were far greater than Milken's initial analysis had suggested. The rate of default on junk bonds rose to around 9% in the early 1990s, 
more than four times the historic average. The change in the rate of default demonstrates what George Soros has termed the reflexivity of the financial markets. As investors came to share Milken's belief that junk bonds provided better returns, their relative quality declined until they became the worst and most speculative investments. Milken's thesis for junk bonds resembles E. L. Smith's case for equity investment in the 1920s. Both were based on sound statistical analyses of past returns, yet the validity of their conclusions was vitiated by subsequent manias. Commenting on Milken's original case for junk bonds, based on their historic outperformance, Warren Buffett observed, If history books were the key to riches, the Forbes 400 would consist of librarians. Michael Milken received his sentence on the very day Mrs. Thatcher was toppled from power. It was widely expected that after the excesses of the 1980s, the speculative spirit would wane as it had done after the 1920s. In retrospect, the crash of 1987 sent out a radically different message to the events of 1929. The market's recovery appeared to show that buying and holding stocks was the best investment strategy, and that stock market crashes did not herald economic depressions. Instead, they provided an opportunity for bargain basement purchases by canny investors buying into the dip. If a runaway stock market train hit the buffers at high speed, the Federal Reserve would always be there to sort out the mess. If the banks messed up, deposit insurance guaranteed that the taxpayer would end up paying. Portfolio insurers, it is true, suffered public censure and disappeared from the scene. Exponents of the efficient market hypothesis kept their heads down, but only for a short while. A few years later, two number-crunching academics produced an analysis suggesting that the 1987 crash had been a chimera, a mathematical aberration, a chance event whose odds against recurrence were 10 to the power of minus 160 to 1. Even if one were to have lived through the entire 20 billion year life of the universe, they concluded, and experienced this 20 billion times, 20 billion big bangs, the probability that such a decline could have happened even once in this period is a virtual impossibility. Chapter 9 Kamikaze Capitalism The Japanese Bubble Economy of the 1980s by your patience, ancient pistol, Fortune is painted blind, with a muffler afore her eyes, to signify to you that she is blind. And she is painted also with a wheel, to signify to you, which is the moral of it, that she is turning and inconstant, and mutability and variation. And her foot, look you, is fixed upon a spherical stone, which rolls and rolls and rolls. In good truth, the poet makes a most excellent description of it. Fortune is an excellent moral. Shakespeare, Henry V, Act Three, Scene Six. Central to the body of thought known as Nihon Jinron, which roughly translates as the theory of the Japanese, is the idea that Japan is unique. Perceived differences between Japan and the West were sometimes invoked by the Japanese authorities in order to hinder the import of foreign goods. For instance, Japanese intestines were said to be different from those of Westerners, and therefore unsuited to foreign beef and rice. It was even claimed that American skis were useless in Japan because the snow was different. At other times, pointing out such differences became a barely concealed expression of Japanese cultural nationalism and xenophobia, the Japanese brain was said to have a heightened sensitivity to the sounds of nature, and a more intricate understanding of social relationships. The Japanese distrusted Western-style rationalism as being incompatible with the preservation of wa, social harmony. They recognized a distinction between honna, a private intention or thought, and tatemai, a public version of the truth, and considered both to be equally valid. Japanese reason was described as wet, like the cloying rice of the national diet, which formed the glue of the community, while Western reason was dry and individualistic. Even in the ethical sphere, the Japanese were said to be different. 
They did not feel guilt, only shame on public revelation of misdeeds. At the root of all these differences, both real and spurious, lay a profound distrust of individualism, which found its counterpart in a strong attachment to community and deference to authority. The Western model of capitalism is primarily individualistic. Self-interest directs the invisible hand, which holds the system together. Because self-interest cannot be directed by authority, Adam Smith described the market system as that most compatible with a state of civil liberty. The centrality of self-interest to Western capitalism dictates a number of economic policies. A confined role for government in economic affairs, a distrust of monopolies and cartels, and the protection of the individual, whether operating as a tradesman, entrepreneur, capitalist or consumer. Laissez-faire prescribes that markets should be left to find their natural level, while the law of comparative advantage enjoins governments not to protect their domestic industries from foreign competition. Japanese capitalism is in many respects the antithesis of the Western model. Until the middle of the 19th century, Japan remained a feudal economy, closed to the outside world, with no tradition of legal rights for the individual. When the Japanese authorities of the Meiji era decided to modernize their country following the arrival of American warships under Commodore Perry in the middle of the 19th century, they borrowed selectively from the West to build a new economic system. The hierarchy of the feudal system, however, remained in place. It was simply transferred from an agricultural base to a corporate industrial one. The peasant, who had formerly bowed to his feudal lord, now served a corporate master. Even after the Second World War, it was common for a worker to be called by the name of his company. For instance, if he worked for the country's largest car manufacturer, he might be known to his friends as Toyota-san, Mr. Toyota. Employees were required to sing the company song, and even worship at the company founder's shrine. In exchange for their devotion and self-sacrifice, employees were rewarded by their companies with lifetime employment and promotion according to seniority. The primacy of the company in the Japanese system was recognized by the authorities, which encouraged the creation of industry cartels and huge industrial groups known as zaibatsu, when the Zaibatsu were partially dismembered by the American occupation forces after the Second World War, they were replaced by less formal groupings, known as Keiretsu, in which outright ownership gave way to an intricate system of cross-shareholdings. In Japanese capitalism, the role of the authorities was traditionally wide-ranging, though undefined. Officials at the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, MITI, and at the Ministry of Finance, controlled industries through an informal process known as administrative guidance, a system of persuasion and intimidation, based on the bureaucrats' powers to license companies, provide tax concessions, distribute government contracts, and so on. In the post-war era, MITI decided which industries to support and which companies would enjoy a privileged position within an industry cartel and receive protection from foreign competition. The Ministry of Finance guarded the financial sector and ensured that cheap loans were channelled from Japan's thrifty savers to its cash-hungry and highly leveraged corporations. As interest rates were kept artificially low by these arrangements, and companies generally paid only small dividends, returns for Japanese investors were poor. Indeed, the term Japanese capitalism is misleading, since capital did not actually determine the nature of the system. The domestic consumer was similarly exploited by the Japanese system. Imports were restricted by a variety of measures, and it was common for Japanese manufactured goods to sell for a higher price in Tokyo than in New York. The Japanese prided themselves that their system was less selfish and more stable than the West. They boasted that they were long-termist, while the West pursued only short-term gains. Japanese companies were more interested in market share than profitability and paid more attention to administrative guidance and their keiretsu obligations than to their returns on capital. Under this system, the role of the market was severely restricted. 
One Western commentator declared that the Japanese have never really caught up with Adam Smith. They don't believe in the invisible hand. The individualistic pursuit of self-interest was deplored, and a distrust of trade lingered. While money was recognized as the source of power in politics, samurai tradition emphasized the virtues of frugality. In pre-war Japan, the nouveau riche were dismissed as narikin, a Japanese chess term for a pawn promoted to a queen, an object with no hierarchical right. Hierarchy remained the essence of the system. Employees had a defined position within their corporate hierarchy, and companies were ranked within their keiretsu, which in turn took its place in the hierarchy of the keidanren, the Federation of Economic Organizations. Speculation is antithetical to a state-directed economic system such as existed in Japan. It is inherently short-termist and seeks the maximization of gain, while the Japanese system was professedly long-termist and considered other economic objectives, such as the development of favored industries, more important than mere profit. Speculation also involves the transference of risk, but after a stock market crash and numerous bank collapses in the 1920s and early 1930s, it was declared that the Japanese authorities would never again tolerate such failures. As a result, risk was socialized in Japan to a far greater degree than in the West. Nevertheless, speculation came to Japan in the 1980s. It burrowed so deep inside the Japanese system that when it departed, after a mere five years, the system was in ruins. Officials tried to pick up the pieces and reconstruct the old order, but their efforts were in vain. This was the real legacy of the bubble economy. Winning the Peace Speculative euphoria is often a symptom of hubris. For this reason, we find great speculative manias at times when the economic balance of power is shifting from one nation to another. For instance, the tulip mania appeared in Holland shortly after the Dutch economic miracle, which saw Amsterdam established as the entrepôt of the world. In similar fashion, a stock market boom occurred in New York at the beginning of the 20th century, when the United States overtook Britain as the world's leading industrial power. For more than three quarters of a century, America stoutly maintained its economic primacy, but by the middle of the 1980s, its position was threatened by the growing might of Japan. Japan's share of world trade was over 10%, its trade surpluses were burgeoning, the nation's capital exports invited comparison with those of Britain in the 19th century, and Japanese per capita income was in the course of exceeding American levels. Japan's industrial companies dominated new technologies in consumer electronics and a number of other fields, and its banks were the largest in the world in terms of both assets and market value. America was on the run. While Japan had its trade surpluses, America faced growing trade deficits. The Reagan administration also produced enormous budget deficits, that were only sustained by the willingness of Japanese investors to sink their country's trade surplus into U.S. Treasury bonds. In Detroit, angry auto workers destroyed Japanese cars in protest against imports. The New York Times warned that, today, 40 years after the end of World War II, the Japanese are on the move again in one of history's most brilliant commercial offensives as they go about dismantling American industry. Assailed by commentators who told them they were balefully short-termist and suffering from chronic individualism, Americans lost some of their self-confidence. It was claimed that the United States was threatened by an economic Pearl Harbor. A book entitled Japan as Number One became a bestseller on both sides of the Pacific. The Japanese also invested their trade surplus in purchasing U.S. assets other than treasury bonds. American property was a particular favorite with Japanese investors. After the Mitsui Corporation acquired the Exxon building in Manhattan for a record price of $610 million in 1986, it was reported that Mitsui's Japanese president had paid $260 million above Exxon's asking price in order to see his name in the Guinness Book of World Records. 
Given the extravagance of many Japanese overseas acquisitions, this story appeared credible. As the decade progressed, the Japanese snapped up other icons of American capitalism, most notoriously New York's Rockefeller Center and Hollywood's Columbia Pictures. This deluge of Japanese capital revived the fierce xenophobia that Americans had formerly displayed towards their wartime adversaries. American anxieties over the yellow peril, expressed in scaremongering works including Susan Tolchin's Buying Into America, 1988, and Daniel Burstein's Yen, Japan's New Financial Empire and Its Threat to America, 1989, found their broadest audience with Michael Crichton's best-selling novel Rising Sun, which was published at the height of the Japan is buying up the United States hysteria. Crichton told the New York Times that he had written the novel to make America wake up. American fears were matched by a revival of Japanese self-confidence, sweetly enjoyed after the deeply felt humiliation of military defeat and the long sacrifices undertaken to rebuild the shattered nation. A newfound self-assurance was evident in the posturing of Japanese politicians. In the autumn of 1986, Yasuhiro Nakasone, the newly elected Prime Minister, ascribed the success of the Japanese economy and the relative decline of the United States to his nation's racial homogeneity compared with America's racially mixed workforce. Such comments echoed the wartime propaganda that had asserted the superiority of the Yamato race. Several leading members of the government even publicly visited the Yasukuni Shrine, where the war dead were honoured, while Nakasune himself proclaimed that the nation must shed all sense of ignominy and move forward seeking glory. Having lost the war and discarded its dreams of a Pacific empire, Japan had finally won the peace and emerged as an economic superpower. Under the circumstances, hubris was perhaps inevitable. Zytec, Corporate Speculation Japan could not avoid being sucked into the vortex of the financial revolution that followed the breakup of the Bretton Woods fixed currency system in 1971, an event, incidentally, which President Nixon blamed on Japan, whose chronically undervalued currency had undermined the system. In 1980, Japan liberalised its exchange controls. Even so, the pace of reforms was too slow for many American critics, who argued that continuing restrictions in the Japanese financial system were part of a deliberate policy to keep the yen below its natural level, thereby making Japanese exports cheaper. In fact, the liberalization of the financial system was not simply the result of American pressure. Japan was obliged to reform its financial markets in order to recirculate the excess capital accumulated by its rising trade surpluses and sustained by its high savings rate. Although the Japanese authorities could not avoid the financial revolution, they hoped that reforms would enable Tokyo to emerge as a global financial centre, taking its rightful place alongside New York and London. In the spring of 1984, the Japanese authorities agreed to allow foreign banks to deal in Japanese government bonds and enter the trust banking business. At the same time, controls on foreign exchange trading were removed. For the first time, Japanese banks were allowed to set their own rates of interest on large deposit accounts. As a result of these reforms, Japan's capital markets were quickly filled with the detritus of the financial revolution. Canadian and Australian TUFAs, reverse dual currency bonds, samurai and sushi bonds, instantly repackaged perpetuals, zero coupon bonds, square trips and double dip leveraged leases, euro yen bonds and harakiri swaps. Financial derivatives also came to Tokyo with the opening of futures markets for Japanese bond and stock indexes. In the early 1980s, Japanese companies began supplementing their ordinary earnings with the extraordinary profits derived from Zytec, financial engineering. In 1984, the Ministry of Finance permitted companies to operate special accounts for their shareholdings, known as Tokin accounts. These accounts allowed companies to trade securities without paying capital gains tax on their profits. 
Brokerages also offered a semi-legal service managing special speculative accounts for companies, known as Egyo Tokin, on which they guaranteed a minimum return above the current rate of interest. The game was fixed to ensure they would emerge winners. In 1985, just under 9 trillion yen was invested in Tokin funds. Four years later, the figure had risen to over 40 trillion yen, $300 billion. Zytec speculation was facilitated by Japanese companies' access to the euro bond market, the offshore capital market based in London. As part of the process of financial deregulation, in 1981 the Ministry of Finance gave Japanese companies permission to issue warrant bonds in the euro bond market. These financial instruments combined with conventional corporate bonds with an option, the warrant, to purchase shares in the company at a specified price before the expiry date, normally set five years after issue. Since Japanese share prices were rising sharply, increasing the value of the warrants, companies were able to issue bonds with very low interest payments. Warrant bonds were also attractive to their issuers for another reason. They were mostly issued in dollars that were subsequently exchanged in the swaps market for yen. Because the yen was expected to appreciate over the life of the loan, swapping a dollar liability for a yen liability could result in a negative interest payment by the company issuing the warrant bond. In other words, Japanese companies were actually paid to borrow money to finance their speculations. Money raised from warrant bond issues could either be invested directly in the stock market or placed in an Egyo Tokin account with a guaranteed return of 8%. Zytec was a game with no losers. In the second half of the 1980s, the profits from corporate speculation soared, along with the Japanese stock market. This created a dangerous circularity in the financial system. Zytec manufactured profits, causing share prices to rise, which further increased Zytec gains. By the end of the decade, most of the industrial companies listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange were engaging in Zytec. Over half the reported profits of the largest players, internationally renowned companies such as car manufacturers, Toyota and Nissan, and consumer electronics firms, Matsushita and Sharp, were derived from speculation. Total corporate gains from Tokin accounts rose from 240 billion yen, $2 billion, in the year to March 1985, to 952 billion yen, $7 billion, two years later. Few cared that during the same period ordinary operating profits actually declined. In certain cases, the speculative activities of companies came to dominate their business. A steel company named Hanwha, known as the Gnome of the East, raised over 4 trillion yen, $30 billion, in the late 1980s for Zytec, and its profits from speculation grew to exceed its earnings from ordinary trading activities by 20 times. Not all the new capital raised by Japanese companies in the late 1980s was poured into speculation. Warrant bonds also financed what has been described as the greatest wave of investments in productive capacity the world has ever seen. In the second half of the 1980s, capital investment in Japan amounted to $3.5 trillion, accounting for two-thirds of the country's economic growth. This massive burst of investment helped the Japanese economy pass through a difficult period when the stronger yen was causing both lower growth rates and declining returns on capital. Some commentators have suggested that the Ministry of Finance deliberately called into being the bubble economy in order to supply cheap capital for Japanese industry at this critical time. The capital expenditure of the bubble years created the illusion that Japan's economic miracle was continuing long after its real vigour had diminished, and produced a vast misallocation of resources into unproductive investments. By attempting to use speculation as a tool of economic policy, the mandarins of the finance ministry had opened a Pandora's box. The Land Standard The bubble economy, or baburu, as the Japanese called it, was first and foremost a property boom. Land holds a special position for the Japanese. 
Its ownership continued to convey status in a society not long released from feudal servitude. Japan is a mountainous country where development land is relatively scarce. There were other reasons for high Japanese land prices. Punitive capital gains taxes, designed by the bureaucrats to encourage long-termism, taxed short-term property gains at 150% of the profits. By discouraging the sale of land and creating an illiquid property market, the fiscal system actually stimulated land speculation. Some Western commentators even suggested that high property prices, which turned the Japanese, in the words of Sir Roy Denham, a former European commissioner, into a nation of workaholics living in rabbit hutches, were part of a covert government policy to encourage savings which could then be ploughed back into the industrial machine. Between 1956 and 1986, land prices increased 5,000%, while consumer prices merely doubled. During this period, in only one year, 1974, did land prices decline. Acting on the belief that land prices would never fall again, Japanese banks provided loans against the collateral of land rather than cash flows. Towards the end of the 1980s, they increased lending against property, especially to smaller companies. The rising value of land became the engine for the creation of credit in the whole economy. Tochihon Nisei, the land standard, had arrived. In early December 1987, at a meeting of the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, representatives from the world's central banks gathered to set new international standards for banking capital. Because Japanese banks were protected from failure by the Ministry of Finance, they had traditionally operated with a lower capital adequacy ratio, a safety cushion measured by the ratio of a bank's assets to its loans, than their Western counterparts. Foreign bankers were concerned that lower capital reserves gave Japanese banks an unfair competitive advantage in global banking and demanded that they conform to conventional international levels of banking capital. As a result, Japanese banks were obliged to raise their capital ratio to 8% by the spring of 1993. An important concession, however, was secured by the Japanese representatives at Basel. As part of the web of cross-shareholdings peculiar to the Japanese system, their banks owned a large number of shares in other companies. It was agreed that a certain proportion of the profits on these shareholdings could count towards Japanese banking capital. As a result of the Basel Agreement, Japanese banks' ability to increase credit, in other words, to manufacture money, became linked to the level of share prices in the Tokyo stock market. Everything else being equal, if the banks increased their property lending, the value of land and shares, Japanese companies were increasingly valued according to their property assets, would climb. Rising share prices would increase the value of the bank's cross-shareholdings, inflating their capital and enabling them to lend more. The world's central bankers had endorsed a circular arrangement by which credit creation could continue as long as stock prices rose. This was the fatal flaw of the bubble economy. The Plaza Accord In the mid-1980s, the economic policies of Japan were the opposite of those of the United States. Japan had a tight fiscal policy and a loose monetary policy, while America combined a tight monetary policy with a loose fiscal stance. High interest rates in the United States, intended by the Federal Reserve to keep inflation at bay, had the unwelcome effect of creating a strong dollar that hindered exports and increased the American trade deficit. American exporters noisily demanded assistance from their government. Since the dollar was overvalued and the yen undervalued, floating exchange rates should theoretically have solved the problem. In practice, they needed a little prompting. In September 1985, U.S. Treasury Secretary James Baker gathered the finance minister of the world's leading economic powers at the Plaza Hotel in Manhattan. Spurred on by Baker, the ministers agreed to act in concert to push down the value of the dollar in relation to other currencies, in particular the yen. A few months later, the dollar sank to under 150 yen, 
from an earlier high of 259. Viewed from another perspective, the purchasing power of the Japanese currency had risen by over 40%, and everything priced in dollars was that much cheaper to anyone with yen in his pockets. The great Japanese shopping spree, from Louis Vuitton handbags to Van Gogh paintings, was set to commence. There was, however, an immediate downside to the yen's appreciation. Ever since April 1949, when the American banker Joseph Dodge fixed the yen exchange rate against the dollar at 360, the Japanese currency had been consistently undervalued in the foreign exchanges. In the 1970s and early 1980s, higher rates of inflation in the United States than in Japan combined with a stable exchange rate to produce in real terms a continuous devaluation of the yen. This was of great assistance to Japanese exporters, the powerhouses behind the country's economic miracle. After the Plaza Accord, the situation changed. Japanese goods in the international marketplace were suddenly nearly twice as expensive. The threat to Japan's economy was palpable. In early 1986, as economic growth slipped below 2.5%, the talk was of Endaka Fukyo, the strong yen recession. Exporters warned of a hollowing out of the economy as the yen rose inexorably against the dollar. Urgent action was required, and Japanese companies looked to the all-powerful Ministry of Finance for a solution. The ministry, in turn, put pressure on the officially independent Bank of Japan to reduce interest rates in order to stimulate the economy. During 1986, the official discount rate was cut on four occasions until it reached 3%. Since the price of oil was falling and imported goods were cheaper due to the strong yen, the faster monetary growth that followed did not feed into consumer price inflation. Instead, the price of assets, land and shares, started to rise. By August 1986, the Nikkei index had reached 18,000, up nearly 40% since the start of the year. This sharp rise stimulated the public's interest in economic matters. A manga, comic book, on the Japanese economy, published by the Nihon Keizai Shimbun, Japan's leading financial newspaper, went to the top of the bestseller lists. At the end of the year, the Far Eastern Economic Review reported that, suddenly, stocks have become a national street-level preoccupation. Against the background of a rising market, the government launched its long-awaited flotation of Nippon Telephone and Telegraph, NTT, the national telephone company. In October 1986, an initial 200,000 shares in the company were offered to the Japanese public, at the time, foreigners were forbidden by NTT's articles from holding its shares. Within two months, nearly 10 million persons had applied for shares, even though the government had yet to announce the issue price. Popular demand was so strong that the shares had to be distributed by a special lottery. On the 2nd of February 1987, NTT's shares floated freely on the Tokyo Stock Exchange at a price of 1.2 million yen per share. In the first two days of trading, their price soared by 25%. At the end of February, the group of seven finance ministers meeting at the Louvre in Paris agreed to stop the dollar from sliding any further against the yen. Following this agreement, Japanese interest rates were cut to a post-war low of 2.5%, where they remained until May 1989. The effect on share prices was electrifying. Within a few weeks, NTT's share price was at 3.2 million yen, valuing it at over 200 times annual earnings. The telephone company's market capitalization was now more than 50 trillion yen, $376 billion, larger than the combined value of the West German and Hong Kong stock markets. Seeing the frenzy for NTT's shares, the company's chairman, Hisashi Shinto, remarked casually to a reporter, One day, people engaged in the money game are going to incur the wrath of God. The privatization of NTT was reminiscent of the South Sea subscriptions in 1720. Both privatizations were intended to improve the public finances. 
On each occasion, the public applied for shares before being informed of the price, and a speculative bubble followed, with both companies' share prices rising above rational levels. Most significantly, in 1720 and again in 1987, speculators were led to believe that the government would not allow the share price to fall. When the second tranche of NTT shares were issued in November 1987. The Japan Economic Journal observed that the popularity of NTT is attributed to individual investors' beliefs that since the government made the public offering, it would not inflict losses on the people. Individual investors consider they are buying Japan itself when they buy NTT shares, so they buy them without apprehension. When the Japanese stock market bounced back after the October crash, It was widely believed that political protection had been granted not just to NTT but to the stock market as a whole. Money politics. Japanese politicians were not solely guided by public duty in their desire to support the stock market. They also maintained a private interest in its continuing ascendancy. In Japan, the conduct of politics had become an expensive business. It was calculated that the annual expense of maintaining a seat in the Japanese Diet was around 400 million yen, three million dollars. Cash was the primary source of power in Japanese politics. It bound factions together, purchased ministerial seats, procured favors, and bought votes. In the style of Tammany Hall bosses in the Gilded Age, Japanese politicians looted the stock market to fill their own coffers. During elections, political shares (seiji kabu) were pushed by securities houses. This enabled politicians who had previously invested in them to take profits and pay their election expenses, after which the shares were allowed to decline. During the bubble years, shares became a supplementary currency for the conduct of the nation's money politics. This added further support to the notion that politicians would never allow the stock market to fall. The deep involvement of politicians in the stock market was revealed to the public by the Recruit Cosmos scandal. In June 1988, a minor public official in the city of Kawasaki resigned after he admitted using inside information to buy shares in Recruit Cosmos, the property subsidiary of a fast-growing employment agency. Recruit's chairman was an ambitious businessman named Hiromasa Ezue. Who had made extensive gifts of shares to a number of politicians, businessmen, and bureaucrats, in order to forestall planned legislation detrimental to the interests of his company. In late December 1988, Takahishi Hasegawa, the newly appointed Justice Minister brought in to investigate the recruit scandal, was forced to resign after only four days in office, when it was revealed that he had received shares in the company. The finance minister also stepped down. A few months later, the Prime Minister Nobuo Takeshita finally admitted to profiting by 150 million yen from the sale of Recruit Cosmos shares. Takeshita's political secretary, who had received the money on his master's behalf, hanged himself. The net gradually widened to catch other big fish, including former Prime Minister Nakasone, the chairman of NTT, and the president of a major newspaper, the Nihon Kezai Shimbun. By the summer of 1989, nearly 50 politicians, civil servants, businessmen, and journalists had been exposed by the scandal. Western commentators wondered whether crony capitalism might not be an apt description of the Japanese system. Recruit Cosmos was the greatest political scandal in post-war Japan. It showed political venality to be an integral aspect of the bubble economy. The rising stock market had initially reflected Japan's newfound feeling of economic prowess. The nation's growing self-confidence was appropriated by politicians for nationalistic purposes. Later, bureaucrats stimulated public speculation in order to assist Japanese companies in raising cheap capital during a difficult transitional period. A thriving stock market enabled the government to solve its fiscal problems. By selling shares in an overpriced telephone company to naive investors caught up in the euphoria of the bubble, in the background lurked the systemic corruption of Japan's money politics, which utilized speculation to service its fathomless financial demands.
Speculation ran amuck because no one in a position of power had any interest in controlling it. The Americans, who feared that Japan threatened an economic Pearl Harbor, were correct in one sense. The militaristic hubris that took Japan blindly into the Second World War found its counterpart in the speculative hubris of the bubble economy. History was repeating itself, except this time a stock market farce replaced the tragedy of war. Values in the Japanese stock market. During the late 1980s, Japanese share prices increased three times faster than corporate earnings, which included the unsustainable profits derived from Zytex speculation. The Tokyo stock market flaunted some of the most overvalued shares in history. The textile sector sold for an average of 103 times earnings, services companies for 112 times earnings, marine transportation businesses for 176 times earnings, and fishery and forestry firms for a staggering 319 times earnings. Japan Airlines, in the process of privatization, sold for over 400 times annual earnings. Western investors, who believed that such values were not justified, gradually reduced their Japanese shareholdings from the mid 1980s onwards. Their departure meant the market was no longer constrained by Western rationalism, with its dry reasoning of discounted cash flows and credit analysis. The Japanese, on the other hand, with their tendency to accept the version of reality disseminated by authority, had no trouble justifying the lofty values found in their stock market. A number of soothing explanations were given for high share prices. Japanese accounting practices understated real earnings, cross shareholdings inflated price earnings measures, and so on. Even the more conservative analysts, unmoved by claims that Japan was becoming the locomotive of world growth, or that an explosion in consumer demand was around the corner, nevertheless pointed to the weight of money argument to justify further advances in share prices. According to this idea, since interest rates remained low and the rising yen discouraged investors from taking their money abroad, the Japanese people were left with no alternative but to continue investing in the domestic stock market. This argument was reinforced by the abolition of tax exempt postal savings accounts in April 1988, which released over 300 trillion yen $2.25 trillion, for new investment. The massive flow of Japanese savings into the stock market, combined with the scarcity of shares, caused by a gradual increase in the level of cross shareholdings, became the most frequently cited explanation for stratospheric share prices. The prevalent disregard for the fundamentals of value during the bubble years showed itself in a variety of ways. Shares of companies in the same sectors moved together. Regardless of individual differences in earnings performance and prospects, the market rewarded increases in market share rather than rises in profitability. Some shares were hyped for no other reason than that they were affordable in relation to the multi million yen NTT share. Cheap shares, it was argued, would one day catch up with the more expensive ones. Stocks not only rose on new issues when the ownership rights of existing shares were diluted. They also climbed sharply when companies announced a bonus issue of shares, although by simply splitting its shares, the company did not create any real value. Shares continued rising despite the declining profitability of Japan's exporters and the hollowing out of its manufacturing base. When Emperor Hirohito died in January 1989, they rose. When a small earthquake hit Tokyo six months later, they also rose. Behind all the rationalizations for rising share prices lay the reality of an extraordinary real estate boom. Property prices climbed on an ever increasing supply of credit. Total bank lending increased by 96 trillion yen $724 billion, in the five years to March 1990. Over half this sum went to small businesses which invested heavily in the property sector. Loosely regulated consumer credit companies, the non banks, increased property loans from 22 trillion yen in 1985 to 80 trillion yen, $600 billion, by the end of 1989. On occasion, loans were provided for up to twice the collateral value of properties. As property prices climbed, 
the average lifetime earnings of a graduate salaryman, office worker, became insufficient to buy even a small apartment in central Tokyo. House buyers were forced to take out multi-generational hundred-year mortgages. By 1990, the total Japanese property market was valued at over 2,000 trillion yen, or four times the real estate value of the entire United States. The grounds of the Imperial Palace in Tokyo were estimated to be worth more than the entire real estate of California, or Canada, if you preferred. Low vacancy rates and the demand for office space from foreign financial institutions led to a building boom in Tokyo, where the number of cranes rising over the bay were eagerly counted. Analysts talked of the crane index. When NTT opened a high-tech skyscraper in central Tokyo, with offices at over $3,000 a square metre eagerly taken up by foreign bankers, it became known affectionately as the Tower of Bubble. With property in the Ginza district valued at 50 million yen a square metre, plans were hatched to build an underground city in Tokyo at a depth of 100 metres. Inflation in the property sector had a direct impact on the stock market. The search for companies' hidden assets which included both the value of land holdings and cross-shareholdings, became the fashionable pursuit of analysts. An economist at the University of Tokyo revived the Tobin-Q ratio, which examined the ratio of stock prices to the market value of company assets. Japanese companies appeared cheap by this measure, since by 1988 they had latent capital gains, or hidden assets, on their balance sheets worth 434 trillion yen, 3.3 trillion dollars above book value. In a reversal of a trend common to most speculative manias, the trading prospects of high-tech firms were ignored in favour of the property on their balance sheets. The brokers called them land plays. Even NTT was valued primarily for its land assets rather than as a telecommunications company. Propelled by its extensive land holdings, the market value of Tokyo Electric Power increased in 1986 by a greater value than that of all the stocks listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. All Nippon Airways, another land play, soared to a price-earnings ratio of nearly 1,200. More than three-quarters of the land owned by companies was kept for the purposes of capital appreciation. The Japanese corporation, with its cross-shareholdings and hidden land assets, had become a combination of investment trust and property company. In such circumstances, normal business activities were considered an irrelevance, or at worst, a drag on stock market values. Manipulation in the Japanese stock market Although there were many predictions of a Japanese stock market crash, most notably by George Soros, the hedge fund manager, in a Financial Times article on the 14th of October 1987. It was Tokyo that best weathered the global stock market crash a few days later. The day after the October crash, representatives of Japan's largest brokerages, Nomura, Daiwa, Yamaichi and Nikko Securities, collectively known as the Big Four, were summoned to the Ministry of Finance, they were ordered to make a market in NTT shares and keep the Nikkei average above the 21,000 level. Complying with this request, the brokers offered their most important clients guarantees against losses in order to encourage them to re-enter the market. Within a few months, the Nikkei had recovered its losses and was progressing to new heights. In private, Ministry of Finance officials boasted that manipulating the stock market was simpler than controlling the foreign exchanges. Among them, the Big Four accounted for over half the turnover of the Tokyo Stock Exchange. The most powerful of their number was Nomura Securities, which during the bubble years became the most profitable company in Japan and amassed liquid assets of over $400 billion. Nomura had five million loyal domestic customers, mainly Japanese housewives, who daily put their savings into special Nomura piggy banks, played stock market computer games on Nomura software, faithfully followed Nomura's stock tips, no sell recommendations were ever issued, and every week handed over their money to one of Nomura's thousands of salesmen. Every month Nomura staff were given a sales quota to fill, 
and every morning they were told which stocks to push. During the second half of the 1980s, around 8 million new investors entered the stock market, taking their total number to over 22 million. Although they owned only a small percentage of the market's total capitalization, the majority of shares being tied up in corporate cross-shareholdings, private investors bought and sold more than 100 billion shares each year. Encouraged to speculate by their brokers, private clients held a third of their stocks in margin accounts. Despite a traditional horror of gambling, which they see as a Chinese vice, two related national characteristics made the Japanese particularly susceptible to the lure of the stock market. First, they have a tendency to exhibit herd-like behaviour when pursuing a certain activity, whether at work or at play. This was said to stem from the communal demands of rice farming, which had fostered a national shudankisuke ishiki, group consciousness. During the war, Japan was portrayed in government propaganda as 100 million hearts beating as one. After the October crash, the president of a securities house boasted that Japan had survived the period of volatility because it was a consensus society, a nation that likes to move in one direction. Second, the Japanese psyche is particularly prone to mood swings, shifting abruptly between elation and despair. These national weaknesses were exploited ruthlessly by brokers, who pushed a series of stock market themes which provided the focal points for speculation. The speculative crowd blindly pursued the Red Lantern, Akaicho Chin, shares that were enticingly placed before them. The most prominent theme was the redevelopment of Tokyo Bay, which highlighted the property potential of many companies. It was followed by a series of stories hyping untried technologies, such as linear motor trains, superconductivity, cold nuclear fusion, and miracle cancer cures. After a Kobe prostitute died of AIDS in early 1987, there was a fever of interest in condom stocks. Despite the fact that three-quarters of Japanese adults already used rubber contraceptives, oral contraception being forbidden, the share price of Sagami Rubber Industries quadrupled. When Nippon Meatpackers was rumoured to have extracted an anti-AIDS agent from chicken bile, its shares rocketed. Perhaps in anticipation of safe-sex alternatives, shares in pornographic film companies also climbed during the AIDS scare. In a report entitled Theme Chasing, the Engine of the Tokyo Stock Market, an American investment bank advised its clients, a herd instinct is a sound survival instinct in an environment of excess liquidity. Through their large shareholdings in the press, the big four brokers were able to manipulate the information available to their clients. During their weekly meetings, the same brokers were said to collude in choosing which shares to promote. As the stock market itself was awash with rumours and tips, brokers found their clients highly susceptible to manipulation. In the words of the Far Eastern Economic Review, the Tokyo Stock Exchange was the most cynical, speculative and manipulable stock market in the world. Despite the inexorable rise of the market, the average private client made little money. He remained an outsider, fodder for the brokers and their favoured clients. Churn and burn was said to be Nomura's unwritten motto. Many private investors placed their money in investment trusts run by affiliates of the large brokerages. These trusts were churned mercilessly for commissions and produced average annual returns of less than 4% in the late 1980s, at a time when the market was rising by over 20% per annum. The only reliable way to make money during the bubble was on the inside. Favoured clients, bankers, bureaucrats, politicians, rich individuals, and even Yakuza, gangsters, were informed beforehand which stocks the brokers intended to push. Brokers guaranteed the investment returns of insiders and compensated them for losses. Favoured clients who had lost heavily in the market were supplied with ambulance shares, stocks certain to rise, to heal their financial wounds. Since brokers habitually pushed stocks prior to the announcement of new shares issues, the information that a company was under financing became a license to print money. Although there was a law against insider trading, no one paid any attention to it. 
The Speculator's Web The Japanese economic system was sometimes described as an example of network capitalism, with an iron triangle of politicians, bureaucrats and corporations at its core. The bubble economy produced its own alternative network, with speculator groups, gangster organizations, banks, stockbrokers and politicians joined together in the common pursuit of speculative profits. Since the majority of shares were tied up in long-term cross-shareholdings between companies and banks, it was relatively simple to manipulate share prices and corner stocks. A Tokyo Stock Exchange report claimed that one in ten listed companies was cornered between April 1987 and March 1989. Greenmail, the practice of buying into companies and demanding to be bought out at a premium, became increasingly common. Although Al Capone is reported to have avoided the stock market because he thought it a racket, the Japanese Yakuza gangster of the 1980s was less fastidious. During this period, the Inagawa Kai, Japan's second-largest crime syndicate, was run by Susuma Ishii, a tall, distinguished-looking man with elegant manners and a reputation for intellectualism, uncommon among brash Japanese gangsters who generally favoured loud pinstripe suits and large American cars. Having recently completed a six-year prison sentence for illegal gambling activities, Ishii was seeking to reduce his gang's dependence on its traditional sources of income, derived from drug-running, brothels, protection money and pachinko, pinball halls. The bubble provided him with the perfect opportunity. In early 1985, Ishii founded a real estate company, Hokusho Sangyo. This company was supplied with loans and loan guarantees by a large trucking firm, whose president was linked to the powerful faction leader Shin Kanemaru, the don of Japanese politics. Having provided himself with the necessary funds and political protection, Ishii began his ambitious speculations, funneling around 170 billion yen, $1.3 billion, into the stock market. He built up large positions in a variety of concerns, including Tokyo Gas, Nippon Steel, and Nomura Securities. In 1987, his investment vehicle had earnings of over 12 billion yen, a 50-fold increase on the previous year. He commissioned a new headquarters on land costing 15 million yen, $113,000 a square metre, and spent an estimated 10 billion yen, $7.5 million, on paintings by Renoir, Chagall, Monet and others. In the spring of 1989, Ishii attempted to corner the stock of the Tokyo Corporation, a large railway and hotels business. For this move, he received the assistance of two of the big four brokerages, Nikko and Nomura, which lent him 36 billion yen, $270 million, on the security of Tokyu's shares. The fact that Tokyu was also a Nomura client does not appear to have bothered the broker. Between April and November 1989, Ishii bought 29 million shares in Tokyu. Two-thirds of these supplied by Nomura and Nikko, while the remainder came from a shady Korean businessman, Ho Chung Yong, who was connected with Japan's largest crime syndicate, the Yamaguchi Gumi, and later became the central figure in the Itoman art fraud scandal. In the course of the operation, Tokyo's share price doubled. Ishii became the model for the corporate gangster or economic yakuza who emerged during the late 1980s. In a society where public confrontation is a source of acute embarrassment, the yakuza used their powers of intimidation to muscle into every area of the bubble economy. They joined in many stock market corners and green mailing operations, borrowed heavily from financial institutions, especially from the non-bank affiliates of the major banks, and acted as loan sharks to other speculators. Gangsters were also active in the property market, where jiageya, as they were called, intimidated smallholders into selling their properties by threatening them with firebomb attacks. Occasionally the game turned nasty. In the summer of 1985, a Nomura branch manager was beaten to death by gangsters who had sustained losses in a biotech speculation. Three years later, the body of the president of Cosmo Securities, a well-known speculator and greenmailer, was discovered encased in concrete. 
he had been murdered by Yakuza associates. Outside Yakuza circles, there were an estimated 40 powerful speculator groups, which maintained interests in some 200 companies. Half a dozen professional speculators, Shite Suji, were rumored to control shareholdings worth more than $5 billion apiece. The most prominent and powerful of these was Mitsuhiro Kotani, a self-made hotel and golf course operator and head of the Koshin Speculator Group. Towards the end of the decade, Kotani undertook a number of bold stock market operations, ramping, cornering and greenmailing. Working closely with another leading speculator, Akira Kato, head of the Seibi Speculator Group, Kotani lured politicians, company directors, Yakuza and bank executives into his speculative web. Kotani's modus operandi was to exchange stock tips for favours. Before ramping Janome sewing machine, he provided inside information to Toshiyuki Iwamura, a leading member of the ruling Liberal Party and former head of the Environment Agency. In return for bank loans of 15 billion yen, $112 million, he leaked the same information to employees and customers of Mitsui Trust. For his assault on Kokusai Kogyo, an aerial survey firm, he received the support of four directors of the firm, to whom he lent money to buy Kokusai's stock. In exchange for a loan of 100 million yen, Kotani gave inside information to a leading businessman, Hirotomo Take, the head of the Chisan group of companies, and former president of a leading newspaper, the Yomiuri Shimbun. An aide to the former prime minister, Yasuhiro Nakasone, was also brought in on the deal. Kotani then turned to a branch manager of Sumitomo Bank, who persuaded some of his bank's clients to provide Kotani with loans of over 20 billion yen, $150 million, to finance the deal. The unofficial lenders were offered high rates of interest, and the bank manager received a generous commission. Having successfully taken control of Kokusai Kogyo, Kotani found himself weighed down with debts. He attempted to solve his problems by manipulating the stock of a holiday tour company, Fujita Tourist Enterprises. For this operation, he demanded a 30 billion yen, $224 million loan from the Janome Sewing Machine Company, on whose board he sat. When Janome's president demurred, he was told that two hitmen had been employed, in case the money was not forthcoming. Kotani also threatened to sell his own stake in Janome to gangsters. The president soon capitulated. Janome supplied the money and assumed responsibility for a further 187 billion yen, $1.4 billion, of Kotani's debts. To mark his absolute authority, Kotani placed orders for Fujita shares from the Janome boardroom and sent out the company's executives on his stock market errands. He proceeded to manipulate Fujita's stock by placing buy and sell orders through a number of brokers at escalating prices. In late April 1990, Fujita's share price shot up from 3,700 to 5,200. Once again, Kotani received insider assistance from an employee of his victim. He was also supported by two construction companies, one of which contracted to buy the shares at their peak. More than any other individual, Kotani showed how easily traditional Japanese networks could be redirected for speculative purposes. The Bubble Lady Since speculative manias tend to undermine established structures, it was fitting that in this male-dominated society the greatest private speculator should have been a woman. Born in 1930 into a poor family, Nui Onue began her working life as a waitress in the entertainment district of Osaka, Japan's second city. Later she became the mistress of a construction company executive, who helped her purchase two restaurants in the mid-1960s. For the following twenty years, Mrs. Onoue ran her restaurants without attracting notice. Then, one spring day in 1987, she entered an Osaka branch of the Industrial Bank of Japan and purchased over a billion yen's worth of the bank's discount bonds. Mrs. Onoue proceeded to borrow nearly three trillion yen, $23 billion, a sum roughly 1,500 times the value of her restaurants, which she invested in the stock market. 
She soon became the largest individual shareholder in a number of blue chip companies, including the Industrial Bank of Japan and Daiichi Kanyo Bank. She also took large stakes in Sumitomo Bank, Daiwa Bank, and NTT. Each shareholding was used as collateral for bank loans, which enabled her to buy more shares. Banks and brokerages fell over each other to do business with the bubble lady. Despite rumours of her gangster connections and Burakumin low caste origins, Mrs. Onoue's restaurant was visited by many leading financiers, including the president of the revered Industrial Bank of Japan. Yamaichi Securities even kept an employee in permanent residence at the restaurant. Unsurprisingly, this attention soon went to her head. She became an inveterate name dropper, ordered senior bank executives around like servants, and telephoned junior staff in the middle of the night to command their immediate attendance. Known as the Dark Lady of Osaka, Mrs. Onowa was a member of Mikyo, an obscure Buddhist cult. Once a week, she held an all night seance in her restaurant, summoning the spirits to assist her speculations. Brokers were expected to attend these seances or risk losing her business. At dawn, she would inform them of the names of the companies revealed to her. In the heady days of the bubble, such behaviour was accepted without question. With a fortune rumoured at half a trillion yen, she liked to boast that, with money, all is possible. A New Golden Age The bubble economy promoted a massive increase in consumer expenditure as the Japanese people forswore their post war frugality. Rising asset prices, producing what economists term the wealth effect, combined with the stronger yen to stimulate a craze for foreign luxury imports. Cuts in income taxes increased personal spending power. Encouraged by low interest rates, people took out fresh loans against the equity of their homes. Credit card circulation increased almost threefold, and consumer debt per head rose to American levels. The consumers of the bubble economy were known as the Shinjinrui, the new people, to distinguish them from their hard working, low spending, and long suffering forebears. The Shinjinrui eschewed traditional fare as a gurumi boomer, gourmet boom, arrived in Tokyo. New French restaurants served up foie gras, foie gras, and omar à la moricaine, actually fried shrimps. Like the flappers of the 1920s, the female Shinjinrui displayed a taste for shorter skirts and greater sexual display in their attire as part of the new bodycon, body conscious cult. They drank Moscow mule cocktails, despised salarymen for being dasai, styleless, spent their evenings in nightclubs, and consumed drugs, especially cocaine and ecstasy. An English stockbroker in Tokyo lamented that the Japanese wouldn't realize their shares were overvalued. As long as they continued paying three hundred dollars for a glass of whiskey flavored water in Ginza nightclubs. Seibu Seizon, the department store group owned by Seiji Tsutsumi, the brother of Japan's richest property owner, became a mecca for the Shinjinrui. Long before the emergence of the bubble, Tsutsumi had anticipated a change in national taste and had coined the term oishi sekatsu, delicious life, to market imported foreign luxuries. In the autumn of 1984, Seibu opened a new department store in the exclusive Ginza shopping district, selling designer clothes by Yves Saint Laurent, Hermes, Gianfranco Ferre, and others. The store's greatest novelty lay on the eighth floor, where shoppers could buy shares, precious metals, and property. Other department stores soon followed suit. Sutsumi also opened a new hotel at No. 1 Ginza. Whose decadent opulence might have made a robber baron blush. Its most expensive suite, supposedly modelled on the bedroom of the French actress Catherine Deneuve, contained a canopied bed covered with a silver fox quilt. Guests were offered a choice of seven stuffings for their pillows, including artificial pearls. The hotel's chef came from one of Tokyo's best French restaurants, and its cellars were stocked with the finest French wines. Funny Monet, the bubble in the art market. The art world of the 1980s was subject to the increasingly aggressive behaviour of its leading auction houses. 
Under new management since 1983, Sotheby's in particular worked hard to stimulate the demand for fine art. Potential customers were bombarded with glossy in-house magazines, and lavish parties were thrown to launch major sales. Sotheby's provided loans to buyers, the so-called art equity loan, guaranteed prices to sellers, and at times bought pictures for its own inventory. The auction house also went to great lengths to emphasise the investment potential of art, and published its own art market index, which recorded price changes in the different collecting fields. According to the art critic Robert Hughes, the creation of confidence in the investment properties of art during the 1980s became the cultural artefact of the last half of the 20th century. In fact, there was little new about art as an investment. Towards the end of the 19th century, Henry Clay Frick, the American steel baron and art collector, observed with great satisfaction that. Even during possession, some paintings were seen to increase, sometimes a hundred, a thousandfold, more rapidly than the certificates of the best managed joint stock companies. Unlike stocks, however, paintings have no theoretical value; they produce no cash flows, no dividend yields, or price earnings ratios to help collectors distinguish between prudent investment and rash speculation. Once a price for an artist's work has been established at auction, it sets the benchmark for all future valuations. As Hughes observed, art's prices are determined by the meeting of real or induced scarcity with pure irrational desire, and nothing is more manipulable than desire. In the 1980s, the combination of ambitious Western auctioneers promoting art with every trick in the book and Japanese speculators. Their wallets swollen with bubble profits created the most extravagant art market on record. It was only after the appreciation of the yen following the Plaza Accord that Japanese collectors became the dominant force in the global art market. In 1986, the dollar value of Japanese foreign art imports quadrupled. Their purchases became headline news in the spring of 1987, when a Japanese insurance company, Yasuda Fire and Marine. Paid just under forty million dollars for Van Gogh's sunflowers, a figure nearly three times greater than had ever before been paid for a painting. The global stock market crash a few months later actually increased the demand for art, since Japanese investors became wary of international stocks. In the week after the crash, the world's most expensive diamond for six point four million dollars, and the world's most expensive printed book. The Estelle Dohini Gutenberg Bible for five point nine million dollars were sold at auction. In both cases, the purchasers were Japanese. The art market became progressively hotter, with the fifteen months from October nineteen eighty eight to January nineteen ninety described as the most sensational that the art world has ever seen. Among the many trophies shipped to Japan during this period was Picasso's Les Noces de Pierrette. An unfinished painting from the artist's blue period, picked up for fifty-one point four million dollars by a flamboyant property dealer by the name of Tomonori Tsurumaki, a man given to lavishing ten thousand dollar tips on art dealers. In December nineteen eighty-nine, Sotheby's published the Million Dollar List, which revealed that during the previous month, nearly sixty works had sold for more than five million dollars each. And a further three hundred paintings had fetched more than one million dollars apiece. The art world called it the billion dollar binge. A few months later, Ryoe Saito, a paper manufacturer, bid eighty-two point five million dollars for Van Gogh's portrait of Dr. Gachet, and seventy-eight million for Renoir's Au Moulin de la Galette. Saito even picked up a Renoir sculpture for a mere one point six million dollars, as he said, for my backyard. By the end of the decade, it was calculated that the price of French impressionist paintings had risen by more than twentyfold over the previous fifteen years. During the same period, the Dow Jones Industrial Average had not even doubled. Henry Frick's observation on the investment potential of art appeared to hold true. Japanese art collectors were unsophisticated. A painting had to convey wealth and exclusivity. And above all, be easily recognisable. While the Shinjin Rui kept to their bubble designers such as Versace and Armani, 
The Japanese art speculators remained faithful to their brand painters, mostly French Impressionists and Post-Impressionists. When asked why he had spent over $300 million on late 19th century French paintings, Yasumichi Morishita, a moneylender known in his trade as the Pit Viper, replied, Impressionist paintings go better with modern décor. This simple taste for iconic works both reduced the demands of connoisseurship, opening the market to all comers, and ensured that the speculative fervour remained concentrated, thus helping to promote the prices of selected artists. Masahiko Sawada, a car dealer turned gallery owner, once boasted to an arts magazine that he personally controlled the prices of Renoir. Finance companies provided margin loans for up to half the value of the artworks. Maruko, a real estate company, offered part shares in paintings. La Juive, a painting by Amedeo Modigliani, was valued at $12 million and divided into lots of $100,000. Maruko also set up a $5 billion yen fund to buy works by Picasso, Chagall, Renoir and other masters. A spokesman for the company said that the fund's members, drawn from its established clientele of condominium and real estate speculators, don't particularly care about the identity of the artist when deciding to purchase a share in a work of art. What they want is not a painting, but a capital gain. Paintings were also used as collateral to raise loans to buy shares and property. They became a branch of Zytec, another financial instrument for the bubble age. The Golf Club Membership Craze The confusion of investment with consumption that typified the art world in the second half of the 1980s was even more pronounced with Japanese golf club memberships. Played by nearly a third of all salarymen, golf was an important feature of the Shain Ryoko, company outing. The game had acquired a ritualized significance in Japan. The different ranks of prestige accorded to golf clubs allowed members to display their hierarchic status, while businessmen, politicians and bureaucrats used their time at the club to expand their jinmyaku, network of connections, which formed an integral part of social and professional life. Since golf clubs were owned by their members, when land prices soared in the 1980s, the property rights of club membership became increasingly attractive. In early 1982, the Nihon Keizai Shimbun launched the Nikkei Golf Membership Index, calculated from the average membership prices at 500 clubs. From a base of 100, the golf index reached 160 at the end of 1985. It doubled in the year after the Plaza Accord, suffered a correction in February 1987, but recovered to reach a peak of just under 1,000 in the spring of 1990. The golf index became a leading indicator for the illiquid Japanese property market. During the bubble, the cost of joining Tokyo's exclusive Kogane Country Club, restricted to Japanese males over 35 years of age, climbed from 100 million yen to 400 million yen, $2.7 million. Over 20 clubs cost more than $1 million to join. The total value of memberships in Japan was estimated at around $200 billion. The secondary market in golf club memberships was supported by a hundred registered and several hundred unofficial brokers, who received a 2% commission on transactions. Brokers also solicited subscriptions for new clubs, of which over a thousand were under construction in the late 1980s. Banks provided margin loans of up to 90% against the collateral of membership certificates. These certificates were also used to raise money to invest in the stock market. The golf craze spread abroad. Japanese property developers bought most of the golf courses in Hawaii and started planning many more. In September 1980, Cosmo World, a middling property company, purchased the Pebble Beach Resort of Hotels and Golf Courses in California for $831 million, a record-breaking sum that attracted a lot of attention from the Japan is buying up the United States doom-mongers. The booming art and golf markets, with their brokers, shares, market indexes, margin loans, corrections and corners, parodied the manipulated and overpriced Japanese stock market. 
Both the art and golf markets involved a speculation in status as well as money. By combining the acquisition of status, Veblen's trophies of conspicuous consumption, with the frenzied desire for material improvement, the Japanese speculator resembled his 17th century forebear. Van Gogh's sunflowers became the Semper Augustus tulips for a modern era. Towards the end of the decade, the bubble's explosive growth was viewed with growing concern in certain circles. The Japanese saw themselves as a cohesive society of middle-class citizens. Yet rising asset prices and the unevenly divided spoils of speculation created egregious disparities of wealth. The fortunes of the richest fifth of the population quadrupled during the bubble years, while those of the poorest fifth actually declined. The new ricci, nouveau riche, with their fortunes in stocks or property, had a counterpart in the new poor. Moreover, it appeared that most of the bubble's profits accrued to insiders, while outsiders shouldered all the losses. Thus the myth of classlessness was undermined. In the manner of traditional Western criticisms of speculation, the bubble was seen as eroding the work ethic by severing the connection between labour and reward. The Xinjin Rui, with their taste for luxury and credit, were increasingly resented by the older generation of frugal workaholics. In the type of language normally reserved for decadent Westerners, a Japanese research institute denounced the Shinjin Rui as Epicurean egoists. Through their acts of speculation, the new people of the bubble economy were subverting the established social hierarchy, just as in the 1690s the moneyed men of Exchange Alley had weakened a feudal order based on the ownership of land. The social consequences of the bubble economy were not intended by the authorities, who, when they belatedly decided to prick the bubble, did so more for reasons of social control than for fear of its harmful economic side effects. The speculator had shown himself to be a narikin, a person without rank in the hierarchy of Japanese society. He posed a danger to the delicate structure of the system. Eventually, it became necessary to remove him. The End of the Bubble as 1989 drew to a close, the Nikkei index was approaching the 40,000 mark, up 27% on the year and nearly 500% on the decade. The price-earnings ratio of the stock market was at 80 times historic earnings, having peaked at 90 in 1987. Shares yielded a measly 0.38% in dividends and sold for six times their book value. During 1989, shares worth 386.4 trillion yen, 2.9 trillion dollars, changed hands, with daily turnover averaging around a billion shares. Outstanding margin loans approached 9 trillion yen, 67 billion dollars, an eightfold increase since 1980. The last year of the decade had also witnessed some of Japan's most ambitious foreign acquisitions. Mitsubishi bought Rockefeller Center in Manhattan for over $1 billion, and Sony invaded Hollywood with its $3.4 billion purchase of Columbia Pictures. Nomura Securities was forecasting that the Nikkei would reach 80,000 by 1995. Even the normally skeptical Far Eastern Economic Review was predicting another excellent year for 1990. Its analysis, however, overlooked a significant detail. At the end of the year, the governor of the Bank of Japan, Satoshi Sumida, a man seen by many as an ineffectual Ministry of Finance stooge, was replaced by Yasushi Mieno, a career central banker who liked to boast in public that he had never owned a share. Governor Mieno's personal mission was to prick the bubble. On Christmas Day 1989, he ordered another raise in the official discount rate, following an earlier increase in May. Four days later, the Nikkei reached its all-time peak. The Japanese stock market did not collapse with a sudden jolt. There was no repeat of the two Octobers, 1929 and 1987. Instead, it gently let out air like a balloon left over from a Christmas party. By the end of January 1990, the Nikkei index had fallen 2,000 points. 
Although many Japanese blamed the decline on short selling by foreigners in the stock futures market that had opened the previous summer, its real cause was a sharp tightening of monetary conditions. As property prices continued rising in the early part of 1990, Governor Mieno, who publicly expressed a desire to see property prices fall by the curiously precise figure of 20%, lifted interest rates a further five times until they reached 6% in August 1990. With the yield on long-term bonds above 7%, compared to the average stock yield of under 0.5%, the Japanese stock market had nothing left to support it. Having manipulated the market on the way up, the mandarins at the Ministry of Finance attempted with less success to control its descent. In early February, the margin requirement on stocks was reduced from 70 to 50 percent. Yet a few days later, on the 21st of February, the Nikkei fell a further 1,200 points. A month later, the big four brokers, under pressure from the finance ministry, agreed not to make any further issues of shares or warrant bonds until the market recovered. Shortly after, the Nikkei dipped below 30,000 for the first time in two years, and the total capitalization of the Tokyo Stock Exchange fell behind that of New York. The authorities continued their efforts to support the stock market. Brokers were ordered to purchase stocks when the Nikkei fell below 20,000 in September 1990. Margin requirements were reduced to 30%. Life insurers were instructed to stop selling shares. The ban on new share issues was extended. Funds were diverted from public pension funds and postal savings account into the stock market. And a number of accounting scams were introduced to discourage institutional shareholders from selling stocks. Brokers derisively referred to these efforts as the price-keeping operation. They had little effect on the stock market, which revived briefly in October 1990, in a movement known as the Dead Cat Bounce, and then continued sliding until it hit a low of 14,309 in August 1992, a decline of more than 60% from its peak. As the Japanese authorities refused to allow the prices of stocks and property to sink low enough to find their clearing level, the point at which buyers equaled sellers, they frustrated the market's ability to clear away its own excesses, what Schumpeter called creative destruction. Instead of alleviating the problems, the authorities' mismanagement succeeded only in drawing out the painful aftermath of the bubble. As we have seen, the same accusation has been directed at President Hoover's policies of the early 1930s. No longer were Western economics texts filled with wonder for the Japanese system and fulsome praise for its all-powerful ministries. In the summer of 1990, the corruption that had simmered away during the bubble years burst forth in a series of financial scandals. Nomura and Nikko Securities became enmeshed in a scandal concerning the compensation of corporate clients for losses in their Egyo Tokin accounts, the speculative service run by brokerages for corporate clients, which provided a guaranteed rate of return. Although officially illegal, these accounts had been privately sanctioned by the finance ministry. Their existence was symptomatic of a system which favoured insiders. Such arrangements became less acceptable after the stock market went into decline. Once again, a scapegoat was needed to purge the collective sins of the community. In June 1990, Yoshihisa Tabuchi, president of the mighty Nomura, was forced to resign for his firm's role in the loss compensation scandal. It was the first of many ritualistic resignations in the financial world, intended to appease a vengeful public. The following year, it emerged that several brokers had avoided reporting losses by shifting them illicitly from one client's account to another, a practice known as tobashi. This time Daiwa and Cosmo Securities were implicated, and their presidents obliged to step down. In the summer of 1991, Fuji Bank was implicated in the forgery of certificates of deposit, credit notes, worth 260 billion yen. At around the same time, Mrs. Onoue was arrested, after it was discovered that she had obtained 342 billion yen, $2.6 billion, worth of forged certificates of deposit from an employee of a small Osaka bank, 
and had used the forgeries to obtain loans from the Industrial Bank of Japan. In late October 1991, the chairman of IBJ resigned. A few months earlier, Mrs. Onoue had been declared bankrupt, thereby making the transition from being Japan's largest private investor to its greatest individual debtor. Other leading speculators were also brought down by the deflation of the bubble. In 1992, Mitsuhiro Kotani was declared bankrupt, with debts of 250 billion yen, $1.9 billion, having already been indicted for extorting money from Janome Sewing Machine Company. Subsequently, he received an 18-month suspended sentence for the naked manipulation of Fujita's shares, although the court declared that securities companies were partly responsible for his crime. By the time Kotani's web of speculation was fully unravelled, a high-ranking politician had been sent to jail, the presidents of two leading banks had been forced to resign, and several dozen others, among them politicians, gangsters, company directors and stock market operators, had been implicated in his criminal operations. Public disgrace also came to Sumitomo Bank, the most profitable Japanese bank in the late 1980s. Driven by its ambitious chairman, Ichiro Isoda, known as the Emperor, Sumitomo had taken the values of the bubble economy to its core, massively expanding its loans to the property sector and using token accounts to enhance profits. The bank was deeply involved with Itoman, a trading company run by a former Sumitomo employee. When Itoman was enveloped in a scandal concerning forged painting valuations, illegal share support operations and gangster-related property deals, Sumitomo was forced to bail it out at a cost of more than $2 billion. The bank was also linked to the gangster boss Susumu Ishii, after it was revealed that a Sumitomo branch manager had persuaded clients to make loans to Ishii to finance his failed corner of the Tokyo Corporation. Isoda took responsibility for this scandal and resigned in October 1990. For Sumitomo, the bubble's painful legacy continued. In 1994, Yakuza murdered a Sumitomo manager in an affair connected with failed speculations, and the following year the bank reported losses of 280 billion yen, $2.1 billion, as a result of bad loans made during the bubble years. Cosmo World's acquisition of Pebble Beach, in which Itoman had taken a stake, also turned sour. In early 1992, the company sold the California Golf Resort for a loss of more than $300 million. By then, the golf membership index had sunk nearly 50% from its peak. As the trade in golf memberships diminished, many golf brokers went under. Cancellations from hard-up members brought demands for refunds that exceeded 10 trillion yen, $75 billion in total. But many golf course developers had frittered away subscription funds in the stock market and now declared themselves bankrupt. Scandals soon emerged. The Ibaraki Country Club was raided by police after having sold nearly 60,000 memberships instead of an authorised 2,000. Likewise, the Gatsby Golf Club, with its fateful allusion to the 1920s high life, was found to have illegally increased memberships by 15 times its prescribed limit. It was also discovered that the gangster Ishii had raised 38 billion yen, $285 million, by selling fraudulent memberships in the Iwama Country Club, although this was a public golf course with no private membership rights. The art market suffered a similar fate. Numerous Japanese art dealers were convicted of crimes, ranging from tax evasion to racketeering. After Itoman collapsed in October 1990, it emerged that its property subsidiary had purchased thousands of paintings whose valuation papers had been forged. These paintings had been used as collateral for fresh loans in an attempt to circumvent the rules restricting loans to property. The leading art speculators ran into trouble. In March 1992, Masahiko Sawada, the man who tried to corner Renoir, was declared bankrupt with debts of over $600 million. His 2,000 paintings were appropriated by a bankruptcy court. Yasumichi Morishita's gallery, Asuka International, 
closed in 1994, and its collection of paintings, once valued at 30 billion yen, was taken by creditors. Because finance companies did not wish to realise losses on their loans by selling depreciated paintings, they crated them and stored them away from the public eye. As a result, many famous pictures simply disappeared. When the National Gallery in Washington attempted to borrow Picasso's Les Noces de Pierrette for an exhibition in 1997, the museum was unable to locate either the painting or its current owner. Decline and Fall – The Collapse of the Japanese Banking System The dream that Tokyo would emerge as a global financial capital declined along with share prices. Several large American companies, including General Motors, delisted from the Tokyo Stock Exchange. After turnover in the stock market ebbed to a tenth of its bubble peak, several foreign investment banks sold their seats on the exchange. Many of the famous Japanese overseas investments, including Mitsubishi's stake in Rockefeller Center, were put up for sale at knockdown prices. After the nationalistic hubris of the bubble years, Japan was in full retreat. The Japanese economy headed towards recession. Enormous capital expenditure, the product of cheap capital during the bubble years, had saddled the country with excess productive capacity. Consumer spending, the other great prop of the bubble economy, declined as the wealth effect reversed direction. The government announced a succession of fiscal boosts to stimulate the economy and revive the stock market. Monetary policy, having been kept too tight for too long, was also loosened. The official discount rate was successively cut until in September 1995 it reached an all-time low of 0.5%. The rate remained unchanged until September 1998 when it was cut to 0.25%. Shortly after, foreign banks began offering negative interest rates on their yen deposits. In other words, Japanese depositors paid for the privilege of lending their money to overseas banks, which they considered safer than their own. Yet low interest rates failed to bring the market to life. As Keynes had observed during the Great Depression, in deflationary conditions monetary policy was no more effective than pushing on a piece of string. By late 1992, property prices in central Tokyo had fallen 60% from their peak. A banking crisis, caused by the bank's excessive exposure to the falling property market, loomed. At the time, analysts suggested that their bad debts might be as high as 60 trillion yen, $450 billion. Property prices continued falling throughout the middle of the decade, with commentators warning ominously of a debt deflationary spiral similar to that of America in the 1930s. In August 1995, Japan experienced its first bank run of the post-war period, when depositors withdrew 60 billion yen from a stricken Tokyo credit union, Cosmo Shinyo. This was followed shortly after by a run on a large Osaka credit union and the collapse of Hyogo, a small bank in earthquake-struck Kobe, which became the first listed bank to fail in half a century. Lines of panic-stricken depositors jostling for place in front of tearful cashiers summoned up remembrance of earlier, seemingly less stable periods in the history of capitalism. Towards the end of 1995, the government was obliged to bail out several housing loan companies known as Jusen, whose losses of 6.4 trillion yen, $48 billion, came largely from gangster-related lending. In November 1996, the authorities allowed Hanwha Bank to go to the wall. Twelve months later, Sanyo Securities became the first Japanese brokerage to fail since the Second World War. It was followed in the middle of November 1997 by the closure of Hokkaido Takushoku Bank, Japan's tenth largest bank. On the 21st of November, Moody's, the U.S. credit ratings agency, downgraded the debt of Yamaichi, one of the big four brokers. Yamaichi was rumoured to have concealed losses offshore. Rapidly, the broker lost the confidence of the market and was unable to roll over its short-term debt. On the 23rd of November 1997, exactly a hundred years after its foundation, Yamaichi Securities announced its closure. 
with estimated liabilities of 3,200 billion yen, $24 billion, it was the largest bankruptcy in Japanese history. A few days later, a Japanese stockbroker threw himself from the top of a Tokyo skyscraper. According to the newspaper reports, he had been unable to live with losses caused by Yamaichi's collapse. Nine years after the collapse of the bubble economy, Japan teetered on the brink of a systemic collapse. Its banking system weighed down with bad debts of an uncertain magnitude, its companies reporting record losses, and its consumers too frightened to spend. As the stock market declined, the bank's capital base, composed in part of the profits on their shareholdings in other companies, shrank. The hidden assets of the 1980s became the hidden losses of the 1990s. When the Nikkei briefly touched 13,000 in October 1998, it was estimated that among Japan's 19 leading banks, losses on cross-shareholdings had reached 5 trillion yen, $38 billion. In September 1998, Standard & Poor's, the U.S. ratings agency, estimated that bad loans in the banking system were around 150 trillion yen, $1.1 trillion, despite write-offs totaling billions of yen in the intervening years. The resulting credit contraction threatened to deprive firms of working capital. By this date, the post-bubble revulsion against stocks was so complete that over 60% of Japanese personal assets were committed to cash, bearing interest of less than 0.5% per annum. The Crisis of the Japanese System The Japanese bubble economy conflated notable features from several past speculative manias. The art and golf market booms recall the Dutch tulip speculations of the 1630s. Just as the first financial revolution produced a speculative boom in the 1690s, so the bubble economy of the 1980s was partly the result of the modern financial revolution following the collapse of Bretton Woods. Economies in the process of liberalisation appear to be especially susceptible to outbreaks of speculation. The warrant bonds issued by Japanese companies, with their conversion rights into ordinary shares, were reminiscent of the conversion of annuities into South Sea shares in 1720. In both cases, a circularity existed, so that when shares rose, the value of conversion rights, of annuities in 1720 and warrants in the 1980s, appreciated, which in turn made the shares more valuable. The modish theme speculations, from miracle cancer cures to AIDS drugs derived from chicken bile, are redolent of the more absurd bubble companies of the South Sea year. Allowing Japanese banks to count their shareholdings as capital, thereby linking credit creation to share prices, recreated the same flaw that destroyed John Law's Mississippi system in 1720. Manipulation and corruption in the poorly regulated Tokyo Stock Exchange stimulated the kind of speculation common in the United States during the Gilded Age and the 1920s. Extravagant foreign acquisitions by Japanese corporations during the bubble economy were foreshadowed by American overseas purchases during the boom of 1901, when the United States overtook Britain as the world's leading economic power. In both cases, speculation was propelled by hubristic nationalism. The aftermath of the bubble economy, with its financial scandals, asset deflation, banking crisis and prolonged economic malaise, finds its closest historical parallel in the American experience of the Depression years. Perhaps more than anything, the bubble economy illustrates the danger that arises when investors believe that market risk is shouldered by the government rather than by themselves, what economists refer to as the problem of moral hazard. Throughout the late 1980s, sceptics were told that the Japanese government would not allow share prices to fall, and that Japanese banks and brokerages were too big to fail. When the bubble collapsed a few years later, this belief was revealed for what it was, an ignis fatuus that had led the banks to their ruin. The problem of moral hazard is not new to the financial world. The Japanese authorities' support for an overvalued stock market harked back to 1720, 
when British shareholders believed that their government's sponsorship of the South Sea Company would protect them from loss. More recently, in the spring of 1997, there was a mad rush to invest in red chips, companies operating in mainland China and quoted on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. The main allure of the red chips was their association with Chinese politicians, who, it was argued, would not allow their share prices to fall once the former colony came under their control. In May 1997, the share issue with the flotation of Beijing Enterprises, a start-up operation connected to the Peking municipal government, was a thousand times oversubscribed, with the total value of subscription checks exceeding the Hong Kong money supply. Yet a few months later, Beijing Enterprises was down more than 60% from its peak, and the red chips had lost their sheen. The appearance of the too-big-to-fail argument in speculative markets is a fairly reliable harbinger of crisis. The Japanese economic system, with its emphasis on consensual values, was meant to be different from the freewheeling capitalism of the West. Despite the global financial revolution, Japanese corporations remained subject to a high degree of bureaucratic intervention. The bubble economy showed how the fever and contagion of speculation could infect even a tightly controlled economy, as long as its capital markets were relatively free. When the bubble economy ended in financial crisis, it proved impossible to return to the status quo ante. The essential components of the Japanese economic system centralised industrial planning, administrative guidance, the authorised cartels of Japanese industry, cross-shareholdings, keiretsu groupings, lifetime employment, promotion by seniority, high personal savings, and the long-termist pursuit of market share above short-term profitability, were increasingly questioned and threatened with dissolution. In the hope of solving the financial crisis, the authorities were obliged to promise more deregulation and tighter supervision of the financial markets. With its characteristic disregard for tradition, speculation had brought its anarchic qualities into play and destroyed the Japanese system with its myriad restrictions. Just as Commodore Perry's black ships forcibly ended Japan's self-imposed economic isolation in the 19th century, so the aftermath of the speculative maelstrom is forcing Japan to converge with the Western economic model. In future, the invisible hand will assert itself, and Japan, the land of three seasons, will not be so different. Epilogue The Case of the Rogue Economists The ideas of economists and political philosophers both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men, who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences, are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Madmen in authority, who hear voices in the air, are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. John Maynard Keynes, The General Theory, 1936 Privatizations and stock market capitalism were essential components of the new world order after the disintegration of the Soviet Union. The opening of new stock markets from Warsaw to Mongolia, the free movement of capital, and the unfettered trade in foreign currencies that characterized the early 1990s were welcomed by economists and Western politicians alike. After centuries of controversy, it appeared that speculation had finally achieved respectability, according to the authors of A History of Wall Street, published in 1991. Now, however, no opprobrium beclouds the activities of those who seek stock that will show the greatest price increase over the shortest time period, precisely that for which the old-time speculators were condemned. Speculation has come of age. It can sit quite comfortably side by side with investment, and it is as legitimate and necessary as the securities markets themselves. In economics textbooks, speculators were now portrayed as benign economic agents 
who helped markets assimilate new information and made markets efficient. According to modern economic theory, speculators serve to increase the productive capacity of an economy by providing liquidity in the financial markets, thus reducing the cost of capital for companies. The benefits they bring are not confined to the domestic economy. Their resourcefulness and ingenuity take speculators abroad, where they bring liquidity to the stock markets of developing nations. Again, the effect of speculation is to provide capital for local companies, promote growth, and contribute to the optimal allocation of resources on a global basis. Speculators are credited with assuming the risks inevitable to the capitalist process. In the early 1950s, Professor Julius Gradinsky of the Wharton School of Business remarked that investors in common stocks are the genuine risk bearers in the system of capitalism and free enterprise, as nobody knows what future profits will be. The speculator's appetite for growth stocks enables the entrepreneur to raise capital in the stock market, what has recently been called IPO capitalism. More companies are founded as a result. Speculators may lose money on occasion, but the economy as a whole prospers by their activities. Professor William Sharp, a Nobel laureate, has argued that the increased appetite of Americans for stock market risk in the 1990s was producing a more dynamic economy. Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan agreed. In November 1994, he announced, The willingness to take risk is essential to the growth of a free market economy. If all savers and their financial intermediaries invested only in risk-free assets, the potential for business growth would never be realised. Speculators also scrutinise the policies of governments to judge whether they are sustainable or even wise. They make politicians accountable to the people. In an interview with the Financial Times in November 1997, the Chinese dissident leader Wu Er Kaizi claimed that the establishment of the stock market in China was creating a civil society. The stock market has that magic power that makes people concerned about the country's economic policy. Once the will of the people is awakened, they will not sleep again. In the early 1990s, Britain was sunk in a recession that appeared to be without end. It was caused by her political masters linking sterling to a basket of European currencies dominated by the Deutsche Mark. Owing to the inflationary effects of German reunification, this policy inflicted on the British economy far higher interest rates than domestic conditions warranted. On Wednesday the 16th of September 1992, the financier George Soros, manager of the Quantum Fund, came to the rescue of British industry by taking massive bets against sterling, thus forcing a devaluation and knocking Britain out of the European rate mechanism. This resulted in lower British interest rates and was followed soon after by economic recovery. Black Wednesday, on reflection, became White Wednesday, a day to celebrate. Speculators also serve to discipline the behaviour of corporate managements, making them more accountable to their shareholders. They seek out value, rewarding companies which create value with high share prices and punishing companies that fritter away their shareholders' funds with low share prices. Out of this has emerged the cult of shareholder value, the management fad of the 1990s, which asserts that executives' prime consideration should be their company's share price. Because the interest of management is nowadays more closely aligned with shareholders through executive stock option schemes, speculators effectively determine the level of management compensation. They hold the whip and will crack it when necessary. Trend following speculation These arguments in favour of speculation are predicated on the assumptions that markets are inherently efficient, and that the actions of speculators are both rational in motivation and stabilising in effect. The efficient market hypothesis rests on the observation that stock movements are unpredictable, since at any moment shares reflect all information relevant to their value, so that their prices change only on the receipt of new information, which by its nature is random. As we have seen, 
This so-called random walk theory is incompatible with the notion of stock market bubbles, since during bubbles investors react to changes in share prices rather than new information relating to companies' long-term prospects, what economists call the fundamentals. Such behaviour is termed trend following, and there is ample evidence that it has been a key feature of the financial markets in the 1990s. In the American stock markets, trend following speculation has recently acquired a new name. It is called momentum investment, and has been popularized by best-selling investment books, which advise buying stocks that are rising and selling those that are falling. These stocks are said to exhibit, respectively, high and low relative strength. Momentum investment has acquired a multitude of followers. Particularly among the internet day traders, who use their immediate access to the market to execute lightning trades, this strategy has produced great volatility in individual stocks, especially those of high-tech companies, which have become the speculative footballs of the late twentieth century. Recent experience suggests that foreign currency markets are also dominated to an unhealthy degree by the trend-following behaviour of professional traders. Who have the ability to create self-fulfilling currency crises? When a financial crisis afflicts an emerging market nation, foreign exchange dealers rapidly re-examine the economic situation of its neighbours. They realise that if one of these countries were to suffer from a loss of confidence, interest rates would have to rise to protect the exchange rate. Higher interest rates, in turn, would exacerbate any fiscal weakness of the government by increasing its cost of borrowing, and also cause local asset prices to fall, damaging local banks and businesses. The net result of these events might lead to a currency devaluation, possibly accompanied by a full-scale financial crisis if banks and local businesses have borrowed excessively in foreign currencies. Thus, a nation which is otherwise sound can have its economy seriously damaged by a sudden and contagious loss of confidence. Having weighed these considerations, traders realise there is little to gain by continuing to hold the currency of such a country. Selling the currency short becomes, in trading terminology, a no-brainer. The ability of trend-following speculators to create self-fulfilling prophecies. Was witnessed after the Mexican crisis of late 1994, when a crisis of confidence swept through other emerging markets. The so-called tequila effect came to an end only after the United States and the International Monetary Fund arranged a massive bailout for Mexico. Just over two years later, the devaluation of the Thai baht in the summer of 1997. Sparked off currency devaluations and stock market crashes across East Asia, even though some economists asserted that the loss of confidence was not justified by economic fundamentals. However, as the Asian crisis brought high interest rates, bankruptcies, unemployment, and economic chaos to the afflicted nations, economic conditions soon changed, and the loss of confidence was retrospectively validated. It appeared that Soros's notion of reflexivity, where investors' perceptions serve to shape reality, was at work. Efficient marketers claim that foreign currency crises arise only when governments pursue poor policies, such as Britain's excessively high interest rates in 1992, or Russia's failure to collect taxes in 1998. In particular. They argue that foreign currency pegs are an open invitation to speculators, who probe any weakness they can find. Yet it is not only countries with currency pegs that have suffered from the herd-like activities of foreign exchange traders. Professor Paul Krugman of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology recently observed that the appreciation of the yen, an unmanaged currency, against the dollar. From 120 in 1993 to 80 in 1995, and its subsequent decline to 120 in 1997, appeared to be the result of traders riding a trend rather than a reflection of changing economic fundamentals. The rise of the yen was extremely damaging to the Japanese economy at a time when the country could ill afford it. George Soros has claimed that in a freely fluctuating exchange rate system. 
speculative transactions assume progressively greater weight, and as they do, speculation becomes more trend-following in character, leading to progressively greater swings in exchange rates. Dangerous Derivatives According to most finance professors, derivatives perform a vital function in the capitalist system. In the age of floating exchange rates, which has followed the collapse of the Bretton Woods system, derivatives enable businesses to hedge their risk exposure and increase production. Professor Merton Miller, a Nobel laureate and a zealous defender of derivatives, observed recently that, contrary to the widely held perception, derivatives have made the world a safer place, not a more dangerous one. Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan also enthusiastically supported the unregulated growth of the derivatives market. Yet the economists' claim that derivatives are simply risk management tools does not withstand scrutiny. Such is the baffling complexity of many new derivatives products that even George Soros has declared that he used derivatives sparingly because he could not understand how they function. Financial risks that were formerly well understood have become arcane. Soros and others have argued that many new derivatives serve no purpose other than to facilitate speculation, in particular enabling fund managers to circumvent prudential restrictions on their investments. What conceivable risk exposure, it has been asked, is a LIBOR-cubed swap a security that multiplies by three times changes in the London interbank offered rate, the rate of interest in the wholesale money market, designed to hedge. And to what bona fide purpose is a Texas hedge, a combination of two related derivatives positions whose risk is additive rather than offsetting? Over-the-counter options may also pose a threat to the investment banks that issue them. At the end of 1996, Ten U.S. banks had nearly $16 trillion worth of derivatives on their books. These banks must continually hedge their positions by buying and selling the underlying assets, that is, shares, bonds and currencies, from which the options derive their value. This activity, known as dynamic or delta hedging, requires the banks to sell the underlying assets when prices decline and buy when they rise. Soros warned that delta hedging sales during a market panic might cause a severe financial dislocation. The effectiveness of delta hedging depends on market liquidity, and the failure of portfolio insurance in October 1987 showed that liquidity might not be there when it was most desperately needed. The economist, Andrew Smithers, has argued that because this potential loss of liquidity is ignored, stock options are fundamentally mispriced. As a result, a severe market decline might precipitate bank failures. Smithers accused financial regulators of catastrophe myopia. Commenting on the growth of derivatives in Washington in May 1992, Dr. Henry Kaufman, the former chief economist at Salomon Brothers, declared that he could think of no other area that has the potential of creating greater havoc on a global basis if something goes wrong. In 1994, Gerald Corrigan, the former head of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, who was responsible for overseeing the Fed's rescue operation in October 1987, warned that the increasing complexity of financial markets could override the ability of the most sophisticated efforts to monitor and manage risk. A year later, Corrigan addressed a meeting of the International Monetary Fund. There is little doubt in my mind that a repeat performance of the 1987 stock market crash would be more difficult to contain today. More recently, Alfred Steinherr, the author of Derivatives, The Wild Beast of Finance, 1998, described derivatives as the dynamite for financial crises, and the fuse wire for international transmission at the same time. Unfortunately, the ignition trigger does not seem to be under control. The Federal Reserve, however, saw things differently, and headed off moves to regulate the over-the-counter derivatives market. Hedge Fund Mania Hedge funds are the most purely speculative investment vehicles of the late 20th century. 
Their managers trade in a variety of markets: foreign currencies, commodities, stocks, and bonds around the world. They do not make long-term investments, but aim to anticipate changes in the market's direction or ride a market trend, as the hedge funds' critics maintain. Although hedge funds have received the enthusiastic backing of the efficient marketers, several commentators believed that they were taking excessively large risks and contributing to the instability of the financial system. Since hedge fund managers generally receive a slice of investment profits, normally around twenty percent, but do not suffer losses, they are encouraged to assume ever greater risks. Soros warned of the asymmetry of risk and reward in his profession. In May 1994, he called on central banks to regulate the giant hedge funds. I think, he added, there is an innate instability in unregulated markets. It behooves the regulators to regulate. Dr. Henry Kaufman suggested that the unsound trading strategies of several hedge funds constituted what he called the soft underbelly of the financial system. In April 1994, William E. Dodge, the chief investment strategist at Dean Witter Reynolds, expressed his worries about the lack of information concerning the size of individual transactions and the terms of trade. The dimensions of investing in hedge funds have become so big that if they fail, they would produce a systemic risk to the banking system, and therefore endanger the financial structure of society. At the time, these warnings were ignored. Soros addressed his comments on the desirability of regulation to the House Committee on Banking in April 1994, but the Republicans' capture of Congress later in the year. Assisted by generous campaign contributions from other hedge fund managers, killed off any further moves to regulate hedge funds. Alan Greenspan of the Federal Reserve also lobbied against hedge fund regulation, on the grounds that it would only send the hedge funds offshore, where most were already registered, in order to avoid the scrutiny of financial regulators. In fact, federal rules were actually relaxed in 1996. Allowing an increase in the maximum number of investors at individual hedge funds from 100 to 500. At the same time, a number of loopholes were exploited to attract less wealthy investors into the hedge fund game. Freed from the threat of regulation, hedge funds increased in number from fewer than 200 in 1990 to around 1,200 by the summer of 1998. During the same period, their funds under management rose from under twenty billion dollars to around one hundred and twenty billion. This figure understated their true influence, since the balance sheets of many hedge funds were leveraged several times over with debt, and derivatives gave them the ability to create an investment exposure far greater than their capital. During the bull market. Most hedge funds successfully used their leverage to produce the stellar returns that made them so popular on Park Avenue. In 1997, Americans invested an extra forty billion dollars in hedge funds. A wake-up call. Criticisms of hedge funds increased after the Asian crisis of 1997, when several funds were accused of colluding together to drive down markets. Dr. Mahathir Mohamad. The Prime Minister of Malaysia claimed that hedge fund managers were the highwaymen of the global economy. Although George Soros shrugged off Mahathir's accusations, denying that he had either contributed to or profited from the Asian crisis, the allegation that hedge funds were destabilizing foreign currencies did not go away. In the summer of 1998. The Hong Kong government insisted that its currency and stock market were under concerted attack by a group of hedge funds, and reacted by banning short sales of stocks and placing restrictions on the local futures market. Russia's twin default and devaluation in August 1998 brought fresh difficulties to the profession. Several hedge funds had made large investments in high-yielding, short-term Russian government debt. In the expectation that the Western powers would bail out Russia, on the principle that Russia was too big to fail, when these bonds became almost worthless, hedge funds were forced to dump their other investments in order to meet margin calls from their creditors, 
a problem similar to that which afflicted American margin speculators in October 1929. These forced sales transformed the Russian crisis into a global one, causing stock and bond markets to collapse. Investors, who a few months earlier had considered no risk too great, fled to the relative security of American and German government bonds. The great majority of hedge funds announced losses for August 1998. One fund, the aptly named High Risk Opportunities Hub Fund, was forced into liquidation. Among the larger funds caught out by the Russian crisis were Soros's Quantum Fund, which lost $2 billion in August, and Long-Term Capital Management, LTCM, a recently established operation managed by John Merriweather, a former vice chairman of Salomon Brothers. Merriweather had left Salomon after one of his bond traders was involved in an attempt to rig the market in U.S. Treasury notes in 1991, and subsequently established LTCM in the prosperous New York suburb of Greenwich, Connecticut, a town so popular with speculators that its exclusive seafront avenue was dubbed Hedge Row by the locals. Among Merriweather's partners were two former finance professors, Myron Scholes and Robert Merton, who in October 1997 shared the Nobel Prize in Economics for their contribution to the development of the derivatives market. At the time of the award, The Economist congratulated the professors for having turned risk management from a guessing game into a science. Other commentators were less enthusiastic. Alan Abelson at Barron's viewed the award with a jaundiced eye. The pair, wrote Abelson, snared the rich honour and the tidy sum that goes with it for devising a formula to measure the worth of a stock option, thus paving the way for both the spectacular growth of stock options and their use as instruments of mass destruction. The two guys who artfully contrived the ultimate temptation that fueled the crash of October 1987 just won the Nobel Prize. Happy anniversary! Equipped with the brightest traders and the leading theoretical minds in the financial world, Long-term capital management attracted investments from the cream of Wall Street, including David Kamansky, head of Merrill Lynch, who along with 122 Merrill colleagues invested a total of $22 million, Donald Marin, chief executive of Payne Webber, and James Kane, chief executive of Bear Stearns. Other investors included the Bank of China, Bank Julius Baer, a private Swiss bank, Michael Ovitz, the former Hollywood agent, and a number of partners of McKinsey and Company, the management consultants. With such a glittering roster of investors, LTCM became known as the Rolls-Royce of hedge funds. The fund opened for business in early 1994. Its strategy, using mathematical techniques pioneered by Scholes and Merton, was to search for small valuation anomalies between various classes of bonds, dealing in bond derivatives known as total return swaps. The firm specialised in what were called convergence plays, going long and short on a variety of bonds in the expectation that their prices would converge. This was a backward-looking type of speculation, based on an extrapolation of historic price patterns. LTCM also went in for risk arbitrage, the business made famous by Ivan Bosky which involved trading shares in takeover situations. The equity positions of LTCM were characterised as market neutral, meaning that it did not take bets on the overall movement of the stock market, but went long and short on a variety of stocks. In theory, this should have protected it from any market downturn. Initially, its trading strategy proved highly successful. In 1995 and 1996, the fund produced investment returns of 59 and 44 percent, respectively. At the end of 1997, Merriweather was able to return $2.7 billion of capital to his original investors, retaining just under $5 billion for ongoing speculations. Later, it transpired that the fund had returned this capital without reducing its exposure, thereby increasing its leverage. The hedge fund's glorious progress came to an abrupt halt in early September 1998, when Merriweather announced that LTCM had lost around $2 billion, about half its capital, in the previous month. 
Putting on a show of bravado, Merriweather declared at the time that he continued to see outstanding investment prospects and would solicit investors for more funds. However, investors were not convinced, and three weeks later it was announced that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York had arranged for a consortium of leading investment banks, including Komansky's Merrill Lynch and Marin's Payne Weber, to inject $3.4 billion into LTCM in return for a 90% stake in the fund. At the same time, it was revealed that the hedge fund had built up liabilities of around $200 billion on a capital base that had shrunk to less than $1 billion. Several American investment banks had provided loans at 100% of the value of collateral offered by LTCM, so-called zero-margin loans. The banks had lent bountifully, without considering the other loans Merriweather and his partners were busy raising from their competitors. These loans, together with derivatives, allowed LTCM to build a position in the market estimated at $1.4 trillion. Soon after the bailout, several investment banks announced provisions against losses incurred from dealings with the hedge fund. Chief among them was UBS, formerly Union Bank of Switzerland, Europe's largest bank, which reported a loss of $686 million on a loan it had provided to Merriweather's partners. In true 1990s fashion, this was not a straightforward loan, but an unhedged, structured equity swap. Among the $541 million worth of investments LTCM made in U.S. stocks, a figure which excluded the fund's equity derivatives positions, was an $18 million stake in Bear Stearns, the brokerage firm, whose chief executive had a $10 million investment in LTCM. Revelations of the personal investments of Wall Street bosses in the hedge fund, the preferential treatment that the fund had received with its zero-margin loans, and the bankers' subsequent use of their shareholders' money to bail it out, thus preserving at least 10% of their personal investments, recalls the antics of Charles E. Mitchell and other Wall Street bankers in the 1920s. It is unfair, however, to suggest that Wall Street only came to the rescue of Merriweather in order to protect the personal investments of its top executives. The situation was, in fact, far more serious. It was suggested that the forced liquidation of LTCM's positions would have brought losses estimated at $14 trillion. Such losses would have severely disrupted the world's capital markets and threatened the bank's own proprietary trading positions, which were highly leveraged and closely resembled those of the hedge fund. In the end, the risk was too great to contemplate, and the bailout was swiftly arranged. Although there were no immediate resignations on Wall Street, only the chairman of UBS resigned, investors rapidly lost confidence in investment banks, whose shares declined by an average of more than 50% during the late summer and early autumn. Goldman Sachs, which a few months earlier had issued a report stating that hedge funds were safer than other forms of collective investment, was forced to delay its planned flotation. A few days after the bailout, Merrill Lynch announced 3,000 job cuts. Among the more curious revelations to emerge from the affair was the news that the Italian Central Bank had made investments and loans to LTCM. It turned out that Merriweather had employed an Italian economist, Alberto Giovannini, who had previously worked for the Italian Treasury, advising it on debt management, and that LTCM had made large purchases, estimated at $50 billion, of Italian government bonds. Such close arrangements posed the danger that insider information might be passing between the central bank and its hedge fund partner. The Italian Central Bank was not alone in forsaking its traditional role as the guardian of monetary stability in favour of the attractions of speculation. In the early 1990s, the Central Bank of Malaysia, the Bank Negara, was an aggressive speculator in foreign currencies, an activity from which it retired only after suffering heavy losses. Throughout the 1990s, central bankers around the world have indulged in their own form of speculation, selling gold, a declining asset, and using the proceeds to purchase U.S. Treasury bonds, a rising asset. As this strategy was similar to that of many hedge funds, 
it was perhaps not so surprising to find a central bank among LTCM's backers. In early 1999, the Brazilian central bank announced that its new president would be a former managing director of Soros's hedge fund. The standing of the US Federal Reserve was also damaged by the LTCM affair. Among Merriweather's partners was a former vice chairman of the Federal Reserve named David Mullins. A few years earlier, Mullins had been responsible for the Fed's investigation into the Salomon bond rigging scandal, which had precipitated Merriweather's departure from the bank. At the time, the Department of Justice accused two large hedge funds, Steinhardt Management and the Caxton Corporation, of collaborating in the manipulation. They subsequently paid a $70 million fine without admitting wrongdoing. Presumably, Mullins found no conflict of interest in later accepting a job at a hedge fund from Salomon's former vice chairman. In Japan, such behaviour would have been quite conventional. Indeed, the Japanese have a word to describe the custom by which a government official takes a job in an industry he has formerly regulated. They call it amakudari, or descent from heaven. Mullins's friend and former colleague Alan Greenspan was also embarrassed by the events at LTCM. For several years, Greenspan had vigorously resisted calls to regulate both the derivatives markets and hedge fund activities. Only a couple of weeks before the bailout, Greenspan had insisted to Congress that hedge funds were, in his words, strongly regulated by those who lend the money. Yet the leverage at LTCM showed clearly that this was not the case. Throughout the years of the bull market, Greenspan had delivered a series of opaque and ambiguous speeches, half warning of the dangers of speculation and half congratulating America on its economic revival. After the LTCM bailout, complaints were raised that Greenspan had failed to do enough to stem the growth of a stock market bubble caused partly by excessive monetary growth. The reputation of the man who, not long before, had been described by a member of Congress as a national treasure, was beginning to look as fragile as the stock market itself. Shortly after the bailout of long-term capital management, Paul Volcker, Greenspan's predecessor as Federal Reserve Chairman, asked, Why should the weight of the federal government be brought to bear to help out a private investor? No answer to Volcker's question was forthcoming, except that both Greenspan and Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin insisted that technically there was no bailout, since federal money had not been used. A few years earlier, the Federal Reserve had passively stood by while Drexel Burnham Lombert, an investment bank with some 5,000 employees and a history stretching back into the 19th century, was deserted by its envious Wall Street competitors and collapsed because of liquidity problems. Long-term capital management, on the other hand, a mere four-year-old upstart with only 200 employees, but partners and investors drawn from a cabal of finance professors, central bankers and the cream of Wall Street, was considered more important than Drexel and simply too big to fail. Echoing Pecora's accusation of Wall Street's heads I win, tails you lose ethics in the 1920s, Representative Bruce F. Vento, a Democrat of Minnesota, accused Greenspan of having two rules, a double standard, one for Main Street and another one for Wall Street. The Fed's involvement in the bailout of LTCM resembled the type of crony capitalism which the United States was continually decrying in Asian countries. Thus, at a crucial moment in the global financial crisis, the moral authority of the US government and its ability to dictate economic policies to other nations were undermined. Naturally, the hedge fund industry did not emerge unscathed by the crisis at LTCM. According to their apologists, hedge funds were in the business of risk dispersal, yet Merriweather and his partners had concentrated risk in a manner similar to that of the negligent underwriters at the Corporation of Lloyd's in the 1980s. In fact, the notion that speculators can effectively serve as insurers against financial risks is flawed. Whereas a life insurer can confidently write policies based on actuarial tables derived from slowly changing death rates, 
the speculator has only poor statistical information upon which to base his strategy. Moreover, the activities of other speculators are constantly changing conditions in the market, thereby making the past an unreliable guide to the future. In the end, the banks which hedged their positions with LTCM were obliged to take over their insurer in order to secure their own survival. Liberal economists also claimed that hedge funds provided liquidity to the world's financial markets. Yet while LTCM teetered on the brink of collapse, the markets in which it operated, high-yield bonds, emerging market debt, convertible securities and mortgage-backed issues, became paralysed as liquidity dried up. The effect of this was to raise the cost of capital for corporations. Even after the bailout, the financial markets remained stormy due to a flight to safety as investors eschewed long-term risks in favour of cash, bringing turbulence to the world's stock and bond markets. Many hedge funds had financed their speculations by borrowing cheaply in Japanese yen. After the bailout, these hedge funds were forced by their creditors to unwind their leveraged positions, causing a 20% fall in the dollar against the yen in one week in October. Never before had the world's leading currency markets exhibited such extreme volatility. At a hedge fund conference held in Bermuda shortly after the bailout, originally entitled How to Handle the Flood of Assets Coming In, but hastily restyled Crisis and Corrections, Implications for Hedge Funds, Julian Robertson, head of the Tiger Fund, the world's largest hedge fund, joined Soros's call for greater regulation of the industry. The LTCM affair also raised questions about the fast-growing derivatives market. As we have seen, finance professors claimed that derivatives were seldom used for speculative purposes. Yet Merriweather's hedge fund, run by the world's leading risk management experts, had used derivatives wantonly to build up the largest and most leveraged positions in the history of speculation. The leverage within LTCM was reported to exceed $100 of debt for every dollar of equity, and much of the partner's equity investment turned out to be borrowed money. The near bankruptcy of long-term capital management reflects the near bankruptcy of the intellectual principles upon which it had been built. The flaw in the hedge fund's trading strategies was to assume that the historical relationships between various assets could be depended upon for future speculations. The hedge fund was so confident of its opinion that it took massive bets when its computers identified small divergences from the norm. The formula for pricing options, developed by Scholes and Merton, which lies at the heart of the modern derivatives world, is dependent on the similar assumption that past volatility is a reliable guide to future volatility. This assumption may be likened to driving a motor car by looking in the rearview mirror, fine as long as the road continues straight, but disastrous when you reach the first corner. In common with all the practical ideas generated by the efficient market hypothesis, it is based on the belief that when financial theories are turned into practice, there is no change to the underlying reality. This was the error of portfolio insurance in the 1980s, and remained the error of the derivatives market a decade later. If markets are not efficient, but are subject to chaotic feedback loops, then the entire financial superstructure created around derivatives in the 1990s, with its $50 trillion worth of exposure, is based on shaky premises. Even outside the field of options pricing, the teaching of the efficient market hypothesis has insinuated itself into the practices of modern finance. The fads for shareholder value and corporate stock option schemes, the capital asset pricing model, which scientifically calculates companies' cost of capital, and popular investment in stock index funds, are all predicated, to a greater or lesser extent, on the assumption that shares are efficiently priced by the market. But if the hypothesis is false, for example, because speculative euphoria does in fact drive share prices away from their intrinsic value, then these practices are in need of reform. 
Recently, James Buchan asserted that political economy is in the same condition in which scholastic learning found itself on the eve of the discoveries. It is about to explode. The crisis at long-term capital management suggested that the final refutation of modern economic theory might only be achieved by an implosion of the financial system. As the head of a risk management firm told the New York Times. The crisis was a wake-up call. He chose his words well. The third degree. Unlike Merton and Scholes, John Maynard Keynes's personal and successful experience of speculation led him to the conclusion that markets were fundamentally inefficient. In his general theory, Keynes defined speculation as the attempt to forecast changes in the psychology of the market. He compared it to various parlor games, snap, old maid, and musical chairs. Switching his metaphor, Keynes likened speculation to a newspaper competition, in which the competitors have to pick out the six prettiest faces from hundreds of photographs, so that each competitor has to pick not the faces which he himself finds prettiest, but those which he thinks likeliest to catch the fancy of the other competitors. All of whom are looking at the problem from the same point of view. We have reached the third degree, where we devote our intelligences to anticipating what average opinion expects the average opinion to be. Speculation, which is a beneficial, indeed vital, component of the capitalist process, has come to dominate the system to an unhealthy degree. To repeat Keynes's warning from the 1930s. When the capital development of a country becomes a byproduct of the activities of a casino, the job is likely to be ill done. Momentum trading, trend-following currency speculators, over-leveraged hedge funds, and corporate managements obsessed with daily fluctuations in share quotations are unlikely to produce the optimal distribution of scarce resources in the global economy. We have reached Keynes's third degree. Politicians and economists, pondering the problems caused by unfettered speculation, face an old dilemma. As Alexander Baring, head of the family bank lately brought down by Nick Leeson, remarked in 1825, any attempt to check speculation might be counterproductive. The remedy would be worse than the disease if, in putting a stop to this evil, they, the authorities, put a stop to the spirit of enterprise. Governments have frequently attempted to control speculation by outlawing its tools and practices, yet on each occasion, speculators have found ways to circumvent regulations. They have also interpreted laws against speculation as a sign of weakness on the part of governments, which has caused them to step up their activities. Keynes whimsically proposed that speculation might be discouraged if people were forced to make investments like marriage for life. A solution which would have produced a lifetime of frustration for those unfortunate enough to make a poor initial choice. More seriously, he considered a penal rate of capital gains tax on short-term holdings. As we have seen, however, high rates of capital gains tax on short-term property investments in Japan actually stimulated the Tokyo property boom in the 1980s by reducing liquidity in the market. It is arguable that taxes on capital gains actually contribute to stock market bubbles, since investors with large profits become reluctant to sell even when they believe stocks are overvalued. Keynes also suggested that a transaction tax be levied on U.S. share purchases, on the grounds that casinos should, in the public interest, be inaccessible and expensive. Several economists argue that central bankers should consider asset prices along with consumer prices in their inflation targets. The problem with this suggestion is that nobody can prove definitively that share prices are rising because of speculative pressure rather than a genuinely improved outlook. As Alan Greenspan asked in December 1996, "How do we know when irrational exuberance has unduly escalated asset values?" Only in retrospect does the answer to this question become clear. Furthermore, the central bankers' main tool for controlling speculation is raising interest rates. 
As long as speculators continue to anticipate large profits from capital gains, they are not deterred by high interest rates. And as Keynes observed in the 1930s, raising interest rates to control speculation at the end of the business cycle damages the whole economy. The only other tool left to central bankers is to issue warnings to speculators to desist from their activities, what was called moral suasion in the 1920s. Time and time again, such warnings have been made by the authorities, and on no occasion have speculators heeded a word. During the Great Depression, American policymakers decided that speculation was best controlled by limiting the speculators' access to financial leverage. As a result, margin loans were limited by federal law to 50% of stock values. This policy has since broken down with the advent of financial derivatives, as the case of LTCM demonstrates in extremis. It has recently been proposed that derivatives should be subject to the same margin limits as conventional stock purchases. Restrictions on speculators' ability to achieve almost limitless leverage through the derivatives market might lessen the risk of systemic crisis in the financial world. Improved information in the almost unregulated derivatives world would also hinder the excessive accumulation of debt such as occurred at LTCM. The issue of speculation in emerging markets and the unfettered trade in foreign currencies is the most immediate and vexing problem faced by policymakers. Politicians and central bankers worry about how to achieve economic stability without inhibiting the flexibility necessary for growth. Yet flows of speculative capital into fragile emerging markets have not brought any visible long-term benefits. Indeed, it can be argued that they have actually hindered the evolution of the liberal market system in many countries. In this instance, speculation has been no friend of capitalism. There have been a number of proposals, of varying degrees of practicality, about how best to deal with the problems of foreign currency instability. The reintroduction of capital controls, controls on foreign borrowing, improved accountancy and less cronyism in emerging markets, attacks on capital inflows into emerging markets, attacks on foreign exchange transactions, controls on hedge funds, the reform of the International Monetary Fund so it can perform effectively the function of lender of the last resort, and even the establishment of a world central bank are among the ideas floated by policymakers who appeared wrong-footed by the unexpected appearance of a world financial crisis. Dominique Strauss-Kahn, the French finance minister, has called for the construction of a new Bretton Woods. Although a new system of fixed currencies would necessitate a degree of capital controls, there is no evidence that this would actually inhibit economic growth. In fact, the growth rates of Western nations have actually declined since the early 1970s. Providing currencies with fixed values would also obviate the need for derivatives, which could be allowed to wither on the vine without posing any further threat to the financial system. European businesses are the keenest supporters of the European Single Currency Project because it saves them the cost and uncertainty of hedging their trading operations in the derivatives markets. Investors in foreign countries might forgive capital controls and restrictions on the early withdrawal of investments if they had greater confidence that economic conditions in these countries would not be suddenly undermined by speculative currency attacks. A fixed currency system would also define the limits of speculation in the manner performed by the gold standard in the 19th century. When the tide turns against the speculator, there is an inevitable loss of liberty. In The Road to Serfdom, first published in 1949, the Austrian economist Friedrich von Hayek declared that state control of foreign exchange dealing was a decisive advance on the path to totalitarianism and the suppression of individual liberty. Hayek believed that from a mixed economy there would be an inevitable progression to socialism, History has proved Hayek wrong. His analysis underestimated the power of speculation, even in quasi-socialist economies, to pull in the opposite direction. 
Speculation undermined the Bretton Woods system of fixed currencies, and more recently it has destroyed the state-managed capitalism of Japan and other Asian nations. As an anarchic force, speculation demands continuing government restrictions, but inevitably it will break any chains and run amok. The pendulum swings back and forth between economic liberty and constraint.